Ms. Jagan, we're ready when you are. Good evening. We're going to call the activities committee. To, uh, we'll start with policy 903. According to policy 903, public comment, which is limited to three minutes, should be directed to the presiding officer rather than individual board members, district employees, or members of the public. For confidentiality and privacy rights, specific comments regarding particular individuals must be communicated privately to the school board and superintendent via email at psdschoolboard at penridge.org. We do have uh, over an hour's worth of public comment. Uh, typically, we'll limit it to two minutes when that happens. Uh, we have decided that what we're going to do is ask the adults to limit their comments to two minutes and the kids to go ahead and take three minutes if your comment's that long. And we're going to start with Tom Nunnabeller. And, and I'm going to go ahead and call the second person to wait just so it goes a little quicker, and that is Matt Carberera. Uh, Tom Lunnebiller, uh, East Rock Hill. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mr. Yeah, please. Thank you. Please, uh, All right, Tom Lunnebiller, East Rock Hill, uh, Penridge High School, health and physical education teacher. I uh, heard that uh, some boys want to play some baseball. Is that true? No <laughs> school baseball. All right. So uh, just, just uh, I've been involved with uh, Penridge baseball for uh, 45 of my my years. Started out playing Deep Run Valley. I've uh, been involved in Penridge Little League. I've been involved. Uh, coaching, running camps at both organizations for the last 26 years. Uh, we're extremely fortunate uh, in our area, great feeder programs, Deep Run, Penridge Little League. Uh, we spent a lot of time there. The, these young boys spend a lot of time, the parents have spent a lot of time at those facilities. So it's a, a great opportunity for kids. Uh, we love baseball. These kids just want an opportunity. We've had uh, softball at the middle school for decades. And we just haven't had a baseball, uh, had the opportunity for baseball at the middle school level. And we really like that, that opportunity for, for these young guys. Uh, look at our neighboring schools. We have, you know, Quakertown, Satterton, North Penn, our Bucksmont competitors. They've had uh, middle school baseball forever. And we, we just haven't had that opportunity. I know these guys love putting on their Penridge. Little League uniforms, they love putting on our deep run uniforms, but I think they'd like to put on a Penn Central, Penn North, Penn South uh, uniform and represent their team and have some pride in their school. Uh, baseball is an incredible game. It's a great, great learning lesson for those winning, losing, striking out, dealing with frustrations. So uh, I hope you consider, uh, please, letting these guys uh, get a chance to play baseball. Side note, uh, turning on to my health, as a health teacher, I have a young lady, Last week, kind of interrupted class. We had a little break in class, and she said, uh, we had a family get together, and my little five year old cousin or nephew was choking, and I did the Heimlich maneuver. So that's, I have two students within the past years. Alex, who's a senior graduate, stood before you and, and did the Heimlich maneuver. Abby did the Heimlich maneuver. We've all seen Damar Hamlin. We teach CPR in our current Health 10 classes. We teach kids how to use AEDs. With that being said, Every, you know, all the courses have gone up around the country after Dwar Hamlin. We currently teach that, but we may not be able to teach that moving forward because of the, uh, the drop in our credits. So, thank you for your time. Uh, next, after Matt, if you want to come up, is Chris Boyd. Good evening, everybody. Matt Carbonaro, resident of Perkinsy Borough. I come to you tonight with a different perspective on adding baseball to middle schools. I played baseball from a young age, uh, starting at nine years old, all the way through high school. Now, I am an umpire for Little League Baseball, and at Deep Run, I recognize a lot of you in the crowd, and I umpire the surrounding Little Leagues as well. I know many of the kids um, are coming here tonight to show their support and even speak, and I applaud you all. Bravo. These kids are the bedrock of our community. Quite frankly, for the last five years, baseball at the high school level has been flat, and the level of play has staggered a little bit. With a record of 23 and 50 over the last, 50, um, five, year, last five years, totaling of a 38% winning, winning percentage, I believe that's got to change. I believe that has accumulated with a lot of factors. One being because of the CB, Quakertown, Satterton, and North Penn all have middle school baseball, and uh, Penridge does not. It is one thing to have uh, Connie Mack, but the level and intensity drops off. 
both from the experience of playing and umpiring. I'm urging the board to extend baseball to the middle school. I am, however, happy how both Deep Run and Penridge have extended the development of these kids in the last amount of years. I think a baseball program at the middle school level is a bedrock and essentially equivalent of the minor leagues for the Major League Baseball. We have a lot of young talent coming up through Deep Run and Penridge. I would hate to see it, see it go to waste. I'll leave you with this. Penridge already has softball at all middle schools and one more girl sport than all boys. The district buses for most middle school and high school sports currently, including busing the softball down to the, um, Deep Run. The Deep Run board has offered to help in any way, shape, or form to make this um, feasible. I hope you listen to everyone in the crowd and extend baseball to the middle school level at Penridge. Thank you and God bless. Good evening, Chris Boyd, Hilltown Township. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you tonight about middle school baseball at Penn Ridge. I have been an advocate of youth sports in our community for many years as a parent, a coach, former president of Deep Run Baseball and vice president of Deep Run Valley Sports. This topic has come up time and time again over the years. There is no better time than now to get it done. By offering middle school baseball at Penn Ridge, it would provide our male students an opportunity to play and learn the game, but more importantly, to learn critical life lessons that they will take with them for the rest of their lives. I can tell you from my direct experience with playing middle school baseball at Neshaminy, I learned how to meet new people, work together with other students, develop social and communication skills, deal with failure and successes, as well as learn to work as a team. These are invaluable skills to learn, no matter what your age or occupation. Baseball is all about working together as a team to accomplish a common set of goals. Improve as individuals, improve as a team, and ultimately win the game. I also learned the importance of hard work and determination, as well as to have a never give up attitude in addition, I developed a greater self-esteem of myself. Being part of the baseball community can build our students' confidence as individuals and can help them feel more at home in their school and community. I am asking that the same opportunity our female middle school softball students are benefiting from today be extended to our male middle school students. I do understand that there is a dollars and cents aspect to offering baseball at the middle school level that must be considered. Everything costs more these days, and I'm sure the same is true for running the district as a whole. However, if the main opt obstacles are around cost, transportation, field availability, and who can maintain the various fields of these, these are obstacles that can be addressed and overcome with out-of-the-box thinking and open and collaborative discussions and partnership with the parents and the public. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your time and your consideration. Give us the opportunity to provide this to our, our, our kids. Thank you. After Mr. Van Zandt, it's going to be Cole Montigny, Brandon Schumach, Liam Matajasic, I'm sorry if I Butcher that. Drew Montigny and Chase Roller. Good evening, members of the school board and superintendent. Thank you again for your service. Uh, my name is Bill Van Sam. I'm a resident of Hilltown Township. So I come tonight wearing two hats. First, as a parent, I have a proud parent of a 10 year old and 6 year old. They are proud grass bulldogs and they hope to be Rams at some point. And obviously, they play baseball. So, just like the reasons Chris mentioned, uh, I'm an advocate for that for all those reasons. I'm also wearing the hat as the board president of Deep Run Valley Sports Association, and I just want to reiterate to everyone in the school board with my conversations with Mr. Hegan, we enthusiastically support however we can to help this program work. We have field availability. Uh, we, we can come up with, go get over some of these obstacles. We want to do everything possible, as I'm sure Penn Ridge would like to do, to make this, make this work. To give you a glimpse of what I've seen over the last several years being involved with Deep Run, the maturation of a youth baseball player, they come through our, our ranks, 
they hit about 12 years old, then from there without middle school, they go elsewhere. They go into programs that require you to try out. As we all know, they may not have the skill set at that point to make that team, but they could be a very good player. We've all heard of cases like Michael Jordan not making the varsity team until he was in high school. One, we are disenfranchising our students because they may not be able to afford some of these programs. And the other thing that I look at as a benefit from the athletic department, it's an opportunity to get have the kids remain in the district, become proud Rams, have coaching drive down to the middle school level. So those kids now have multiple years where they're understanding the Penridge way. So that by the time they get to the high school level, they're that much more ready, and that's going to lead to a more competitive program. And this is similar to our neighbors around us. So I really look at it that the $17,000, $20,000 expense, it's not an expense, it's an investment into the program. And even though education is the most important in this realm, having a strong athletic program, as we've seen with the other sports, is equally as important. So you're really investing in the kids who are going to become that much prouder coming through Penn Ridge. So I urge the board, I know there's a lot of board meetings that go on for a while and some divisive matters. It's an opportunity to come together and vote the right way to support America's pastime in baseball. So I appreciate your consideration and thank you. Okay, after the boys speak, uh, Janelle Montick is up. Cole Montick, Hilltown. I'm a sixth grader at Central Middle School. I've been playing baseball since I was four, and it's one of my favorite sports. I have learned a lot, gained many friends, and made a lot of great memories playing baseball. I think it would be really cool to get to play next year with my friends at Central, as well as against my friends at the other middle schools. Penridge has every other sport, even softball, so I think it would be fair to add baseball. I really hope that you consider adding it for next year, so that way me and my friends can play. It would mean a lot to all of us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brandon Schumach, and I'm a seventh grader at Penrose South Middle School. Baseball has been a big part of my life ever since my first season six years ago. I think that having baseball at our middle schools could be beneficial or helpful because it will give us as athletes a school sport to look forward to in the spring. Since we have football in the fall, basketball in the winter, but there aren't really many sports in the spring parts of the school year. This could also keep us ready for high school baseball because we would have these middle school years to help prepare. Not everyone can afford to pay to play for Penn Ridge or Jeep Run. This would give those people a chance to play the sport they enjoy. Baseball has been so important to me because it's such a team sport, and with the brotherhood, you make so many strong friendships. This sport has led me in so many positive directions, both physically and mentally. After hitting my first home run last summer, I had never felt so happy. Seeing my teammates there to celebrate with me made me even more overjoyed. I just don't understand why our middle schools don't have this sport, and I hope that after this meeting, we will be able to play the sport we love for our middle schools. Good evening. My name is Liam Matajasek, and I'm a seventh grader at North Middle School. I'm here tonight to show my support for baseball in our middle schools. I've played baseball at Deep Run for the past eight years and travel for going on five years. I've made many friends from baseball across all the Penridge Middle Schools and even other local districts. Baseball is more than just a sport that I love, but it also has taught me many valuable life lessons, such as how to work hard, handle adversity, and how to be a leader and a good teammate. I believe that adding baseball as a spring sport to our middle schools will be a very positive addition, and I ask you today to say yes to middle school baseball. Thank you. Drew Montigny Hilltown. I am in fourth grade at Sour Elementary. I love baseball. It is one of my favorite sports. I have a lot of friends at Sour and Grass who play baseball too. I think it would be really fun to play together when we go to Central. I'm asking you to please do this for me and my friends. It would mean a lot. Thank you. Hello, 
my name is Chase Roller. I am in second grade. I have been playing baseball since I was four, and it's been a fun sport for me and my friends. And it would probably mean a lot for me and all these other baseball players for you guys to add middle school baseball t so they can play. Thank you, boys. After Janelle is Todd Montigny. Janelle Montigny, Helltown. The reason why I'm here tonight, and I've been pushing for months to get middle school baseball program started in Penn Ridge, was just shown to you by the boys who spoke and all the others that are here with them to support them. I am here for my three boys that play and love baseball, as well as the countless baseball friends and teammates that I've gotten to know over the years. There is nothing insurmountable in the way of getting a middle school baseball program started. Everything needed is already being done for every other sport in the district. We have fields. Most boys have their own bats, helmets, and gloves. All we need are uniforms, coaches, umps, buses, and field maintenance. These are all things the district pays for for all the other middle school sports. I am begging you not to kick the can down the road and put this off any longer like has been done in the past. Every year that we don't have a program, 40 plus boys are missing out on playing a sport that they love. They're missing out on building bonds and learning life lessons. Finally, I would like to ask, when you present and discuss this tonight, to consider all the speakers, but particularly the young men that just spoke. Please look around the room at all the players here and think about them as well as the many boys watching from home that this means so much to. You have the support, support of both local Little League programs, Deep Run and Penn Ridge. The whole community is behind getting this done. Please do this for all of our boys and come up with a plan to bring middle school baseball to Penn Ridge next year. Thank you. After Todd is Mike Drelling. Hello, Tom Montigny, Hilltown. Um, first, it's a hard act to follow all you boys, so very proud of you. you guys should be very proud of yourselves uh, for what you said tonight. So, uh, first, I'd like to thank Penn Ridge School District for considering the request to add middle school baseball to the curriculum. As you can see by the attendance in this room, this is an item that is very much supported by the community. My wife and I currently have three boys in the Penn Ridge School District in first, fourth, and sixth grade. They currently play baseball a deep run and absolutely love the sport. I've been blessed to be able to coach their teams over the years and have seen them and their teammates grow in both their skills and their behaviors. Baseball is a beautiful game and it teaches kids so many life skills such as how to deal with pressure, how to manage your emotions, how to improve your focus, how to deal with success and failure, how to work with new and sometimes unfamiliar people, how to work as a team, how to take direction, and the importance of hard work. In addition to these skills, children learn leadership, how to communicate effectively, and it helps build their self-esteem and allows them to be better mem members of the Penn Ridge community. All these skills translate well beyond the baseball field, and it's reflected in our relationships, our marriages, and in our business lives. Personally, I was lucky to play baseball during all my youth all the way through college. The above skills have allowed me to be successful in business, but more importantly, taught me to be a good husband and a father. I'm forever grateful to my parents, coaches, teammates, um, the Swordsville Little League where I grew up, and my schools for providing me with the opportunity to grow as a person. Today is estimated that 70% of kids quit playing sports by the age of 13. There are many reasons that contribute to this statistic, but one reason that we can prevent tonight is providing our boys with the opportunity to play. This opportunity will allow for higher participation in baseball and a better transition to the high school level which will help improve the competitiveness of the program. Additionally, it will remove the financial barrier that sometimes prevents some of our young men from playing if only local leagues or AAU teams are available during their middle school years. The Penridge community has the financial means and facilities to support baseball programs at the middle school level, and I ask you to allow this to proceed for the next school year. Thank you for your time. Thank you. After Mike, although Mike you might not be Mike, but 
Logan Drilling and Bridget Drilling, are you Bridget? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to speak on so, behalf of all three of us. Okay. So my name is Bridget Drawling, East Rockville Township. On behalf of my son, Logan, who plays ball, as well as my husband that's coached ball for a number of years, um, I am asking for um, your consideration. I can tell you from an older student that we have in the district that that year of seventh and eighth grade middle school sports is absolutely critical to their social skills. My mental health as a parent um, in trying to give them the ability to stay focused on their schoolwork, and it's not just me that's constantly telling them that, that being able to offer our boys a program that helps through that hormonal imbalance that starts to come and all of the things socially that they're challenged with, being able to have a sport that they love and are passionate about um, really gives some of us parents less gray hair um, and really gives them the opportunity to fit in and find a way uh, to help get through some of these middle school years and be successful um, on into their high school year. So I can tell you with our older child, um, there was not really a sport until she was introduced at that middle school level um, to a sport that she now through uh, high school is actually looking at in colleges and potentially running in colleges. So I can tell you that it's, it's more than just a passion. It really is opportunities for you know, our talent to grow and all the things that have been mentioned for so many parents and our, our students as well that um, this really helps build our future. So please consider adding in this middle school level for us. Next is, um, I can't read the first name, Mr. and Mrs. Ernie, and then followed by that will be Liam Matajasic, and although, I think he already spoke, right? Okay. How about Logan? Hi there. I'm Julia Ernie. Uh, my husband, Douglas, has uh, coached both my boys with baseball from T-ball all the way up. I now have a 11th grader and a 7th grader in the school district. And I see so many other parents that have volunteered their time to coach. Thank you all. You're all wonderful people. And coaching doesn't just mean volunteering to coach. It means doing all the field work and everything that goes along with it. Teaching life lessons, um, being a counselor, <laughs> being a, a motivator. Um, you learn too, you know. We all learn so much from sports, and it'd be nice to have that fairness in the Title IX, um, where the girls have um, softball. We should also have baseball for the boys. I agree with Mr. Montigny, who talked about life lessons and the things that you learn from baseball. There's just so many things you learn from baseball that are not even sports related necessarily, but you learn from your your wins, and you learn from you learn even more sometimes from your failures. But you come together as a team, and that's very important. Um, my son, my seventh grader, right now is at baseball because he loves baseball that much. And if he could be here and my husband could be here right now, they would be up here talking. They told me I had to be, so here I am. <laughs> and I'm good choice. So. But I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the district. I think we have the space. I think all of our organizations, both Penridge and Deep Run, are willing to help out, whether it be donating fields, donating help to get the fields ready. I'm sure we can find people that can help bus or give rides back and forth. We've all done it. We all know each other. And it's two big happy families. These are great kids. And they deserve that opportunity. And I please ask you that you um, consider this. It's very important for a lot of reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, after Logan will be Chuck Roller. Hello. My name is Logan Matajazic. I go to Benminster Elementary and I love playing baseball at Deep Run. I would love if Penridge added baseball to the middle schools. I have many friends and teammates who would love to have the chance to play baseball through middle school and into high school. We would love to represent pa Penridge on their baseball team. Thank you. Uh, next is going to be Ryan Oliver. Chuck Roller, Hilltown. Uh, good evening. First and foremost, I just want to thank you all for uh, listening tonight to all the community members as well as a lot of these young men here. I've had the privilege of coaching a lot of them um, over the years. So, guys, great job. Really proud of you. Um, sports, particularly baseball, has always been a passion and love of mine from a young age. 
played in the backyard with my dad. Love continue to play through Little League, middle school, high school, college, and beyond a little bit. Um, so for some years after college, I had the opportunity to play in some adult men leagues or men's leagues, where uh, I was trying to live out the glory days. Didn't work out too well though. Um, but as I was watching my family grow over the years, uh, my days of playing came to an end as my priorities shifted to my children and what they were interested in. Um, as luck would have it, I had two boys that shared the same passion and love for baseball that I do now, and I was headed in a different direction from playing the game of baseball to coaching the game of baseball. Uh, because of my children's desire to play the game, I was afforded the opportunity to pass on my love and passion and knowledge of the game within the Deep Run organization, where I've had the, where I've had the opportunity to coach or coach against many of these brave first-class athletes you see before you tonight. I think we can all agree that youth sports are one of the greatest opportunities that student athletes have when it comes to learning lifelong lessons and building relationships, communication, team building, hard work, and being part of something that they can be proud of. Some of the greatest relationships that I've had the opportunity to develop were from my middle school days where uh, playing baseball. In fact, that's where I made some lifelong friendships, including my very best friend who, how's it going, man? <laughs> so he's in the uh, audience tonight. Um, as luck would have it, we are now both coaching both our boys within the Deep Run organization. Um, so just goes to show you how, you know, those relationships from back in the day, they, they can stick with you and last. And our boys, hopefully they can continue to play baseball throughout Deep Run and hopefully one day through middle school and high school. Um, I still remember to this day walking down the halls of middle school, wearing our baseball jerseys anytime that we had a game. And to be honest, it's a special feeling that you really can't describe. Um, having the opportunity to be part of a team in which you can represent your team, your school, your community is something that any student athlete should have the opportunity to relish in. Think about what that does for the self-esteem of these athletes and the pride that they take in what they're representing, as this should not be something that is ever taken away or denied from anyone. For these athletes to be able to walk down the halls and step on the field while wearing a Penridge name across their chest will leave an athlete with a great sense of accomplishment and pride in what they stand for. On top of the physical benefits of playing sports, it has shown that there's a direct correlation between physical activity and student athletes' academic performance, um, as a direct relation to the fact that they are healthier, more aware, and learning time management between, uh, between sports and schoolwork. Mr. Roller, thank yes. you. Yes, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Harding, and then Michelle Boyd right after that, and then we'll finish. Good evening, board and administration. My name is Ryan Aldefer. I'm a 1998 Enridge graduate and resident of Hilltown, taxpayer and parent of two Siler students, as well as the president of Deep Run Baseball. Boys, proud of you for speaking. I'm here tonight to speak about adding baseball to our middle school sports programs. Of the 13 districts in Bucks County, Penridge is one of three who do not offer baseball to our middle school athletes. This, in effect, puts our high school baseball program at a deficit as a competitive team within the PIAA Suburban One League. Much like Major League Baseball, without minor league to develop future stars, our high school lacks middle school feeding into our program, thus cutting off their supply for a freshman team and players who are ready for high school baseball. Over the last three years, Deep Run Little League Baseball program has seen significant growth in the baseball registration. We know that there is passion for baseball in Deep Run and Penridge Little Leagues. The desire for there to be a competitive opportunity at the middle school level for these athletes is, well, you see it here. Middle school is a time for students to develop physically, emotionally, and athletically. Baseball is a great, great opportunity for young athletes to learn how to enjoy winning, overcome obstacles, deal with failure and begin to understand how to work as a team and support each other, win or lose. I recognize that the lack of fields for the three middle schools have presented an obstacle for starting a baseball program. Both myself and the president of Penridge Little League have offered our fields for use. Similarly, our softball fields are already in use for middle school's girls softball. In the spirit of equitable athletic programming, I would hope that Penridge would also provide transportation for off-campus field usage for baseball players. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for the space moving the meeting tonight. And I urge you to vote for middle school baseball. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Olga Harding, uh, Hilltown Township. 
Looking to the future, my son is currently in fourth grade and has great love for baseball. He plays for Deep Run and also in travel. I was sad to find out our middle school will not provide baseball for him, but will will have to sit out in the sidelines and watch his, his sister play softball. Really not fair the way I see it, and I'm sure many families have been and are in the same situation. Middle school is such an important time to continue learning how to deal with the failure, success, working, working as a team, following directions. This is also allow them to grow stronger mentally, making them more confident and for their high school years. I pray that you make this a possibility for our wonderful baseball loving community. Hi, Michelle Boyd, Hilltown Township. Thank you for this opportunity. I ask that you please seriously consider middle school baseball. The life skills that this program would offer these kids is critical to, to their success. This gives these boys an opportunity to learn these life lessons through fun. As a mother of a middle school boy, keeping these kids involved in sports and activities is so important. These kids are so passionate about baseball, as you can see. We don't want these kids to feel that they have to go somewhere else or feel they can't play. Please give these kids an opportunity. We as parents and the community are here to support this program through middle school and these kids. So I ask that you consider, consider middle school baseball now so that these boys have the same opportunities as the girls in our district. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your comments. That ends public comments. So we are going to move on to our middle school baseball update by Mr. Eden. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Hagan. I'm the Assistant Principal of Athletics and Pupil Services here at the high school. And I oversee and work with the three middle school assistant principals who are the athletic directors uh, at our three middle schools. Um, first off, and this is not to be funny, but it's great to see Deep Run and Penridge Little League sitting next to each other. Okay? I know that there's battles all summer long. I know even, I think it was my class of 2012 or 13, they even played for a state championship against each other. And at Deep Run, there's a beautiful, um, uh, not a banner, but a uh, structure that says uh, who won that game. Um, <laughs> you can guess. Um, I, I've been here at Penridge, this is my 13th year. And just like you guys, from the time I was in first grade, I started playing baseball. Okay, I played at Lenape Valley down in Chalfont. I grew up, played middle school, played Connie Mack in the summer, and, and played at the high school. Okay, I know what it's like to be in your shoes, and there is no bigger fan of athletics than this guy right here. Okay, I, am, I pride myself at being at almost every single event that we have at the high school, Traveling to state championships out of Cumberland Valley with girls soccer. I'm there on the sidelines, living and dying, just like the coaches are. Okay? When, when I moved into this district about 16 and a half years ago, um, I married into a family that my in-laws are in the Hall of Fame at Deep Run for their time that they spent with their two kids. And when it became time for my daughters to go and start to play sports, we went to Deep Run. I somehow worked my way up to be the travel softball commissioner. It was one of those things where you answered the question, you weren't really sh sure what it was, but you're like, sure, I can help out. And so for three or four years, I helped develop programs with travel softball. And it started with one team, and by the time I left, we had four different travel teams for softball. So I want you all to know I'm invested in our community. I am invested in this high school and our middle schools without a doubt. And so we are working tires, tirelessly to figure out how we can make this work. Okay? Now, with all problems come solutions, but also come hurdles. And we are working on the hurdles. Okay. Mr. Hagan, I'm sorry to interrupt you. School board members, I just want to remind you, I know it's awkward with the presentations in this space. It is under the agenda. 
so you can follow along um, on your screens or you can create your notes. So I apologize. Thank you, Mr. So I'm going to go through this a little bit methodically so you have an understanding of where we are and, and what our decisions or work is ahead of us. So we're going to talk about facilities, budget, teams, and league information. So facilities, we have a facilities department here for the high school. We have two specific groundskeepers that work on our fields. And every day in the spring, they prepare James Memorial for varsity baseball, the middle school field behind, which is our JV field. They prepare Druck and Miller Playground in Sellersville for both the two softball fields that are there. And they also have gone down to Deep Run to prepare for that softball field, or fields, depending on if they have one or two teams. The, these two gentlemen are tasked with that job, and we all know what it's like in the spring with rain or late snowstorms and all those things that come with it. So those two gentlemen work very hard to get those fields ready. And sometimes they're there at 5.30 at night before a 6.30 game. And they're working overtime to get to that, to get those fields ready for our athletes and our coaches. We need to figure out a plan to add somebody to the mix. Okay, so that's something that as we go through our budgetary process, we need to figure out how we can accommodate that for someone to take care of the three additional fields. So that's a hurdle, right? That's not the Great Wall of China that we have to jump over, but it's a hurdle, and we need to figure that out. Okay, facility costs. This is all budgetary as well, but it's something that is, is attainable, right? So we pay rental fees for James Memorial Park for the varsity. We pay rental fees at Drunk and Miller Playground for softball. And we would have some fees at Hilltown Civic Park at Colt Playground. And Deep Run, it says TBD, but I think we're at a good place right now where we can play on the Connie Mack Field. So our North team would play at Deep Run. Our Central team would play at Hilltown Civic Park. And South Middle School would play at Colt Playground. Okay? And uh, as someone who has played at Colt Playground in, in multiple games, there's not a better venue for a high school baseball game or a middle school baseball game. We will maintain those fields, and that's where I'm getting at. We have to figure out how we can get that accomplished. Who's our, our person that we can bring in um, to, to do that? And we're working with, through that with our facilities department and through my budgetary process for um, for athletics. Transportation costs, taking out the price of fuel, which fluctuates, is not that big of a deal. It's $25 on a one-way trip to each of those schools, approximately. That's the cost of the driver and the fuel and the time. And for the games, it's, we play in a very close-knit area, um, so it's not like our high school teams are going to play at Harry S. Truman or Ben Salem on a yearly basis. So those costs are not enormous. Our concern right now is that we are so depleted with staff in our transportation office. We're currently about two dozen drivers short of where we need to be to be, uh, have a full contingent. And so that's our second hurdle. That's our second hurdle. That's something that we're working on through our HR and recruiting drivers. Here's our plea, moms and dads, if you're looking for a little part-time income, there might be opportunities for you to work in our, in our transportation office. But it's not feasible at this time because we don't have the drivers. I'm not saying that six months from now we'll still have that issue. What I'm saying is at this moment on January 18th, that's a hurdle. That's something that we can overcome. Mr. Hagan, yes, one, one of the things that we heard during comment is the transportation for softball. Can you speak a little bit about the differences of the softball because of the field sure. availability? So um, the routes and runs that our drivers have, um, historically there's been a run that um, would, would end up back here towards the high school after the initial high school run, which leaves the building about 225. It would be a shorter run, they're relatively close, they could come back to north, they put those kids on the bus, take them to deep run, and then they return back to the middle school for their dismissal is at 2.55, so about 3.05, 3 o'clock departure from the middle school. 
because of the shortage of things, plus um, we've had a, a larger population of homeless students, which we still need to transport to where they are living, that run is in question right now. And so one of the things that we, we, we have a, 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 a plan is that we have a, a softball field-ish uh, field behind North Middle School. We're going to prepare that so that if our North Middle School team doesn't have transportation, that they can use that field as their home field. Okay? How about it's, Central and South? Um, and Central and South both play on site. Central has one solid softball field at Central, and behind the building there is a backstop and a grass-covered infield um, that is not a lengthy amount of space. It's enough for softball, um, but that's where they play their JV and varsity. And South Middle School plays at the Owls Field, which is on the other side of Poppy Odor uh, Field. And we maintain that field. The Owls provide that to us. Um, and they typically, South, in the past three years, has only had one year of softball. Two years prior to that, they did not have a team. So we are able to do some things on campus for softball, um, if need be, with transportation. But again, we're, we're planning uh, to try to figure that out as we go forward uh, with the implementation of, of baseball in the future. Mr. Hagan, can you also talk about what you learned about vans? I know that we've right. had some emails that talk right. about the possibility of not if buses, because buses have been <coughs> bus drivers. Obviously, van drivers have different rules. Right. right. So the school district has two mm -hmm. vans that are used for a variety of different activities. Typically, they're housed at our transportation site. Um, they are a backup van in case another van is not available. At times, they're used to transport students for smaller athletic events, such as um, a small track meet where only a handful of kids are going on a, on a weekend, something like that. Um, it would be wonderful if those vans could be used um, by volunteers, which has been some of the questions that we've received. Um, but you have to be a school district employee in order to drive that van. And so, um, you know, we're going to talk about coaches in a minute, um, but the idea is that if, if our coaches, we had access to those vans, the coaches could take students to, to the fields, uh, which means that they'd be leaving their school building, coming to pick up the vans, driving back to the school, picking up students, taking them to practice, either bringing them back to the school where the parents pick up at the site, then bring the van, vans back to transportation. So that's part of the opportunity, um, but at this point we only have two vans. And those vans see the driver and eight students, plus all their baseball gear, plus their school bags, things like that. So we still need to work through that, but um, again, that's part of our discussion that's ongoing, is how do we accommodate getting teams to practice. Okay? Thank you. Um, other budgetary things, umpires. Um, not not necessarily a concern. We um, we have a, a variety of umpires that work out of the Bucksmont chapter, um, which we use for all of our sports. Um, and so we have an assigner. We tell them when the games are, and they assign um, umpires. Excuse me. Um, the cost is sixty dollars per umpire. There's two per game, um, and, and we go from there. That's not a, a large hurdle. That's typical. The, the budgetary items uniforms, equipment, et cetera, are all relative to basically all of our sports at the middle school level. So adding a sport and going through this process is, is a small piece to the puzzle. Now guys, I don't know if you can see it, but I have gone ahead with our supplier to look at ideas for uniforms and hats. Now that's just one man's opinion. Obviously I'll get coaches involved in that. But, um, you know, we have the opportunity um, to work with a, with a, a vendor, um, so he was able to mock up some things. And so, you know, we would get uniforms, we would get about 75 total, 20 for each team, um, hats, um, pants, belts, socks, all the things you need to go out and play the game. Obviously, Deep Run has a batting cage, they have L screens, and we would talk to them about use. But um, Hilltown Civic Park does not um, have a batting cage or an L screen there um, that I'm aware of. And so we would have to get some things so that practices can be run in, with some safety. Um, so an L screen, 
Um, we would pr purchase catcher's gear, one for each team, because you never know what the young men are going to have. Um, so we would pr provide that so that we know that it's certified um, through the, the, um, the NFHS. We would also get helmets, um, just because I know most people have their own, um, but for those that do not, we want to be able to provide that for them. Um, baseballs, we need to have practice balls, we need to have game balls, all those things. We would also get like a bow net type thing for practice, for use, and a tee for each school. Coaches, our salaries are part of our um, teacher contract. Uh, we would just be adding an additional salary for a, he a head coach and assistant coach. Um, and so we would have that for all three schools. We would field one team at each school. So it would be comprised of seventh and eighth graders and up to 20 kids per team. Now if vans are our transportation, we may have to limit that to 16. Um, just because if we have two vans, 16 kids. But that's something that we're going to um, look at as we go through this. We already are in a league. That's the really good thing. Our, our middle schools play um, in the Bucksmont, Upper Bucksmont Middle School, Interscholastic Athletic League with Indian Valley, Indian Crest, Doc Mennonite, the three North Penn schools, Strayer Middle School, and uh, our three schools. And we already have schedules that are made for all of the sports. Obviously, for middle school, just as a bye week when you would play our three schools, we would mimic that basket, boys basketball schedule, and that would make it so we would have 10 games. Okay? Um, I just said that. So at this point, right, I know we all want to hear yes. You, I want you to know, I, I'm pretty sure everyone up here at this table wants middle school baseball. I can't say about individuals, but I, I know I've heard from a number of them that we want middle school baseball. I want middle school baseball. I want it to build our high school program. Pretty much what everybody said, I agree with. We just have to overcome some hurdles. So this is an update from our June conversation. And I hope to provide an update as we go through the rest of this year so that we can go ahead and, and, and get this rolling. Um, I know some of these guys because they play with my nephews. There are some parents here that I grew up playing with. I understand the importance of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we just have some small hurdles that we have to overcome. And they're based off of people, right? So if we don't have bus drivers, we need to try to find more bus drivers. If we don't have facilities people, we need to find facilities people. I have no doubt we'll find coaches. There, all three middle school principals have said to me, I have people that are wanting to step up, okay? And so our goal is to get there. We just have to overcome these hurdles. I'm working on it. I know Dr. Bolton's working on it. The school board is working on it. The athletic directors in the middle schools are working on it. We just need to take two more big steps, and we can hopefully get this in the near future for Penn Ridge High School, or no schools, okay? Mr. Hagan, thank you. Uh, sure. Only two things that I want to add from a board standpoint. I talked to Mr. Dahlberg from a budget standpoint because there is some budgetary issues for this, although like Mr. Hagan said, they are not in the scheme of the total budget. A middle school sport is not an overly expensive uh, program um, from that standpoint. And it sounds as though the community has been wonderful in terms of if we're using some community fields that there may even be some, some savings there in terms of that. So the financial piece we're not concerned about. Um, we are trying to figure out what solutions might look like without transportation. For instance, one of the things we've asked to look at is the softball field at Central is right when you come off of um, Main Street there, 152. And so it's there on the left. The question is, is it big enough for a middle school baseball field? Because there might be, because there's a lot of grass at Central, right? But it, it is one of the schools where there is some space. And so the question is, could that accommodate a baseball field? And then there are some smaller grass patches where the softball field could be moved to. I don't know if that answer is yes or no, but that would solve transportation because it's softball. That's the solution, right? That there are two schools that have them that the kids can walk to. That doesn't solve north. That doesn't solve south. Right? If we continue to have the bus run at north, we could solve that problem at north, and it would only leave a problem at south, that there is not an obvious solution outside of transportation. Um, if those two worked and there are two vans that are available, 
you know, the only caveat would be when those vans are being used for emergencies, the kids would have to practice at South and they wouldn't have a field to practice at. They'd have to do other things in terms of hitting. That's not the worst problem in the world, but it, it would be inequitable between the buildings. And so we are trying to look at that. Obviously, we hope the transportation problem solves itself, although we can't predict that. And so we are trying to say if we didn't have transportation or we only had the transportation we have right now, because right now we have the one bus run that we're iffy about because of the homeless uh, area um, in terms of that driver being pulled more and might not be able to be back for a middle school run, as well as then the vans. Uh, they're not ideal, we prefer a bus, but the vans at least could get 16 kids there. Uh, it would limit participation, but that's better than no sport from that standpoint. So I don't know what other questions you have for Mr. Hagen, but just will kind of let you know where we were in terms of conversation. Um, I have a question, and you yeah. might be able to answer, Dr. Fulton. Are we required as a district to provide transportation on either a bus or a van? Could parents, in theory, if we have the funds and we have the fields, could parents carpool their kids or take their kids from south to Colt Playground or wherever we're playing if they wanted to take on that responsibility, or is that an option? Yeah, state code does not require transportation. <clears throat> Right, for and extra, right now they're for driving extra to other fields anyway. We would obviously need to consult with legal in terms of what that looks like because obviously from my superintendent hat screams liability mm -hmm. when you put somebody else's kid in your car and you know in terms of what happens and it, it's all fine when we say sure but then if something horrible happens what that looks like. So we would make sure that we would have that paperwork locked up. It's one of the reasons why volunteers can't drive the district van. Right, because our insurance doesn't cover a volunteer, even if even if it's a well qualified volunteer to say yes, I'll drive the van for the kids. It must be a district employee. Now that doesn't mean we couldn't hire somebody who their only job is to drive the van. Right, there might be plenty of volunteers for that um, as long as they have to do the clearances. But so we could check in terms of legal if that ends up being the only hurdle that is there in terms of what that looks like. Or it maybe does, if it was just temporary until we right, found buses right. and, and drivers and uh, parents was, wanted to pick their kids up and take them. To, middle school practice rather than obviously the only thing we need to be careful of and it's not it's, it's not that we can't overcome it we just need to be careful that we're not eliminating some kids by right because it, it's the whole thing in terms of we heard people mention cost and that wouldn't be an issue for us in terms of cost but when you do travel yes we can say we'll take any kid but that doesn't mean every kid will then say yes i am able and not every parent's able so we just need to be very careful about how we message that and, and getting kids that are involved Dr. Bolton, that was my thought. As, like the um, arrangement that we have with people who transport their own children to private school, but that wouldn't cover someone driving somebody else's child. So I understand that, but I would, if we can look into that option, mm -hmm. definitely. So um, listening to the presentation, I see transportation is an issue. Groundskeeping is an issue, and cost was the other thing. I think those were the three main things. Cost, I heard from the budget standpoint, we're okay, so we should be okay with the cost of it. So transport is a bus issue. I heard a lot of volunteers, and I agree that you have to check out the legal aspect of it, but as an interim, so we can get the, the right amount of bus drivers, I think that would be a possible solution for next spring, right? And um, at least allow us to move forward with approving this. And in groundskeeping, I know there's people who are doing this now for mm -hmm. Deep Run, which you guys talked about tonight. So but if those are the areas, so then we are we okay moving forward with it? Because I don't want to just keep pushing this down the road. And uh, But it, it would require a meeting of some sort with Mr. Hagen and some of the volunteers to figure out and also check out the legal aspects. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I've been in the board for two years, and we're still kicking this down the road. Yeah. So. Let's I would go ahead and figure out how to solve this problem. These are not insurmountable problems, but with all these people showing up tonight, I think it's important that we at least say we're going to do something and get it done. Yeah, I think it can get done. Um, I'm also thinking in the summertime, don't we hire students that come and help? Something with the laptops. They come and do something and we some hire workers. students. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, maybe we can hire students to be <laughs> grounds crew. I don't know. There are ways to get it done where we can make arrangements for them to have baseball i i'm we i am yeah. not concerned about the groundskeeping I, that that for me is a financial situation um we'll, we'll have to have a conversation about whether it's our people or it's volunteers right there, there's always concern about a system that relies solely on volunteers 
right? I've, I've been in youth sports my entire <laughs> life as well, um, on lots of hats, and there are times when the volunteer can't, right? Sometimes the volunteer doesn't, but sometimes the volunteer even can't. And so we would re we would prefer to budget that in, and that it be our groundskeeper. We've asked Mr. Harper what that would look like, because it's probably not full time, so that's why we didn't attach a price to it tonight because it's probably not a full-time person. The question is, and what else does that person do? Is it only seasonal, right? And we may very well up offering the job and hiring somebody who's currently working for Deep Brown or Penridge Little League because it's something they're good at. We also have different equipment, right, in terms of using our equipment. We also need to make sure from a liability standpoint, if somebody else does the work and somebody gets hurt, what's that liability look like? And so it's just all of that. I, I don't think groundskeeping or cost is a hurdle, right? Transportation, because of the field usage, is the hurdle that we will need to just continue to work towards for next year. Um, I don't see a concern with saying yes for next spring, that's something we'll work out. We just don't know what that answer will be because it has to do with vans, it has to do with drivers, right? We'll have to continue to work through what the possibility is in terms of transportation. Um, and if it comes down to simply, you know what, to start off with, we're gonna have to do it through volunteer and parents and have some sort of legal form that people fill out. Right, that's better than not playing. It's not what I would choose in terms of the best option. But so, no, I don't think that that's a concern. If there aren't other concerns among the board members, yeah, I just had a question on the transportation. It, could it, could a, someone want to be employed as a school bus driver but just want a dedicated run? Like, I don't want to be transporting people, but could I just say I want to be hired? I only want to transport kids for baseball. So that there will be a, a hired employee for a bus transportation, but they're just dedicated for that. Maybe have a, a, a lineup of people so that if one can't do it, then the next one would go. Is that a possibility of, of thinking it that way? Since we have so many people that want to volunteer, if that's the only hurdle, if they could be hired as a, a school employee but just be dedicated for that sole purpose? Uh, the answer is yes. Right, I mean, there, there can be in terms of when you have terms of employment. We would need to track, check contractually and what the, we have a support staff union that is parts of that, but I, I can't off the top of my head think of any language that precludes us from somebody saying, we're posting this position. I know that we have people who are retired who only do like field trip and sports runs. Now they don't just do one sport, right, but that's what they do. They don't do a normal run, they kind of just fill in when they can and that's helpful, so that, that is another solution. We need to make sure we have the equipment, right? It all comes down to the buses that are available, but as of right now, that's not a problem. It sounds to me like we just answered all the questions that we need to to move this forward. I think. I mean, you guys and I, we are girls, guys and ladies, um, take care of grounds at Deep Run and Penridge all year long. Uh, I've been there doing the same thing for 20 plus years, so yeah been there, did it, done it. There's no reason we can't move forward. It sounds like we got solutions on the table that we can move forward. I see no reason not to move forward so that you guys can play some baseball. Because that's what you guys deserve, right? Yeah. So can't we, uh, we add this to the agenda that we're going to pass this and just, I don't think we need to wait for all the solutions. I think we can figure them out. So we can move it forward to the Rick, yeah, to the, can we add it? And I don't know the legal aspects of the whole board stuff, so the, why don't we just go ahead and put it on? Obviously, you could publicly announce it at a board meeting. This doesn't require a board vote. Where the board vote would come in would be the money and the hiring. And so we obviously will have to keep you updated in terms of what those costs are, but that'd be part of the budgeting process. We do that right now for middle school sports and high school sports, as well as, as part of the personnel budget in terms of working that in. Um, from that standpoint, it does not need a vote to say yes, we go ahead and do that. That is something that we can commit to moving forward with. And then the pieces that you approve will be part of the voting process. What we'll need to do is then give you an update in terms of what that transportation could look like, or if there are some field creativities at Central. Yeah. So, and from a, from a union perspective, the, they would obviously get, um, you know, right or excuse me for that, but the, the concern isn't that we have too many people who want to pick these up and they can't have access to us at the point, you know, so I, I don't see any issues with us being able to hide, hire people for those specific purposes if we don't have people willing to step up and do it now. Um, so I think, I, I agree, I think, I think we can move forward and I, I'd like to see it for this spring. Yes. Right. I wanted to comment on, let's say tomorrow, 
people apply for the um, transportation and we get that worked out. I heard, you know, we might not have a problem with uh, having coaches, which is great. We're already in the league, which is great. If, if we get through those hurdles, is it, could it happen this spring? It is not currently. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> That's your role. Uh, it's not currently budgeted. And so from a standpoint of there are, it's not that there are no finances. There are finances involved even if it's just a screen printed t-shirt, right, and not a uniform. I mean, there's obviously ways to do things on the cheap um, for one year and that kind of stuff. It also would be uh, sports in the spring start mid-March. Is that fair? I don't know what the actual date is, but it's mid-March, so we're talking two months in terms of the, the beginning of that. Um, to have personnel in place, to have the money allocated, it is not something that we have ever planned for. As, as we've had these conversations, we've always said that if we're doing this, it's for the spring of 24. We have not done spring of 23 from a budget standpoint in terms of that process. So um, I, I don't know what kind of palpitations it gives you, but that, that's kind of where we are in terms of the budget. I, I just, my question would be, is there a schedule for us, right? So if those teams that had a buy when it was us, if they've already scheduled them, we may not get full schedules for each school. Okay. So. Can you reach out to them tomorrow yeah. and find out if we can get in a schedule? Yeah. And then can we get positions posted for the coaching positions, the assistant coaching positions, as well as, in the meantime, post positions for transportation and you know have that lined up if that's the direction that we end up going and then explore that field at central to see if that's something that is going to be feasible for baseball because that's also one whole school right there right well but the, if the central is a solution and that it's just something that's, i have no idea whether it is or not if that would definitely not be ready for march right you're not turning the salt you're not creating a new softball field and turning the softball field into a 90 foot between January and March, right? I do know enough about that term. <laughs> and so that might be a solution for spring of 24. That's I not also, spring of 23. I also I, do not know the availability of Colt Playgrounds and Hilltown Civic Park at this time. Right. And those so are things we can check on. My, my bigger concern is we're, we're, I hear people talking about a financial commitment and our business administrator is not in the room. So that gives me palpitations in terms of me saying, Mr. Dauber, you know, if we commit forty thousand dollars or whatever all this adds up to in terms of when you talk about personnel um, is that something that we could accommodate I would like to at least have that conversation with him since this is not money that I know exists um, next year that's easy because we'll put it in so we'll know that it exists and it's, and it's um, allocated for him. so every year we end up with a surplus and this is really talking about a really tiny amount of money and then you can also I mean I can come up with multiple ways where you can pull the money from we have that Peasers fund that we'll never actually use for Peasers. That is a long story, but we have that money just sitting there for years, which is sitting there and sitting there, so we can pull from there. Um, our fund balance is higher than what um, technically we need to have. And again, we're talking about such a minuscule amount of money. So I, I'm not concerned from a budgeting standpoint that um, that this would be an issue with it not being budgeted for because it's such a small amount. I mean, we have other things that fluctuate more than this cost from year to year that we kind of over budget for in that preparation. So. Um, I hear what you're saying, but I guess I, I think we're good. What are the next steps, Mr. Heath? Hiring, yep. equipment, um, field use forms and, and payment for that, um, and the facilities. So I know that we, we have volunteers, but we also have to be able to get our guys there with the machinery on a daily basis. Sounds feasible, but I'm an optimist, <laughs> and I love baseball. So, what? so is it fair to say that 2024 is? We can definitely do it in 2023 as a maybe, and you're going to get back to us with some. That's exactly what I was going to summarize. Wait, no. Yes. Wait. How are we going to do 24 is next year. Yeah. I thought I heard her say definitely 23. No, no. Oh, we have. Yes. it was a maybe. We okay. have. Yeah. We have. Yeah. 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 So if we send an email to the coaches tomorrow that are in our that are in our league, and we get the confirmation, we can f work all the details out in the meantime, in parallel, to solve the problem to get the kids playing in spring. Because we're talking two months, 
Um, as a Robin Penner Little League, you guys present for six years. We get stuff done with volunteers every single day, every single week. So I know we can get the job done. There's minimal hurdles that I think we can accomplish and get over. Um, I think whatever we need, I know everybody out here is willing to help. Um, so it's just a matter of what we need to do as a community to move forward, to get this moving forward for the kids. Um, let's do it. I did well still want to thank all the kids for speaking tonight. It was a great life experience. I'm sure you were nervous like we all were talking. But uh, good experience. You try it and keep up. And I would like to thank the board also tonight for listening to the community. Uh, we need to do more of that. So yeah. thank you. This might scare you from liability, Dr. Bolton, but with um Culp and South being a mile apart, is it feasible the kids could walk one year, getting the program back off the ground, and that alleviates transportation to one of the schools? Conditioning. <laughs> but also, don't be, what's the requirement, what's the allowance for middle school age? I know it's different at different ages, but in middle school, students can walk up to a mile to school, is that? Yeah, state code is 1.5 miles. Uh, Penridge uses one mile as long as the walking route is safe. There's obviously rules about those. Not not every mile is created equal when it comes to walking. So we could put them on those, um, you know, like the daycares do on them, the ropes. <laughs> I'm going to suggest we move on to the next budget <laughs> item. Then I don't know if that's okay. Okay. On that note, we will move on. But if we do make them walk, I think we can make them do it uphill in the Close snow, like we all did. <laughs> so then the consensus was we're moving this forward. Right? We're 24 and we're going to see if we can do it for 23. Yeah. Okay, just want to clarify because. Oh, you guys. Well, that's what I was going to say, so we can let the guys go home and get some rest or you know, play some little more details. details. Thank you all for going out tonight. This is the third year this is being presented. Um, and really, it's kind of a 30,000 foot view of just where we've been for the last uh, the year in regards to our data. And it's really a warehouse of a lot of things, not just the uh, student achievement data and proficiencies, but it kind of encompasses everything about our district and um, where we are in regards to numbers. So I'm just going to highlight a couple things, um, and then you have the report to look at in more detail. Um, but as you can see on page one, it starts with student enrollment. And as you can see, we are moving down just a, slightly a little bit from 6609 last year. This year we're at 6532. Um, our average elementary classes are staying just about pretty consistent, 21.1. Um, our attendance rates continue to do very well with uh, the majority of being 90 or above. As well as our graduation data, um, you know, we don't have the 21-22 yet, so that is provided through um, the uh, PDE, and they have not supplied that information as of yet. Um, our special enrollment, there is a slight increase with the 21.3% uh, 
enrollment, but um, I'm sure that as I can speak for Ms. Summers, you know, we continue to take back some of our classes of students who are in other classes that were outside the district in the past. We've been um, in taking on another class um, autistic support over at Dibler this past year, or at, wait, where am I? At Sellersville this year. So again, that number is gonna continue to go up as we take it over and provide those resources and bring our students back to their um, home district. Um, as you go through, again, at the bottom of the page, our uh, technical career center enrollment continues to go up. We are at 345 students this year participating. Um, like I said, I won't go over every one, um, but you can see um, on page, on the English language learners, um, you, you can continue to, continue to see that we've had an increase, and that's not a surprise in any way. You've seen um, jobs um, for postings for additional teachers and teaching assistants this year that we've been using out of our ESSERS funds to support that because of the increased enrollment, both at the elementary and middle school. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. On the next page, our gifted, slightly down. Um, I'm sure that's going to continue to climb back up again as we have students coming back into the district um, who may have, you know, went to either homeschool or our cyber charter, or, or our cyber program, I should say. Um, so they, that will be, I'm sure, to see increases as that we move forward over the next couple of years. Um, the next set of pages I will not go through, but we include our enrollment in each of the sports programs. Um, it's quite impressive when you see how many students are actually participating in all of our programs at the middle school and high school athletic participation. So our 22, 23, obviously we only have our fall numbers in there. We will complete that at the, as the year goes on and continue to update that. Um, moving on to Hold page. Hold on a question on that. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so number of participants, some of those are multiple sports, right? Do we know how many kids participate in sports percentage-wise or just the total number? Just the total number. I didn't do a breakout of percentage, sure. but... Mr. Wars, I, I didn't do it for this year. I did it my first year here, and we found that it was about 62% of the kids multi-participate. Oh. Um, so if you look at the numbers, and, and you assume um, in terms of the, the number of kids that are involved in more than one thing, is, was about 62%. Six, was about I'm just talking about the whole percentage of the students. Percentage-wise of the so students participate oh, in sports over sport. a year. Yeah, no, I, I can go back and do no, that. I, I, I mean, if it's, it's yeah. not a lot of work. I don't want to ask for more work. I just, I was just kind of curious sure. because we want to know if. No, I'm the, curious. Now. Okay, yeah, <laughs> so, maybe you can figure it out. That's great. Um, our music participation, participation again, as you can see, our, our music program has been very strong and continues to grow each and every year. Um, we have fabulous music teachers and ensemble um, for the chorus, orchestra, and band, and our, as I said, it continues to increase from year to year. You can just see just from last year to this year in our orchestra, I mean, we're up over about 100 students overall. In band, we went down slightly, but look at the course number, 632 students this year. We have 854 students participating. It's quite impressive. So, and some of the community, community days that they take place in. They participated. Any uh, any interest in starting rock and roll in that also? <laughs> it's coming, <laughs> as we know. Yeah. Be a lot, should be a lot going on at the high school. Yes. Um, our summer program participants, um, again, our summer program can just be um, very strong programs that support our students for either remediation and enrichment. Um, as you know from our, my previous presentations, we're using ESSER's learning loss money to pay for our EL summer enrichment for elementary um, in a middle school programs as well. So our, our participation continues to increase in all those areas. And then um, obviously the next couple pages, very proud, the class of 2022, the extensive list of, of schools that our students are attending um, from last year. And you know, ranging from the state schools to the private schools, it's, it's just very impressive in regards to all the different and, and varied choices that they attend. The next set of data is the PSSA scores. You will see the state data is not on there. So, and when we compiled this, the state actually retracted the numbers they gave us and had to redo them. They, there were slight errors in our PVOS information. 
So we will make sure that we get that back into the report. But our, our data, in a sense, is, just, is correct. The, the Penridge School District overall, in regards to the percentage you're, see, percentages you're seeing for each of the different grade levels. Is it possible for us, I, I saw, you know, we have the graduation um, <coughs> rate on here, but is there a way for us to start to track um, how many of our kids who get into, you know, because we track how many kids go to college, mm -hmm. but are we tracking how many kids graduate from college and then how many kids get jobs in the fields they went to college for? Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that's really how you measure whether or not you've prepared kids to be successful, is if they end up in the path, you know, if, if we've prepared them to know, because if just getting into college isn't really the, the hurdle, right? It's it's having chosen the career path, know, having been prepared enough to know that's where you want to end up and ending up in that place. So is there a way for us Dr. to kind of follow that with alumni? Dr. Scheid, is there something at the high school level at the, in the guidance office that maintains that data? No, there isn't anything currently, but I'm thinking that's a wonderful segue for when Mr. Dyer does his pathway um, presentation. presentation. Sure. We haven't met, we haven't collected data on exactly what Mrs. Um, Bass Clemens is talking about. So that would be new data to um, accrue for us. I think if we could find a way to do it, I think that would really help us measure how successful our kids are. That's something that, yes. um, well, Mr. Thomas, the, some of the PR um, jobs, they do some of that, the Education Foundation, they track the alumni. That's quite an undertaking, um, but that would be probably the path to, to go with, with that. Because it would be a lot of self-reporting. It's going to be hard to manage. It's an interesting thing to look at, but yeah, well, quite a task. Probably. Yeah. Okay. I think Mr. Thomas looked interested <laughs> in it because I saw him shake his head. I'll talk to you later, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> um, following the state data, we have our uh, the SAT and ACT scores that we include, as well as then the Keystone exams. Um, and at the very bottom, our advanced placement. As you can see, we we were identical in regards to the number of students who took um, from 2021 to 21 22, the number of students who took advanced placement courses. So, um, and this number, this year, obviously, we haven't completed yet, but we will make sure that is included. And then on the following page, I don't know why I got cut off that way, but we're going to fix that. Um, is the number of students that took the AP uh, exam and those that scored, the percentage of students that scored. A three or higher on the exam and as you can see where that 80 percent mark is kind of where we are um, kind of in the balance so the third party rankings I just brought uh, Mrs. Clemmer up here just to give a I'm sorry just one, uh, one oh, sure. so number of students for advanced place of 388 but what is the number of AP administered 639 what does that mean so th that's the number of exams that were administered and I'm going to, um, if, Mrs. Sh if Dr. Shai wants to speak to it, but I believe that is like if there's 388 students, you had took two exams of possibly. Right, right. Okay. 388 unique kids took right. 639 okay. yeah, That makes sense. Yep. Just to clarify. Um, I brought um, Ms. Clemmer up just to give a brief overview because some of you were here for the presentation when we did about the third party rankings and just how they get to these numbers. I just asked her to speak briefly as to why the rankings look the way they do for some and not for others look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna invite her to the mic just to give that brief overview. Brief. brief. Um, thank you very much. So <coughs> the third party rankings for most part, School Digger, Niche, US News, World Reports, those are some of the ones you're probably familiar with. Um, most of the ranking data that they have is based on test scores. Um, and so, as you all know, the test scores have been and the percentages have been kind of out of whack since 1920. And the state is actually... 20, 2020. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I say 1920, just school year, 2020. The school 2019, 2020 year. And so, because of that, our rankings are going to be in weird positions until we push through that. Um, School Digger, for example, also includes stuff like um, uh, 
uh, diversity, they include surveys from the community, niche also does that. So it just depends on kind of sort of what they're um, getting from the community. They look, niche um, also looks at things like um, after school activities, what they're doing. Um, U.S. News and World Reports focuses solely on keystones. They only do high school rankings and also AP scores. So a lot of it is focused strictly on preparing kids for college, not necessarily preparing kids for the real world and those that are going to do careers um, straight after um, high school instead of going to college. Any questions for me? Do they make that information public as to how it's weighted and everything? They do. If you um, go to the School Digger website, they give you a whole... But for like surveys, are they using their own surveys or do they, they take No, people public? just write in. So then it's not a survey. Uh, no, it's no, reviews. That's, a, review. that's, the, oh, it's that's a, review. a better word for it than a survey. Yeah, well, that's yeah. not an accurate way no. of doing ratings. So. Yeah, and it's about 10%, so it's an really? interesting... Yeah. So we should start a campaign. Okay, well, that's what we could do. I've thought about that, you know, because I actually wrote to them and said, explain to me these reviews. And they said, you know, we just take us. And I was like, oh, okay. So, thank you. Thank you. And it's interesting you ask, you say that because Dr. Bolton has mentioned that before. If we want our niche score to go up, let's write to them and yeah. let's get some reviews in. I'd um, rather work on the real problem. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, and then it, the, the data portfolio um, kind of ends with the number of staff by function, as professional support administrators, and then just the number of years um, of service that the categories that people are falling into. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's, it's a 30,000 foot view, but it's a nice little document just to provide us with where are we kind of overall. And, and, you know, I hope you find this helpful. Um, as Ms. Clemmer mentioned, uh, scores have been out of whack, correct? I mean, we know that PSSAs as well have been kind of, our numbers have been all over the place, and we're not, um, not special to that. It's across the, the state. Um, so two of our data district goals this year is one is for RELA in grades 3, 4, and 5, and our goal is to raise the percentage of proficiency by 10% over two years. And for grades six, seven, and eight in math to raise it by 12% uh, over the next two years. So, Chester, can you get that next presentation? And this is the one I sent um, this afternoon. I apologize. We were hung up on other things, and this one got put to the side, and all of a sudden we realized we didn't send this one. Yes. So, what I did, whoop, disappeared. So what I did was I just included the last three years of state testing numbers that we had. And what you're seeing here is the red is um, below basic, the yellow is basic, the green is proficient, and the blue is advanced. Um, and it's 2018-19, 2021, and 21-22, because there was no PSSA scores, obviously, in the 19-20 school year. That's when the mandated shutdown occurred. So <clears throat> what you'll see there is you can see that blue line kind of shrinking each year. Um, and our green line either expanding a little bit or even shrinking itself, and the yellow getting a little bit more uh, <coughs> wider. Um, so what our goal is, as we said, we, we saw that the number of students who were making proficiency was um, less than what we had hoped. Um, back to the 18-19 pre the pandemic and everything else, you know, we were moving in the right direction and we were doing very well. And we started the implementation of the Making Meaning Being a Writer program at the elementary schools. And again, the following year when we were going to expand that implementation across the rest of the seven elementary schools, that's when the mandated shutdown occurred and everything. And, you know, we had, we had to pivot. I'll use that word again. Um, we, had to make, we had to do a little bit of pivoting. And we um, had everyone... Um, implement the program and certain strategies and functions and philosophies of the Making Meaning and Beta Writer, but we kind of lost the, the um, comprehensive component to it because there was no professional development anymore, collaborative classroom had shut down, 
So we were really trying to just move it along as best we could and knowing that we would get back to it once we were back to some normal. So knowing that our scores have dropped, we set a goal, as I said, for three, four, and five for our proficiency rate to grow by 10% over the next two years. And I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we're doing at the elementary level to achieve this and um, they include implementation of teaching assistance at the non-title schools. As you know, you approved that because we had a part of our learning loss. Um, that is at Bedminster, Dibler, Grass, and Siler. Um, we're continuing with professional development now with Collaborative Classroom on making meaning and being a writer. Um, this year alone, we're having four different sessions. Um, since we have the extra day in June now, we're anticipating that we'll be able to take advantage of that and use that time, whether it's with Collaborative Classroom or ourselves to um, continue the professional learning within the program. Walkthroughs through our principals and supervisor to um, just check in with teachers. What do they need? How are they doing with the invitation component? And really giving them opportunities to give us feedback and, as they implement the program. Um, specific focus on TDAs, text-dependent analysis, to represent the structure and style of what students will be administered via the PSSA. Um, TDAs are very specific to what answering questions and using the text to answer questions. And um, we found that that was something that we were lacking, so we, we made a focus on that at each of our schools. Small group instruction, um, and you've heard this over the last couple of years, has been a main focus, not just in RELA, but in math as well to address areas of specific need. The util utilization of our extended intervention time to reinforce and remediate. Implementation of, implementation of the STAR assessment and Freckle blended learning system. This is one of those blended learning programs and the assessment that you approved as part of the learning loss and it's been very effective. And our principals are using that data on a regular basis to go check back and see that students are making adequate growth. Um, our book studies at the elementary schools that correspond with our reading instruction um, strategies for all students and <coughs> increased supplemental resources. Uh, the UFLY, which is a phonics um, intervention that's used across how many, K to 5. We bought it when we first read. Right, for re the reading specialists. K to 5. So when the reading specialists have their small intervention groups, they're working with students using this UFLY specialized instruction that have a deficit in their phonics. So I'll illustrate that. LLI, which is a, an extension off of making meaning to help with the comprehension strategies. And then we've also um, have worked to uh, purchase some common decodable um, book re readers in the elementary schools, helping the younger kids to work through and decodable words and, and strengthening the reading skills. And then, as I said, the math as in middle school. Again, you'll see the bands up there where the red is kind of expanded as you get to the further right, and the blue is getting a little bit smaller. <clears throat> so we, we definitely have a focus on this, and we know, like it's the elephant in the room, we want to make sure we're addressing it. So through the work of Mr. Vogel and the, and the middle school the math departments, uh, there have been curriculum audits for eligible content, the pacing and formative assessments with additional content to bolster concepts. So we're adding some things in where we're finding those where the weaknesses are happening. So we want to make sure that students are um, seeing things they're going to see on the state exam. Revised pacing um, and recognizing <coughs> that some things needed to be slowed down or some things could be moving a little bit faster. Creating common unit benchmarks where teachers can look across the district and understand where the instructional practices need to be improved or we need to focus in on certain strategies that are being taught to students. Um, our instructional coaching, um, as you know, we have a very strong instructional coaching um, philosophy here and, and practice that are helping with small group instruction and other effective strategies, intervention groups at each of the schools frequent progress monitoring, and that's with that formative assessment component as well. Student created improvement goals with parent support. So the, nice to see students are creating their own improvement, identifying their own weaknesses, and knowing where they need to grow. And then we have pre-algebra and geometry, the inclusion of subunits within the middle school, the insertion of additional eligible content items. Again, we're using Study Island, that's a blended learning program to help reinforce and remediate for students where they may be lacking in skills, and I excel um, as well. 
And then South does have a full-time Title I teacher. In the past, we've always had a teaching assistant. Um, we decided to move the funds, shift them a little bit, and put a teacher in place there um, to help support the students over at South Middle School. Yeah, I just want to ask. So I'm, I'm glad to see the phonics, the, using the decodable words. I really think that that is a proven way of getting kids remediated. Can I just add to that piece because I'm not? Yeah. So we did add, in addition to that, this year we started implementing foundations. Our phonics program, we only had it in kindergarten in the past. All first graders are getting that instruction as well now. So we're really taking a focus on that phonics and the unique awareness approach to get students where they need to be. I think it's, a, it's been effective, at least in my experience. So I was wondering if the same, you know, going back to sort of the traditional, phonics was a more traditional way of teaching reading. Mm -hmm. So for math, are you going back to some of those kinds of more traditional teachings, the things that have gotten a bad rap. Um, you know, as we go along, I'm looking at me. I know, Mr. Bogart. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I also did notice while Mr. Vogel is walking up to the microphone that where the red has increased in some areas, for sure, <laughs> but I was adding up the numbers of the green and the blue the yellow, so the yellow has shrunk in some areas, but there was a, in some of the scores, there was a, you know, a correlating increase in the green or even the blue, Correct. so some of yes. them were kind of, which was a good thing, we had more right. kids in the, okay. Speaking about the math and the reload, we're, we're heading in the right direction again <clears throat> for both of these, these goals, which is a good thing, but we knew that we needed to put even more emphasis on both of them to make sure that we continue for that sure. direction. Is it, looking at this graphic, if you start in the left corner and make a diagonal, is that, that's the same kids, right, going from? 18, you have the one year six, skip, seven. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. okay. Oh, right. It's so it would be to... true in the right hand oh, right, two right. column <coughs> from 2021 20, right. to 2122. 20, the only thing that would correlate from 18, 19 would be the eighth graders in 2021. 20, okay. Right. You're missing one year. Normally you'd be right, but the one year skip. Okay. And they're not cohorts. Correct. Because right. it's all kids. It's not central to central. It's right. Not. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'm Howard Vogel, and I coached baseball for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as far as um, the elementary is concerned. When we stepped back for the pandemic, when we went away, I made some calls in terms of what we were going to cover, and I felt like the most important thing they have, and you kind of hit on it, is understanding basics and having some fluency and also problem solving. So I let, because we weren't covering the same quantity of material, so I wanted to focus on what would be the best quality <coughs> for them during that time, and also the next year, because it was still a little bit off. Um, so we focused on those types of things that, um, in terms of, uh, I let go stats and probability a little bit and geometry a little bit. So scores might not have reflected the first year back, but they ought, last year in third, fourth, and fifth, they were already rebounding pretty nicely, especially in third and fifth. So I think that's going to pay off in, in the middle school as well as we move forward, as well as all the things that Dr. Barczyk uh, mentioned up there in terms of what we're addressing. Now, as far as just the basics, basics, you know, like what you were used to, what I was used to going through school, we do those. Um, we do the, what, you know, everybody refers to the traditional method, that kind of thing. We do that, but we also, recognizing the kids all learn differently. Um, I have two kids that are vastly different, not just in size, which is huge, but <laughs> also in terms of where they are in development and educationally. So they... One of them took very nicely to the traditional. One of them took nicely to my favorite one, would be like the partial, you know, partial sums, partial products, those kind of things. So when we do that, um, like one's good for what I used to call brain food in terms of letting them think mentally. Because if I asked you 17 times 13, um, you wouldn't do. I'm pretty sure seven times three, and you, you know, I would look and see if you're looking up in the air and carrying the two and the whole thing. Um, but the partial products, you could do that mentally. 
Um, so what we what we like them to do is have multiple ways to do it um, and uh, to attack any particular problem. Reason for that too is um, having taught up to honors pre-calc is when the kids get there, if they're able, if they get stuck one way and that's it and that's all they know, they don't have another way to get to that problem. But if they have multiple ways to attack things and, and think about things in a problem-solving nature, then they can get there. So. Yes, we always do traditional. I never talk down traditional because, one, that's when they go home. If I talk it down, they're going to say, what's he doing? They should do it this way. <laughs> yeah. So I want them to celebrate the idea of being able to do a traditional method and an alternative method that, you know, that would also benefit them going forward in different ways depending on the type of problem they're solving. So that's, you well, know. Can someone speak to how are they defining the, the proficient basic and below basic? I'm assuming, you know, in the math, if you look at sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade, the, the below basic, or the basic and below basic is really high, right? I mean, that's like yes. almost 80%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't, right. So is basic, is, is basic something you're trying to achieve, or, or is that not, I mean, you think we're trying to get proficient in advance, but right. so why is, why is that the case that for our sixth graders and seventh graders, um, that and even eighth graders, that it's like over seven, between 70 and 80 percent are either basic or below basic. So one of the things that uh, we've done also, and because I, you know, love numbers, I re we reached out to Lincoln and we looked at the districts across the state that they have, uh, uh, you know, all the, the districts they serve, serves across the street, the state, got their numbers. Uh, we've looked at the county numbers and we've looked at our numbers. Um, although not exciting, obviously, we're in line and better than the state averages in all cases. Hmm. It's hard to believe when you, you know, uh, because we know no matter what the state data is telling us, we know internally we want to improve on what we're doing because that's not where we want to be. Um, but we, like Dr. Reparczyk said, with the things that we're doing right there, with the uh, improvement we're already seeing at the elementary level, I think we can re rebound to past pre-pandemic levels um, within a short period of time, but um, there's no getting around the fact that when we lost some of that educational time, like we had to make some calls. Um, everything's back in the curriculum now. Um, we're attacking uh, and some of the courses that are um, at the middle school level, especially courses like algebra, which historically has not spent too much time on things like stats or the geometry aspects of a course. That's where the subunits came in, where we're trying to infuse some of that and really focus on some of the eligible content items that we have not focused really a lot in the past in like a geometry course or a pre-algebra course. So those are a lot of the things that we've done to uh, you know, address what we think is a need. And what that also means, you know, most of the districts across the state, and I can share that any time because uh, I have, um, even in elementary, I mean, uh, elementary I have, uh, all the data for every school in the county because I was really curious to where we stacked up and where we are. So no matter where we are, we know we have a lot to grow on. But we are not alone. It's not, we're not by ourselves. So, oh, go ahead. Um, so I know we have to report on PSSA and look at that data. Are there other tools or measurements that are really able to us besides? Mm -hmm. Like, is it possible that? Kids are really learning well, but the PSSA tests. And that's why we're using that, that star freckle, this, the star assessment, because it correlates with the standards and knowing that we're making progress with students and using it to then focus in on different strategies and skills that the students may be in need of remediation and additional support. So, yes, there are benchmarks. There's, um, there's common benchmarks that they're using at the middle school. Is more help is, is helpful in regards to looking across the board, like I said, and seeing, okay, where are the pockets where students are really falling? And that's where we as a whole district or as a school need to really bolster and do some more work with our students. Is there a centralized place? Because we get asked this question a lot. Like, what are you doing to address the learning losses? And we try, you know, to, to give brief explanations of all of these great things but people don't come to the meetings and they don't necessarily watch them is there a place on the website I'm looking in the back corner again where this information where some kind of concise 
presentation of here are the ways that we are addressing learning losses in the school district yeah. because I know we're doing them. It's just a matter of being able to explain it and I can only explain it to one person, you know, at a time. Right now the only thing that I would say that supports what you're asking is through the uh, presentations that have been, that we provided for the ESSERS grant in regards to learning loss and the different presentations that we're identifying the, the different resources, whether technology, staffing, whatever it may be. Those are posted to the website under the teaching and learning okay. website. All right. mm -hmm. Can I ask, uh, I think you answered this, Mr. Rubel, but <coughs> pre-pandemic, wherever we sat, say countywide and statewide, obviously everybody's scores have gone down. Mm -hmm. Are we still at the same level? Generally, overall, yes. Um, that's not where I want to be when I when we did this prior to me going to grass out of the you know 13 school districts in the county. We were up in the uh, fourth um, and third and fifth, depending on what year we were doing it in. So, are we? Is that still where we sit? A little bit comparative after the pandemic. A little bit lower. I haven't done. I haven't collated all of it because we don't have, at, the, at least at the middle school level, I don't have every piece of data from every district. Uh, right now, it's on a volunteer basis, so I can't quite tell with definitive accuracy exactly exactly where we stand. And then one other thing, I don't know if they still do this, and I don't even know if this was district wide or just at South or maybe just a teacher, but I know when my oldest son was in South. Um, <coughs> He went in like twice a week. I mean, if I'm being honest, he was motivated by not being grounded, but he went in, they did twice a week before school, a teacher, and he did bring like donuts and breakfast sandwiches, and I'm sure that helped, but it really helped him. I think he went for like two or three months. I don't know if they'd still do that, or if that was just a teacher wanting to do that, or if that was a school program, but it made a difference for him. There are after-school tutoring programs at the middle schools, homework clubs, and the high school as well, correct. Either before or after, they all have remediation and intervention groups based on the data, the assessments that we're using, so they're all being strategic in that manner. And we do see the effects of the students who stay either before and after school. We are going to move on to the revised 22-23 calendar. As you know, we, we had our first snow day. So December 23rd on that revised calendar is now marked in, we put it in blue for very cold. So inclement weather, no students, no teachers. Um, and my understanding at this time is we are not looking to use the 21st as the first snow makeup day. So, <clears throat> in my error, I need to put it back still as a snow makeup day number one. And then the April 10th would still be snow day makeup day number two. Um, okay. So, what you will see there is we've made a change in the number of student days and staff days in December to 16 instead of 17. And our overall student total student days dropped from 182 to 181. And we've added June 13th as the additional teacher day. So now the teachers have nine staff days in June. So that is how the calendar looks at the present time. As I said, we'll put <clears throat> the February 21st still as the, if we were to have another snow day and decide that that's the first makeup day, then we'll have it there. All right? How does the schedule compare to policies in Town? Almost identical. Do you know, can you point out what the differences are? You're talking about this year still. Yeah, this is this year's. This, year's oh, oh, this isn't next year's. Yeah. <laughs> Although we have the answer for next year's. I say, I didn't bring that with me. All right, so we're good in that. We will move that forward for approval to revise it. Can, can I go back to the... 22-23? No, the... Um, you moved on. I was waiting for... I was waiting oh. to ask you a question about the data. And Sorry. And then we shifted. Um, <laughs> so it looks like, you know, and... It, it looks like we're bouncing back as far as math is concerned, but we don't seem to be back, bouncing back with RELA. And um, I was 
wondering if you had some thoughts on why that is. And then um, science, the state scores went up, but our scores went down. And I don't know if you thought if there was any reason you think that that's the case for that. Real quick, were you talking about the high school science scores or the middle school science scores? Uh, I'm looking at middle. <coughs> okay, I can address high school. Yeah, I'm looking at well, eighth grade is the one in front of me. I haven't looked at every single one of them. Yeah, it, it's on page 17 of the first report. Uh, Mr. Bainey, I don't know whether off the top of your head or whether you want to put something in writing. So the question basically is if you're looking at eighth grade science scores, the state averages went up. Often our scores move with the state averages. That's one uh, instance where ours uh, went the other way. Right, Ours went down a little bit where the state went up a little bit. Anything from an initial standpoint, or if not, if you would give some thought to that and put something in writing to the board. Yeah, I would appreciate it. further digging into okay. the yeah, right. numbers to get into this, this more than the the prize, Thank you. It's page seven. In that so, explanation. It's eighth grade science. I, I don't, is what you said. I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. It, would it would have to depend on we don't get to the state. state. Yeah. We've been talking about this at our programs and services meetings at the IU as well. And um, obviously, we are not the only ones that are seeing these type of the situation um, in this area. And on the Future Ready Index website, there is a now a posting from the state, at least, um, of their kind of their explanations because of all the opt-outs that occurred that that impacted scores greatly. Um, I, but again, it's kind of hard to put it in perspective exactly what happened. Um, but there's, the, I mean, like I said, we know it's there and we're addressing it, but. Um, to, to know why the state went up and we went down, there really hasn't been any further explanation from that. Okay. Any other questions, Ms. Pettis, comments on the... Uh... All right. So the 23-24 calendar that's being proposed tonight <clears throat> is very similar to our past calendars. Um, we start our induction program in the middle of August for three days. Then we have four days of staff in service, the 21st to the 24th. And students will start school on August 28th. That has become kind of a tradition over the past many years now. Uh, we have our Labor Day weekend scheduled. Um, there is a Jewish holiday in September on the 25th because it starts at Sundown on the 24th and runs into the 25th. That's the reason for that day, because it ends at sunset on the 25th. Um, and then October is our, our annual um, professional learning that we've had on the calendar now, um, that we bring all everyone together, K-12, to and do um, some various um, professional learning activities across the board. And then in going into November, November 7th being Election Day, the 21st being um, parent-teacher conference day and the 22nd, if needed. Um, as you know, our teachers do evening conferences. So they do Thursday, the 16th of November as an evening conference, and they'll do the 21st. They do the early dismissal, they have afternoon conferences, and then they move into evening conferences. So that's where the 22nd is the payback for their contractual time. And then we have our regular <coughs> Thanksgiving break, our winter break in December that runs into January 2nd will be back. Martin Luther King Day um, holiday on Monday the 15th. The 19th is our transition day with the, um, tri the semester for um, professional learning and then preparation for um, report cards and conferencing. And then in February we have President's Weekend. Um, we have our professional learning. We extend that weekend by one day for the students and have a professional learning day on the 20th. And then spring break is a little bit earlier this year. It's the end of March, running into the beginning of April. And then we have a long haul from April to May, which is fine with me. Um, lots to get done. And then we have our Memorial Day break. And believe it or not, I keep saying this myself, June 5th will be the last day for students. Mm. Uh, keep in mind it is a leap year, so we get one extra day. 
So, but it takes us to June 5th, and then June 6th is the teacher's last day. And again, we'll maintain the 20th of February and the 1st of April as our two snow makeup days for next year. I would like to draw the board's attention to the yellow highlight at the bottom of the calendar. <coughs> that's been something that's been there since um, I became superintendent. It was around a conversation that we had either, I think it was my first year, about whether um, school days would be made up or not if, because we did more than 180. Mm -hmm. And so that language was put in there because the expectation was that we would make up those days. Um, I've learned over the last two years that it depends. Right, so that the board has made different decisions depending on how many days and when they fall. For instance, this year we're forgiving the one student day. <clears throat> right, the decision was made to forgive that one student day. So I'm going to suggest that we adjust that language to make it a little less will and a little more may, so that it still provides um, the option to be able to use snow makeup days if we decide we're going to. But it, it doesn't because this we have families planning for it. We clearly say to them we're going to use the snow makeup day, and then we did. I just don't like putting something in writing that we know that it may or may not happen. And so I'm going to soften that. I'm going to change three words to change it to consider and may mm -hmm. instead of we will. Right? And so you'll see that in terms of the change. Really the purpose of that being there, not only to say that student days are vital in terms of they're one of the most important things we do, the number of days kids are in front of teachers, but also to remind parents they should not be scheduling a vacation for the week of June 10th because there's a real good chance we're going to get there from a snow day standpoint, right? And so it just, we need to keep saying, please don't, please don't, please don't, because all of a sudden the last day of school is June 12th, people are going, oh, but I'm at the beach. And it's like, well, you know, that, that doesn't take many snow days to get into that week, and so that's part of why that language is there. So when you see this on the board agenda for your consideration in a couple weeks, you'll see that that language is, oh, it's just next week. You'll see that that language is softened. It still is the same purpose, but it won't say will, it'll say may. All right. So uh, then, on, the, on that note, can I just ask, um, when we just had that last meeting um, for block scheduling, I believe the feedback was unanimously in support of moving to a block scheduling model from everyone who was there. Um, and so, you know, it sounds like we're moving in the direction of going to block scheduling, not next year, but the following year. Um, no, keeping that in mind, does it make sense to say, look, we could really use the extra professional development next year, so maybe we just say, change that language up front to say the first two snow days we won't make up and those will become professional development days at the end of the year to give our staff more time to do some professional development in preparation for that block scheduling the following year. I think that would be a more effective use of those days. Um, and then it gives more flexibility where we're not altering the calendar. But knowing that that is on the horizon, I think that might be a smart way to do it, at least for this year, and then we can obviously reassess it the following year. So I'm never against having more professional development dates. I'm also not against having kids in school. So when we get to the planning of the block scheduling, I'm sure we can talk about that and have further discussion of, of, of that exact statement of what you're, you're, you're making. And that's it, that language there, gives us there was an issue that came up last year about the, the Wally, yeah. yeah and, but I think it's on yeah. the 12th, so it's on a It's on Sunday. a Sunday this right. year. Yeah. That's actually so, good to say. Yes, yeah. that, well, that yeah, is a Sunday this year. We did look into that. We wanted to make sure we were, you know, looking to make sure that if it needed to be observed, it would be observed, but we did, it did fall on a Sunday. Great. And then to answer your question, Ms. Bannon's comments, so myself and the Quaker, a representative from Quakertown and Palisades, and the Elmer Bucks Tech School, we get together. We go through literally every day of the calendar. Um, and I am proud to say that we never shut down to say that we're the reason for the not having students at the tech school. So we are always in alignment with one other school in regards to having classes being held at the tech school. Quakertown's really the only one because they have additional contractual professional learning days in their contract that doesn't line up exactly with ours. And that seems to mostly be that Monday after Thanksgiving because we made that shift and um, and they're not able to make that shift. because. But Palisades is open, right. so it's open. So either way we went on that date, we would still be in the majority, I guess, where they, basically they do whatever we want them to do because we'd be that school that flips it one way or the well, other. Well, it used to be all three of us closed and Palisades followed our path and they're open now. Right, so we're the ones kind of steering it away from Quakertown, even though, so Quakertown has that conflict and we're all kind of saying, oh, well, sorry, we're, <laughs> we're yep, we, we still go. So, 
So I will um, go ahead and proceed if this can be taken for a vote at next week's meeting. That is everything. Thank you. Mr. Ranksky, take seven minutes. Seven minutes. Please. Take seven minutes. Mr. Thomas, if you would uh, pause the. Directed to the presiding officer rather than individual board members, district employees, or members of the public. For confidentiality and privacy rights, specific comments regarding particular individuals must be communicated privately to the school board and superintendent via email at psdschoolboard at penridge.org. And with that, we do have one person signed up for public comment, uh, Ben uh, Bridgewater. You just could remember to state your name and your municipality. Bridgewater, Perkasy, Borough. Uh, I just wanted to say, as you look at curriculum, uh, could you please keep in mind, uh, try and choose the best curriculum that is that has a balanced <coughs> view, especially in history. It's not necessarily a, a left-wing view of it or a right-wing view of it. Try and make it balanced or neutral so that we're, we're showing our kids, or we're teaching our kids how to think, not what to think. So th this may mean uh, not always picking the most popular curriculum, but but finding the best one. That, that's all. Th thank you for, for everything, guys, for what you do. OK, thank you. All right, so then moving on to um, high school pathways program, uh, Mr. Dyer. Good evening. Uh, those that don't know me, I'm Mr. Dyer. I'm a finance and accounting teacher here at the high school, and I've been helping Dr. Scheid with the Pathways program the last four years. First off, I'd be remiss. I did not plan on wearing my championship baseball jacket today, so it worked out very well for me. So that worked out. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Mr. Thomas uh, for the sessions, and Mr. Chester McLaughlin here to help with the technology there unsung heroes here tonight. So the presentation here basically is an update of where the pathways are and what we're looking to accomplish here in the future. You all have the presentation. Mm -hmm. So the screen you're looking at here are our current business partners. So these are local businesses in our <coughs> community and our region that we currently work with. Uh, also, this list has grown probably by a dozen or so since I put this together mid-December or so. So it's continuously growing, which is a good thing. So they all play a part in our program. One of the biggest components of the Pathway program is communication and getting the word out what this really is. It's a fairly new topic here at Penn Ridge. Uh, so one of the biggest things we do within the building is we provide a guest speaker series for our students. So far we've had a total of 41 guest speakers come in. Uh, and total attendance has been just over about 600 kids who have attended those various guest speakers. And they're people who are in the community. They're professionals who either run a business, own a business, or work for a business. Uh, all the previous businesses that you saw on the screen before, uh, they're our talent pool that we pull from to come speak to our kids about carpentry, finance, biopharmaceuticals, whatever topic they're going to talk about. And they focus on uh, what kind of education they need to get to their position. So it helps kids understand uh, what kind of educational levels they should acquire if they're interested in that field. Uh, a little bit about their day-to-day, -day, what they do at their job. Uh, and they, they touch on what kind of classes here at Penn Ridge should they take if they're interested in that kind of field. So the guest speaker series really was a, a blessing in disguise. I did not expect it to be so popular and so big. Uh, so it has taken uh, <coughs> quite an undertaking to get that up and going and maintained. So we have our next one on um, the 13th of February. So we'll have some more. Hey, it's just a question on it. How, how is that communicated to the students and to the public? That's a great question. Uh, so it's communicate, 
communicated through our ed efficiency program at the high school. Uh, so this is a program where kids have to, during a RAMS period, where kids sign up for an activity during a particular RAMS period. And they can choose, they have club meetings, uh, teachers put on uh, interesting and fun activities that may not be, you know, sort of a brain break, like a Lego building session or whatever. And that's where we advertise these guest speakers. So the kids, when they log on to efficiency, they'll see the 12 or 15 guest speakers I'm bringing in that particular RAMS period. And they're like, oh, I want to do biopharmaceuticals. So they'll click on that and enroll in that program. Uh, it's announced the daily ramble in the daily announcements. Uh, it's also posted on their Canvas pages um, from time to time if they're interested in those opportunities. Uh, in December, we had a parent night uh, following. Uh, I presented to the middle schools, all the eighth graders. We had an assembly during le uh, 11th block. I think that's what they call it, the middle school? 11th period. 11th period, thank you. <laughs> Got block in my head. I'm already excited about it. Um, so that 11th period presentation to all the eighth graders in an assembly during that period talked about what the pathway program was, how it's going to be beneficial to them, and sort of just sort of get the conversation started. So when they come up to the high school next year, that first day of high school where they're all nervous and excited, they're going to see me that very morning talking about pathways, and there'll be an opportunity to build upon our conversations we have this year. Uh, so we hosted a parent night here on December 7th. Um, it wasn't as highly attended as I would like to have, to have been, but uh, someone told me that was good news. That means parents liked it and they understood it and no questions needed to be asked. So, um, But we continue to have those comic, um, communications with the parents at the 8th grade level, um, which really, they're the ones who are really interested and they're the ones I get emails from the most because they're planning for their kids to move up to the high school and they're hearing about this program. How do I get involved? How does my kid benefit? Things like that. Uh, it's also pr produced on the, the bi-weekly s'mores at the high school and the principal newsletters uh, at the middle school for the Career Pathways program. So there's always something new every, every uh, other week. Uh, I have done numerous high school classroom visits where uh, teachers, I uh, will communicate with them saying, I'll come into your class, give me 15 minutes, I'll talk about career pathways related to their topic uh, or the class they teach. Uh, so it sort of gives me a chance to meet with kids as a whole um, to discuss the program and how it's going to benefit them in the future. Uh, we have posters, you see them on the door still from a couple weeks ago. So there's a lot of information available to the students uh, on a daily basis. Continuing social media, Mr. Thomas has been an excellent uh, compatriot in that uh, program for us through our social media program, um, posting out events. I'll get to a little bit. We have an upcoming event that's an uh, exciting opportunity for our kids. Community partnerships. We're working with the Chamber of Commerce on a very regular basis, attending ribbon cuttings and meet and greet events that they host on a, a monthly basis. So I'm at those events and I you know, hand out my card or hey, come talk to my kids type of thing, just getting um, the more businesses and corporate partners we can form, the more word gets out there and grows the program. Uh, the IU has been instrumental. They have started a um, Career Pathways Executive Committee Board probably about four years ago now, and uh, they have a website, Career Ready Bucks. I'm on that committee, the Executive Committee, to help form that uh, program, and they're District, or I'm sorry, they're countywide, and we're focused here in Upper Bucks mostly, so, um, which has been a great uh, program. They're really moving forward with it, but as anything with the, that big of a group, it tends to move a little slower than we prepared for, so that's why we have our own program here. Also, we are part of the Regional Career Pathway Coordinators, so uh, there's a bunch of the area school districts that have a Career Pathways, North Penn, and Norristown both started theirs this year uh, in official capacity. <clears throat> Solerton is the gold standard that has been very helpful to us um, developing our program here. The Canvas course, we have a Canvas course for those that are enrolled. So a student who attends these guest speaker <laughs> series, they say they want to find out more information so they can um, scan the QR codes in the high school, they can get the information from the counselor or the principal's office. Uh, and when they reach out wanting more information, I have them enroll in that Canvas course 
That's where I send out announcements to our enrollees. Right now, last I checked, it's 58 students <laughs> actively enrolled. Uh, so that means they're attending these events where they're doing um, some other out-of-school out events for career pathways, and they're completing uh, interest surveys. So they're completing reflection pieces. They're completing other documents for me to sort of gauge what we need and what they're looking for, and some feedback of what's going well and what's not. So far, it's been all positive, though. Again, Mr. Thomas has been crucial in our development of the web page. We are on the high school web page under students. If you click on college, or I'm sorry, if you click on career pathways, take you to our web page. It is still <coughs> under construction. Um, web page design has changed a lot since I taught it 15 years ago. And the coding, I don't have to code anything. It's just drop and click, and it's awesome. But there's still a learning curve, so we're still developing it completely. Uh, but there's a space on the page where students are able to enroll in the program. So they click out a, a little enrollment form, they fill out their information, it sends them to a spreadsheet, and from that spreadsheet I send them uh, various onboarding information that I need to get them in the program. Uh, also, there's a link right on that main page for any other community partners or any other community organizations that want to be part of our Career Pathways program. They fill out a form and it enters them into our database, and on the form they can state do they want to be a guest speaker, do they want to host our students for job shadows or mentorships, and then that sort of gets them into the database, and then I cross-reference each database to pair up students who are interested in a certain topic or area with local businesses who have that availability. And that's the main goal of the, of the program. Uh, just a question, how many kids in the ninth grade or in eighth grade signed up for this year for Pathways? How many of them? So, so current, current ninth graders or current ninth, rising? Ninth uh, so current ninth graders right now, they're our largest population. Okay. Um, simply because I still think there's a lot more parent involvement, and they're like, hey, do this. You know, um, I have very few seniors involved right now simply because, what one, they're already on the college path or they're on their career path or they're already established. So, um, so what, mean what percentage of kids? I would probably say of, of roughly 75% are going to be a freshman class. Uh, so they're the ones that are most interested in the, in the topic for us. Well, then the word is out. Yeah, so that's, that's, good. that's the key. And they're the ones that will benefit the most simply because they have the most years here. Um, if you join as a senior, obviously you can do a couple guest speaker uh, series. You might be able to do a job shadow here and there, or you might be able to do a uh, mentorship, but probability is not going to get through a whole lot. So, yeah, it's freshmen are our largest contingency, which is good. Yeah. So we have some time with them. One of the most exciting pathways we have is our teacher pathway, since uh, we're in a prime position to accommodate those students who are looking for a uh, education future. Um, so as you can see, the, the total involvement with from planning and meeting uh, with me or guidance counselors about job shadow, we've sent out three students currently who have completed job shadows uh, at our middle, all three of them were at our middle schools. Uh, which has been very exciting to hear their feedback because they tend to pick the middle <coughs> school they went to because they have some comfort there. Uh, so it's the responses are when I ask for a reflection, how did it go? What did you learn? What did you discover that you didn't know before? Type of thing. They're all just wowed at how much <laughs> effort goes into planning a single lesson. So, uh, which is kind of cool because now they have an appreciation to their current teachers. Uh, so besides the observation, they can continue to move through that spectrum of where they actually learn to plan a lesson, they'll plan a lesson with a, a host teacher, and then finally deliver that lesson to sixth or seventh grade class to sort of get what it feels like to be a teacher, um, So, which is, is kind of cool. So uh, and then they're going to meet with administration and, or supervisors to sort of talk about what do you look for in a teacher, what qualities, what characteristics would you hire for a teacher? So that's like the final final hour there. So uh, this is an exciting one for us. Uh, we added it very late in the program, and uh, literally I think it was October, and by November we had probably our largest contingency of students involved <clears throat> in the program. So the reason also is um, Mrs. Service at the high school and Mr. Cusos at the high school run our future teacher club which is a sizable club, it's probably got 20 students enrolled. So I did a couple presentations for those students and 
sparked our interest and it's been so long since. So this is an exciting success for us. Here's just some student experiences that we've heard. These are some of the students that have been enrolled in the process where they're, you know, some, two of them I think were at the teacher pathway and the one did a Penn Community Bank um, job shadow. So they, in that particular one, Penn Community Bank allows them to do a little bit of time in the marketing department, in the IT department, uh, the securities department, and so forth. So they really have exposure to, exposure to a lot of different options. So that's been huge. We have an exciting event coming up on January 20th, which is a couple days away. It is a coffee house for a cause. So in conjunction with our performing arts department, uh, we're hosting uh, some musical performances uh, for from our students um, <clears throat> and the purpose of this was sort of to give kids a chance of what goes behind setting up a gig a musician concert uh, <clears throat> on a small scale so that way we're able to manage it effectively so students have been learning how to set up uh, sound boards run microphones feedback de-amplifiers and stuff that I don't know anything about um, and so the music department students have been learning that process um, and we had our <clears throat> business education our marketing students create flyers that you might see in the hallways they uh, created Instagram posts they forwarded to Mr. Thomas uh, so they're creating some publicity advertising campaign for it uh, and then we'll have our own organization our own student groups performing uh, primarily our rock band students who um, don't currently have a concert in the spring or in the uh, winter uh, they get a chance to perform for the public <clears throat> also our orchestra will have a small ensemble here as well performing they have some, some really good talented kids so if you're available and want to check out a good night come this Friday night to the cafeteria so uh, we have a lot of donations from our local communities, Giants donating snacks and cookies, I think Wawa's donating coffee, etc. So um, a lot of that's been behind the scenes work for the kids. Who, the, the kids are going to really develop in the program for us. Uh, there is a benefit, Hungry for Music is our uh, organization that they're donating. They primarily provide musical instruments to uh, programs that are in need. So we'll be collecting instruments uh, or collecting donations for that program on Friday. <clears throat> Another exciting piece is our Career Expo uh, coming up. So uh, basically it's an opportunity for our local and regional employers to come in and sort of offer summer work or long-term employment uh, opportunities to our students. So the goal was to have 50 plus organizations here uh, local businesses, etc., uh, to have sort of like a career fair in the, the gymnasium. Um, but we're already up to 31 after only two weeks of going public. <clears throat> so I might have to use both gyms. Sorry, Mrs. Wagner. <laughs> but uh, so the, the, the program is, ex there. every employer is excited. We've reached out to uh, several Chamber of Commerces to encourage their members to come. And basically, it's just an opportunity for kids to sort of meet and greet employers, uh, talk about potential uh, employment options uh, for the summer and also, you know, further down the road. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the Mark group is going to have several booths available because there's going to be a lot of interest in that area. So uh, we're excited to offer this to our students once again. It's been, I think I was talking to Mrs. Lewis in the college, and it's probably been seven or eight years since we had a actual career fair here which you know things happen but you know hopefully we can bring this back on an annual basis for our students mm -hmm. any questions about what's going on in the career pathways <coughs> world i had a question um yeah. for the career expo <coughs> yeah um it, it could offer to 14 year olds correct yes ma'am okay and then my next question more of a personal thing because I was like, we're going to go to a local farmer and see if they need help. Do you know off the top of your head, uh, uh, out of the 31, if you have any um, local farmers coming in? I have they... zero. Okay. So it that is... would be a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Bring it yeah, so Thank you for that tip. I'll find a way to get them in here. <laughs> any other questions? Just, just a quick question on, yeah. on the standpoint of 
the 50 local <laughs> regional employers. Yeah. Is there a possibility in, in your lovely marketing um, to find an, um, the employer would have a Penridge grad that they could come to this meeting? In other words, let's let's look at Merck. Okay. I mean, I know one of the individuals at Merck very well. Yeah. His sons went through school here. Okay. He's in a, a management area. I mean, he would be perfect. Sure. To come yeah, to a I, meeting like this is that a not a requirement, but is it a suggestion to it different employees? Is not, but it's uh, one that we can certainly encourage employers to send representatives. Um, like we're, when we're dealing with larger corporations like Merck or SEPTA or something, they're sending their HR personnel for reasons that they feel they no, no, I see. Yeah, But for, yeah, local organizations and the, the guest speakers, I, sh I should grab some information on the 41 speakers that we had. I would say at least half of them have been Penridge grads. That's they're great. All, every email I get back is, I wish they had this when I was in school. So um, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, I see kids coming to do presentations for these guest speaker series, and I had them in class. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm old. You know, they're, they've started their own businesses, and they're very successful, but they're the kind of students I want to, or professionals now I want to bring in because that can speak to our students very easily. Say, so, hey, you went through these same halls in 2014, they can do what you're doing. So, yeah, I, I think the, the Penridge connection is a key one, and the one that I continue uh, to easily ad advocate for has simply been my communication with these organizations. Hey, if you happen to have Penridge grad that'd be willing to come out, we would certainly welcome. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dyer and Dr. Shad, I just want to uh, thank you. I don't have a question. Okay. It's been it's been wonderful to watch what was a, a, a really neat kernel of an idea four years ago that, that the two of you just started bantering about and to watch what has happened in four years and the impact that it's had on so many kids. Yeah. It's just going to be neat to watch the next four years in terms of what that group will be and how it could yeah. impact you know, <clears throat> kids as they move forward. So thank you for your work. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Chester. Okay. Thank you. Then we'll move on to um, the newly adopted science standards with Dr. Shide and Mr. Danny. I think, I think that we have the. We have one. Uh, three, the um, oh, yeah, the half credit. Yeah. Yeah. The program improvement proposal that is attached to this uh, college and career pathways. Do we have that up? On there. Yeah, the, it's in the agenda and in the title, the proposal for 25 credit, but the proposal itself is not it's there. Not the, only, there. the only attachment is the presentation, presentation. that Mr. Dyer just did. Okay. We're still in letter A. Oh, it was an update as well as a program improvement Let proposal for a half credit course. Okay. I just want to see if we can pull that up. But in the meantime, Mrs. Blomberg, if you want to move to the science, that's fine. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, as I brought to you earlier in the year, um, the state of Pennsylvania has uh, released new science standards. Um, as the year has progressed, we've gotten some new updates, so I just want to share some of those pieces with you um, as we roll forward and then um, actually take you right into um, letter C on the agenda, which is our uh, presentation of our Academic, or I should say our general physics and our honors physics courses for approval. So they're going to kind of run pretty seamlessly here. So if you think back to earlier in the year, um, we introduced you to the Pennsylvania Integrated Standards for Science and Environment, Ecology, Technology, and Engineering. Well, as the state has continued along, that was too much. So they've given us the acronym of STEELS. So that is when you hear uh, myself or our teachers referencing STEELS standards, that is what they are referencing. Again, the same standards, they've just given us an acronym for them. 
uh, so that we can continue to uh, move it forward without having to stumble through our words um, each time we do that. <coughs> in addition, in uh, October, they rolled out the Steels Hub, um, which is part of the Standard Alliance system, which is all online uh, that PDE has. Uh, what it includes for us, as far as these new Stein standards are concerned, are those three components that we spoke about earlier in the year when it comes to the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts. Um, what you will find if you kind of work your way from top to bottom is the first thing is your grade levels, and you'll talk about just kind of the big buckets, your physical sciences. This is this one, uh, which is one that I'll reference again in our physics course in just a couple moments here, is all around forces and interactions. You'll see the standard there is kind of that second line where it says a student will demonstrate understanding um, and they can do this thing. This is really a performance expectation that we'll ask of our students to be able to do to demonstrate that they are able to, you know, they have mastered this content and these skills. The next two pieces there, the clarifying statement and the assessment boundary, are kind of like guardrails, all right, for the minimum attainment of this standard. So it shows you what we're emphasizing here. It gives you the, hey, we're talking about, when it comes to the assessment boundary, we're talking about where this should be, two macroscopic things, two things we can see moving in one plane, not two things that you can't see moving in three dimensions. So it's limiting, you know, what we're expecting when it comes to these initial standards and what you know how students can meet them. What you'll see in those three colored boxes then are our science and engineering practices. That's how we're going to think about and what we're going to use when it comes to addressing the what of the science, which is that disciplinary core idea, the forces in motion. This one specifically references momentum. And then again, the cross-cutting concept there in the pink box references to all of the other things. These are the topics that cr cross all science areas. And again, it's just a, a way that we think about the thing that we are doing. All right, when we look at any student who can demonstrate this understanding, they need to be able to bring all three of those components together to show that they've truly mastered that. What happens when you get down to the bottom below those three colored boxes is it begins to make deliberate links to other sets of standards. All right, so you'll see that we have you know, agriculture standards in there. The environmental literacy and sustainability standards are in there. Um, PA core standards for ELA are not apparent in this standard. But then it continues again down into core standards for math. So again, it's making these connections very deliberate for us so we know where we can overlap and we can support maybe a math class, where we can support an ELA class in what we are doing. This isn't quite as impactful at the high school where courses kind of live in their own separate buckets, where I might be teaching a physics course and I might not see all the same kids in an algebra one course or in a 10th grade English course. Um, but in, when we really dig into our elementary program, this is going to be really, really important information for us to have as we have teachers who have the same students all day. So we can begin to make those connections deliberate so that we're, you know, working with students so that they can learn their ELA skills and apply them in an authentic manner. They can learn their math skills and apply it to data that we're actually collecting as part of what we are doing in our science classes. So that's again, just a quick update of what the state has handed us thus far. Um, so then moving in, um, this is Blanc, are you good if I just roll right into yep. letter C there? So moving into uh, letter C, um, this is just um, our request as a science department for the approval of uh, our two physics courses, our general physics and our honors physics uh, courses. Really the difference when it comes to these two courses comes down to pacing, level of complexity. Um, that's where you're going to see the difference. The bones and the skills that come out in a physics class, just as in most science classes, it's the same foundation. We're asking, we're providing our students in our honors classes additional opportunities to go a little bit further, to take on some more complex topics and things like that. I know that one of the things that the board loves to hear about are the opportunities that we have for our students to really dig into getting their hands onto this 
content and doing those hands-on opportunities. In each one of these units as they roll through, there are multiple two, three, four <laughs> opportunities for students to get their hands you know, into the lab area, whether that is using their carts, using the pulleys, all kinds of things. That I drive in every morning and I see our students working through the windows that are right there along the bus line. So it's happening on a daily basis. Um, the one thing that I was intending to call out is just kind of how these kind of fall in, but it looks like it's not going to necessarily link right off of here. This will call a little link off there if I pull up one of these units. Um, for me. Make sure I got it. So this is just jumping into the public facing site of what we have for our physics class. And again, what you'll see there is when we look at the standards, this is where we begin to pull in those three colored boxes of what we have. All right, so it's laying out that we're going to use mathematical and computational thinking. We're going to make sure that we're constructing explanations and designing solutions for engineering. Right? This unit right here is one where we're really looking at, if we want to put it into authentic context, collisions. Like that's what we're exploring here. And one of the easiest and most vetted projects that you can do in a physics class when we talk about collisions is an egg drop. Right? It goes everywhere from how are we engineering things, but it steps all its way, its way all the way out to how are we dealing with concussions on football fields? How are we dealing with batting helmets? Right? Just to take us back to our, you know, our baseball conversation. That design, that piece of thinking, that's what we're asking our kids to do, to demonstrate that they have mastered this. But in addition, because of some of the equipment that we have in our labs, you know, that we've accumulated over years, is we can also measure that. It's not just an experiential piece, but we can begin to measure the actual true impact of what our students have designed and what they've constructed, you know, as they're working there through this. And that becomes the assessment. Instead of sitting down, they will still be solving physics problems in a traditional sense, absolutely. But they'll also be taking that knowledge and putting it to use, um, you know, in some authentic contexts. So that's really, again, just wanted to highlight for you, um, you know, those two courses. Um, and you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, you know, that the board may have regarding our physics class, honors, or general. No? Well, I just had one question on sure. the, the first slide where you showed that thing. Was that from the state? Or Which was the, uh, the one with steals. all the, the no, before the, after the steals, the, uh, oh, all the, the colors? Blue. Yeah, the pink. Yes. That's provided by the state? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just basically took a screenshot of what exists on their website, um, you know, and it's there, and I just dropped it into a presentation to make That's sure. That's just one topic. Though. Yep, There's that is one topic. Oh. They, uh, there are a hundred of those documents that we're going to end up working our way through over the next couple of years okay. um, between now and the summer of 2025. Okay. So you'll see plenty of me. Mr. Daney, yes, sir. is the expectation that the current physics resources will be appropriate for the updated curriculum, or might there be resources involved in this? As of right now, things look as if um, they'll be able to continue with what we have. Um, our physics team has done a really good job of moving a lot of their resources to, yes, their subscription-based online platforms, but they are able to really target what they're picking from those resources um, instead of it just being a specific textbook. So they're able to really pick out the best problem or the best video or the best topic to bring those pieces together, especially, and again, simulations are huge when it comes to our science classes as well. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Then we're on uh, to geometry with Dr. Scheid and Mr. Vogel. Mrs. Vaughn, can you Oh, I'm sorry. If it would be amenable to have Mr. Dyer come up, we can have his presentation, at least to go over the program improvement proposal that is attached to the Pathways program. 
even if we have to bring it back again for February, at least while he's here, so that you can have a first run listen. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dyer. All right, so um, what he's going to be pulling up and we'll make available to you, um, I apologize for that misstep. We will, um, the program improvement it was, the idea was if we have students enrolled in the Career Pathways program, what kind of benefit or perceived benefit could these students have? Thank you, sir. Um, for their participation, what kind of tangible asset can we provide to them as a student who's gone through our program uh, for career pathways. So the course is structured a little different, differently than your typical high school course. It would be a 0.5 credit available uh, for our students 9 through 12. And sort of picture the idea that it's not in a classroom with a teacher in front of the class. It's sort of a series of checkpoints that the student has accomplished during their high school career. Uh, that they're going to meet certain standards or uh, certain uh, criteria to accomplish that 0.5 credit awarding to their um, total. So I'll go through some of the program highlights here real quickly. Um, so the student purpose and the reason we have this is one, that they have the opportunity to explore and discover various careers. Uh, sort of guide them through that, their high school career all through uh, four years, and give them those career experiences that sort of mimic or coincide with their coursework of interest. Uh, so we want the students to have that hands-on experience prior to leaving us um, and moving on to their next endeavor. So the meat and potatoes of the course would be and when I say course, again, we're, we're looking at the, the comprehension of the whole high school career. Uh, students would obviously start out in the fifth grade and eighth grade levels exploring uh, those different types of careers and what careers really are. And when they get to the high school, we're going to really start to refine and focus in on certain types of career opportunities. And we'll use tools through Naviance. Uh, one career one step or one stop is an option that we use as well. Uh, as they do that in the early year of high school, we're going to have them start to create a um, career research project. So they're going to take some independent time, research various careers, you know, what goes into the daily activities, what kind of education do they need, what kind of skills or soft skills should they have developed. Um, so they'll have some time developing those uh, projects as well. Uh, we would also hope and include that they would attend a certain number of guest speaker series. And the reason that's in there is students often will come to me with, well, I want to be an engineer. Fantastic. Well, what kind of engineer would you like to be? Civil, biomedical, whatever engineering type out there. And they have no idea. So we sort of want to say, well, why don't you go listen to a couple engineers, go listen to a couple marketing teams, or a couple of construction employers, really get an idea of what you really want. And sort of the goal of that process with the career uh, guest speaker series is sort of maybe kids find out what they don't want before they go and spend thousands of dollars in college. Do, do we have any classes right now where it's not just for that <coughs> semester or that like it carries throughout the course of your entire high school career? Is this we, something entirely new? This would be entirely new to the best of my knowledge. Is, is there any any uh, restrictions against doing that? Because you think you're enrolled. Like it seems like there's typically a beginning and an end period, but this is a four-year where you could get, right. do you have to complete all four years in order for you to get that half credit? That's a great question. The answer would be no. Uh, students who are able to interact with the program as much as they would like to. Uh, some students will interact with the program, find what they want, get what they need, and move on. And some students may be in the program all four years and, you know, might take a long time for them to discover that. So, so right now, the, the RAMS period is like a, a, a free period, right? So it's not, you're not... Well, at the high school, the RAMS period is around three different options. So two of those options are academically based. So teachers reach out for remediation 
and reinforcement. But they're not getting any credit for that, right? No, correct. Okay, so right now, the RAMS period, there's no credit being offered for that period. So this would be a credit being offered during that RAMS period. Not necessarily okay. only the RAMS period, no. So the guest speaker series, yes, typically happens during RAMS period, so I'm not pulling from educational time or instruction time. Um, but the other, like the workplace visits, uh, the job shadowing, uh, the mentorship program, the next step steps there in that process, uh, all can occur various times of the day, depending on the student schedule as well as the um, business partner schedule when they can allow students to come to their facilities, etc. So uh, it is going to be outside of the realm of a typical 50 minute, uh, hopefully a block period eventually. Uh, and that's a lot of the, the student has to drive that force. And that's why we have the requirement of the hours of participation there to receive that credit. So a student who just does the interest surveys doesn't get the 0.5 credit. They have to meet the criteria throughout. And they can do it in a compressed period of time if they're willing to put the work into and attending these guest speaker services or series, uh, going out and visiting workplaces and items like that. So absolutely, they can do it in four years. They can do it in two years. Mm -hmm. With other districts that have in place, usually your one-year students can't meet all the criteria. So that's kind of a challenge. And hopefully by that time, I would have ample time in front of them to sort of, hey, this is going to take time for your freshman year. Let's, let's knock some of this down already. So if they start as a freshman and hit all those points in a year, yeah. they get their half credit. What if they don't hear about the program or have an interest until they're a junior, could they still get the credit if they are able to hit all those points? Absolutely. In discussions with Dr. Shai, the students come into the district who are new to the district, uh, or you get uh, those students who may not be so focused early in their high school career, I um, <laughs> can imagine. Uh, those students would still be able to accomplish the, the requirements as needed if they're willing to, to put forth the work. Um, the chances of them completing in their freshman year are going to be very limited simply because you know items d e and f they're going to need some transportation to get to the mentor we don't provide transportation uh, so if they're going to do a 20-hour mentorship at mark they're going to have to find transportation to and from so that's our juniors and seniors typically who can drive uh, so freshmen would be very hard for them to accomplish but not impossible and how how do the kids i think it's awesome i think it's great mm -hmm. Totally awesome. But how are the kids, how are they going to find out about it? Uh, like their freshman year? I know this is something we want to talk about. Yeah. Like down the road, but do they meet with a guidance counselor their freshman year? How does every kid know this is available? So um, outside of currently we're doing is we're, I'm meeting with, like doing assemblies at middle school in the eighth grade. So I'll go down there twice a year, present career pathways, uh, just plant that seed. Their first day of high school, they're going to hear from me, their guidance counselor, their grade level principal, the couple of them are here. Uh, so that first day, they're going to hear it again. And with all the events we run school-wide, the guest speaker service uh, series, uh, we have job shadowing that we just you know, publish out to everybody. If you're interested, come attend. Uh, we have a field trip going up to Demco, uh, automation that any student can attend. So we publicize this as much as we can um, so hopefully you know by the end of their freshman year they've seen and talked to me I'm part of the guidance counselor team going down to the middle schools during course selection so I'll be with each one of the middle schools talking about what courses they can take as a freshman uh, as an incoming freshman but also why they should think about selecting a career pathway and what the benefit of that is so uh, the possibility of them getting through four years of high school and not hearing from me is going to be hopefully pretty slim. And how about um, parents? Like, let's just say you had a kid who didn't pay any attention for like 13 to 16. Are their parents now it's available? Yeah, as, as a father of a 17 year old, I know what you're speaking to. Um, absolutely. The, the parents also uh, have opportunities to either meet with me. Uh, I will continue to do a parent night throughout each year, so to invite parents in the district to come and uh, answer questions or get answers to questions. Um, they're going to hear it through the, the high school s'more and uh, middle school parent level letters. I have a piece out there every other week for them. Uh, there will also be opportunities uh, to meet with parents uh, through Dr. Bolton's office and his uh, advisory committees as well that I'll make myself available to 
anybody at any time. So, yes. I think it's awesome. I would have made everyone of my kids take that for the film. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you uh, do you also connect with the tech school for programs that line up to some of those pathways, like you mentioned engineering? Yes. Um, do you connect with them for machining, welding, and mechatronics? And yeah, Dr. Herr and I have been working very closely. He was at my parent night that we hosted here. Uh, he had a whole piece uh, promoting the Upper Bucks Technical School. So, uh, yes, we were working very closely. Uh, I have the benefit of he has a program for career pathways that's been in place for decades. It's fantastic. And I just get to ride his coattails with that. So that, that makes my job a little easier on his end. Uh, so he's able to provide me already established, approved corporate partners or business partners that we can use for students who may not mm -hmm. want to go into the tech school but still may want to go into the construction field or maybe they want to go to culinary arts or something. They're just not going mm -hmm. through the tech school. So absolutely, we're paired with them very closely. Absolutely. Um, so just continuing through like the workplace visits, there are going to be like slight tours of different facilities, uh, manufacturing facilities that we, we would visit. Um, various corporate centers that we're able to visit. Uh, one of the car dealerships, I believe it's Thompson, down in Doylestown, uh, has uh, said that they'll welcome our students to come toward the showroom, behind the scenes, etc. cetera, uh, give the kids opportunity for that. The job shadowing piece, this is where they're really gonna be involved. They're like, all right, so I've done the guest speaking series, I've done the career research, I've done the ex exploration, I wanna find out what it's like to be a nurse. All right, we have several uh, business partners with uh, in the medical field, happy to announce that we just landed St. Luke's. So that's a, a big a big win for us. They have a fantastic high school job shadowing program already established, and all we have to do is just provide the students. So that's that was a big win for us last week. Uh, so that job shadowing piece is really gives a kid hands on three six hours at a shot of what goes on to be a nurse. All right, so. If, you think you want to be a nurse, you go to Grandview, go to St. Luke's, Doylestown, hopefully it's coming on board soon, and they figure out, like, you know what, I can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm glad you figured out your junior year, right? So those are going to be um, very valuable experiences. And then the culminating activity is the mentorship. That is an intense 20-hour program with a business partner uh, where they will have a sort of like a cooperating uh liaison at that particular industry where they're going to be working with that person, uh, participating in staff meetings, uh, participating in uh, various customer interaction, whether it's through a call center or face-to-face -face customer interaction. So they're really going to get a sense of what that job's going to entail. Um, so obviously there's going to be various safety measures in place. We can't ha have them handling um, you know, one, sensitive information, two, dangerous materials, etc. Uh, but most of our business partners have come on board and says, oh, I did this with Soderton already, or I do this with Palisades already. So it's nothing new to them. So, uh, but the mentorship program really gives them, like, they've done everything. This is what I want. And this gives them a real good experience with that. So those are the five keys of the program itself. The evaluation process is sort of at the end of each one of those I didn't touch on. So for after every guest speaker they attend, for every research project they complete, job shadow, et cetera, they have to perform a reflection piece, uh, which is going to touch on what they learned, what they discovered, uh, what they sort of thought about going into it, and what's changed. Uh, so that sort of gives us that feedback. Uh, and also the nice thing about that provides a lot of our uh, documentation for 339 career readiness. So that becomes an article or an artifact for us to say, put it into our uh, audit book so that way we have proof that kids are career ready. So that's a big piece of it for us as well. So the highlighted point up there is once they complete the required credit hours, I think it works out to be about 45 to 50 total hours throughout their high school career. Um, they would be awarded um, some type of accommodation, whether it's a cord, uh, an embossment on their diploma saying they completed the Career Pathways program, and obviously the awarding of the .5 credit towards their graduation total. Uh, 
So once they have met that minimum criteria, then they could be striving towards that to sort of make that as a uh, employable asset so they can say, hey, I did a career pathway in nursing or I did a career pathway in engineering. Sort of gives them the soft skills, those intangible skills that, you know, not walking cold into a potential interview or potential career fields. Um, letter D, if a student doesn't meet those criteria, maybe they transfer in late or maybe they're late starters uh, or whatever the reason is they don't get that uh, information completed. Uh, or they decide early, this is what I want to do, I'm going to school here for it, and this is my major, I'm done, and there's no negative impact. So they're not going to have a, you know, an F on their report card. It's either they meet the criteria or they don't. Um, and if they don't meet it, it doesn't negatively impact them. They just don't get the report or the embossment or whatever is decided, signifying that they've completed the process. So that's, I don't want anybody to think that we're going to be negatively impacted for not completing a 20-hour mentorship. Real quick, the cost, there will be a huge amount of cost because a lot of it's going to be driven by students during school day uh, through the speaker series, the research project, the exploration, etc. Uh, so there's not a huge amount of cost. There's going to be obviously a little curriculum already maybe uh, thrown in there, but nothing their textbooks or anything's going to be required for purchase. Staffing wise, yeah. me, <laughs> that's it <laughs> for right now. That's a lot of information. I definitely will have to share it to you sooner than later, so I apologize for that. Any questions of you? Mr. Dyer, I, it didn't occur to me until you're in front of us tonight, yeah. but. Um, I was looking around. I found some internships, but they're in the summertime. Yes. So could kids, a student, do, and they're paid. Yes. With the military. Um, yep. I sent it to a few people. It didn't occur to me to send it to you, but a student right. could do like eight weeks or ten weeks. Yeah, we are currently, currently developing a summer series. Um, Pretty much every college in our area has some type of like engineering summer camp or uh, some type of internship in their business department. So we're creating that list of opportunities for students in the summer who want to further their involvement in that particular field and that would be absolutely fantastic to include uh, that we will publish here probably by the end of January, early February. Yeah, so, that's good. Um, Applications do open. That's one thing about them. They okay. open like in August first, I think, is the one for the Air Force, and that. Yeah. Gotcha. So they'll need to be. But you could be a, a ninth grader. Sure. And these internships pay yeah. four thousand dollars a summer. Yeah, so. our partnership with various corporations have paid internships. Penn Community Bank has one. Univest has one. There's a lot of them in the area that have these internship opportunities for students that are paid, and they're like fifteen dollars an hour. It's a foreign concept for me, in, you know, in my day, but all right. <laughs> Minimum wage was 375 back then. I was 325. Oh. Yeah. Well, no, it was a big day when we got to 325. I think I started at 3. Nice. So, yes, that, those internships and some programs will be coming out soon. Um, a lot of the organizations and colleges are just putting them together now, so we can certainly include any that you hear of. I'll forward it to you. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Those hours... If um, students would do the internship, could that also go toward their mentorship or something like Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yeah. So, so they could go with that's it. a great question. So the hours they would do at an internship would certainly count towards that mentorship piece. Yeah. So um, we, we don't like to say internship simply because the the requirement that comes usually that's a multi week, mm -hmm. like six eight weeks program. We don't want the students to have to complete that. Um, as far as you know, that burdensome time, transportation, etc. So the mentorship is sort of a reduction on that internship idea. So it's down from your, your typical 80 to 120 hour internship to down to just 20 hours for us, just so the kids have exposure to it. Um, so, but again, if they get that internship and they they win that position, then absolutely that's a count for that. Yeah. I just have more of a philosophical question that maybe Dr. Scheid or Dr. Bolton can answer. Because I know that we talked before that you couldn't give credit for, say, playing a sport. You know, that was not, but this almost, it's not equivalent to that, but it feels a little bit 
like an extracurricular sort of thing that we're giving credit for. We do give credit for if you're in the band or in the chorus, mm -hmm. even though that you have commitments outside, like marching band and things like that, that encompass it. So where does it determine what you're able to give credit for mm -hmm. and, and in something more creative than a classroom environment where it's a set period of time versus something that becomes an extracurricular endeavor? Oh, sure. <laughs> I need to publicly thank you again. Mr. Dyer has done so much work on this, and I can't thank him enough. We can't thank him enough. Um, the state doesn't allow us to um, give credit for health and PE for a sport. There, is, there are no regulations as far as we know. There are a lot of schools who have college and career pathways and provide credit for student. But if, if it didn't count for health and PE, could it count for some credit? So the, the sport activity, you know, does that count for a half a credit, even though it can't count for health and PE or it can't count for credit at all? As far as my understanding, I don't know if Dr. Bolton, you want to clarify, it can't. The, what can occur and what does occur is a student who's in the cyber PE class, for example, and they have to track um, heart rate and hours of exercise and whatnot. That would be contributing to it, but it wouldn't be that's the sole um, health and PE credit that you're getting. So it it is a contributing factor, but it is not the uh, course curriculum. Does that make sense? I'm not mm. sure, but it's, mm. it seems a little murky. Well, it can't be the course curriculum in health and PE because it. It's not the health yeah, of PE so, course. So it can't, right. I get that it can't be one of the required courses, but I'm just thinking if, if we're making, if we have the authority to make anything credit worthy, you know, we just design the curriculum, we, there's, is there any barrier to saying, all right, you can't count this for your health and PE credit, mm -hmm. but we're going to give you a half a credit, just like we give half a credit over here for the Pathways course. So you get half, you, maybe you get a quarter of a credit or something. I'm just, I'm just wondering what the criteria is that determines what we can give credit for and what we can't, regardless of whether it counts toward a specific requirement that's mandated by the state. Yeah, now I see what you're saying, just especially in terms of, of elective courses. Right. Yes. And okay. one of the other determining factors that the state monitors, and one of the biggest hang-ups in terms of health and PEPs, is the certification of the teacher who supervises it. And so the grading agency that's giving credit, what we're doing is we're certifying that this learning is within the the curriculum area and the standards area of the teacher who is supervising it. So obviously college and career can go across lots of different areas and so it's a little less, you know, binding for it. But to be able to give credit for something, there has to be that learning supervised by a supervised teacher. I mean a certified teacher that's there. But the men mentorship wouldn't necessarily have that but ultimately that supervision is provided through the teacher. And so you're right that there are other individuals involved. That, that would be, it's not identical, but it's similar to a teaching assistant per, helping a student and helping them through some concept. It's the teacher who ultimately is the supervising the learning, even though there might be other pieces involved. And the mentorship program, so I'd be obviously connecting with the cooperating mentor, they're going to fill out information, how did the process go, how was your uh, your host, your, your, your student attending, um, you know, so they're going to give me feedback as far as, you know, what went on, were they satisfied, were they punctual, like, did they say that they show up when they say they were, did they perform activities like they should have been, and that feedback will sort of give me some insight to what that student accomplished at the particular mentorship, so. I, yeah, please. I was just thinking about it because it's standards based. It's the college, and it's that we have standards for it. It's a CEW standards, and if you can create a course within those standards, so as this course, think of a nebulous type of course, will be um, really um, founded and the foundation of it will be through the standards. So you can do that by the state. I don't know if that helps you either, but uh, when you design courses, they are designed by the standards that the state provides, and we do have standards in college. This, this seems like this seems is definitely outside the box. It's very it interesting, yep. but I just it doesn't seem to fit in any particular mm -hmm. standard that we've utilized before. So I'm just wondering, what can you take this template and utilize it in other areas um, it, it, to be creative as well? You know, just as creative in 
than some other categories that you are being here. Well, it is definitely an interesting question, so yeah. I'm glad you brought it to the forefront, and we'll investigate. So I, I don't know if this would fit into this particular class or um, if you'd have to do something separate, but I have had a number of questions from community members about whether or not we could design a course around them getting fire firefighter training and getting high school credit for it. So that, I mean, a lot of our local fire departments really need more volunteers. And I know, obviously, that's not a career pathway you're not going to be getting paid for it. But, um, you know, it is something that they are looking for different avenues. And if a kid could go through all of that training and get high school credit for it, it might incentivize some kids to be able to take advantage of that opportunity and then be able to volunteer for our local departments. So I don't know if that's something that we could try to apply into a course or. I'm thinking right up. There's all the standards that fall under. I'm not sure about the standards that would fall under. I'm thinking automatically credentialing because we are looking more to provide credentials for students. I'm thinking more in that regard than the actual credit um, so we'll look into that. That's not the first time I've heard that. That has been brought to our attention. It may be at the IU when we've had our meetings yep. that people have brought that up. Mm -hmm. So we'll investigate that to what degree we would be able to do that, and would that be more credentialing than, uh, than credit? Yeah, and I wasn't sure if you could tie it into like a career pathway because you know you could sure. later make a career out of it in a different area that yeah. actually pays you to do it. But it yeah. certainly can. I and mean, this is the advantage of this program; it can tie into pretty much any yeah. curriculum yeah. map that is had. Yeah. Um, yeah, so absolutely to your question, you could tie in the career pathways. That we could be the the experience side of it. You know, obviously there's going to be some classroom learning that has to occur by I'm sure the fire department or certified instructors um, that would occur probably outside of the school day. Right, yeah. um, but we certainly can handle the experience side of it, absolutely. Mr. Dyer, thank you again. Uh, so if you would make sure that the, the board gets this documentation, yes. we'll, we'll obviously post it on board docs as well for the community. Um, and then we'll see if the board has any questions about moving it forward for next week. Thank you so much for your time. So we don't, is, is that something that we do want to discuss if we want to put, push it to the board meeting? Right, I'm fine with that. That's a first. The PIP. Move it to, I'm sorry. It's a first. Are we moving it to motion? Well, it's not the program it's improvement proposal. The other one was just an informational PowerPoint. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Thank you. Okay. Then moving on to uh, geometry with Dr. Scheid and Mr. Rubel. geometry courses, and I'm going to be succinct, okay? So with the geometry courses, a couple years ago we started the whole revision process and we looked at vertical articulation, we looked at how to kind of put these courses together. For geometry, it's going to be a slightly different than pre-calculus, as I'll explain in a second. We did a middle school, I've already been up here for middle school geometry. One of the things that's going to differ from what we're doing with high school geometry and high school uh, geometry honors is in the middle school we had to keep our eye on the state testing. Um, we had to put in, as I alluded to earlier, subunits. We also put in measurement and probability. At the high school the lens is a little different because we don't have to have that in mind. So when we're putting together the high school geometry and high school honors, we kind of parallel them. So the units are largely similar. As Mr. Danny mentioned earlier for his science courses, some of the difference comes in pacing, some of it comes in depth and geometry. Um, some of it, like depth would be like reasoning and proofs, everybody's favorite in geometry. That was, uh, it's deeper in the honors level. Um, our look into triangles, well, tri triangles. <laughs> we look at it a little deeper also in the honors geometry. So it's largely the same course. And that way it also makes it easier for mobility. If somebody's trying, uh, uh, if they're trying the honors course and they don't feel quite comfortable and they want to go back, at least it's 
the, the symmetry of the courses is pretty in line. The same thing is if they start early in a in the uh, the basic geometry, the middle, the regular geometry course that you would take, and they say, hey, you know what, I want to take that extra challenge, it'll be easier for them to move up to the high school. So that's why that looks a little different than the middle school, in case you kind of looked at that and thought you might want to ask. Um, let's see here. The only other thing that we really go deeper in with the honors, as opposed to the, is to, uh, the regular geo course, is more of the, we do more um, deductive reasoning than in the other course. We do it in both, but it's a deeper look there. Um, that's all I wanted to say really for the geometry. In both of them we do projects. The depth there might be a little different, again, based on level. As far as pre-calc and honors pre-calc, we're putting it up because that was part of the vertical articulation and um, it's the first one done, in, like we've done algebra one. These are the pre-calcs. Algebra two is gonna come along soon uh, but it's taking a little longer because what we did was we moved some of the topics that we found, the concepts that we found that were in the pre-cal course into Algebra 2. You've used the word rigor before when we talked about this is really what we were looking for. So Algebra 2 is taking a little longer uh, because of the, the amount of things that we moved into it. I know I move my hands a lot when I get excited, so sorry. Um, so that's what we're doing as far as the, uh, you know, Algebra 2 will come along. Pre-calc, pre-calc honors is going to look this way for this year. Um, as I teased a few months ago, we we're really looking forward to developing, we're developing, we're going to look to do AP pre-calc, honors pre-calc, and then for those that would be in the regular pre-calc, they're going to either go to the honors for the challenge or we're going to do it to college algebra. Okay, so that's what we're, we're developing right now. But for this year upcoming, because we're not done everything and it's, you know, we're trying to do this right um, for the kids. So we have on, uh, honors geometry and, I mean, geez, honors pre-calc and regular pre-calc. They're also very much in parallel for the units. The exception is in the honors pre-calc, we've added a couple of units and that's really to uh, get the kids ready for um, AP. Um, so the extra units you'll find in the honors as compared to the the regular pre-calc would be sequence and series, limits, um, and then polar and parametric equations. So um, I won't go into too, depth, uh, too much depth there because everybody will glaze over, but the idea is those particular units get everybody ready for the AP going forward. So I think we've done a, a really nice job in terms of positioning ourselves for this upcoming year, and then we're going to continue to develop, and then I'll be, you know, unfortunately or fortunately back again to talk about these three courses and what we're going to look for for the 24-25 school year. Uh, AP pre-calc is new this 23-24 school year. Um, we were really going to try to do it this year. However, since everything else is coming, we want to do it all, unveil it all at the same time. It also gives people a chance to work out the kinks of the, of the first year AP pre-calc. So we think we can benefit from whatever is fixed for that and then we can get rolling with a, a better uh, better course. Wait, so is there, a, there's now an AP pre-calc, does that give you college credit? I uh, guess it does. Well, so if you would, so would you take honors pre-calc and then AP? Or nope. it, so a, you said the thing you added at the end is pre preparation for what? AP calculus? Yes. Okay, all right, yes. good. But so there's a couple of avenues to get there. It just yeah. depends on how you want to get there, depending yeah. on the readiness of the students. Bless you. Elementary, get that up. correct, Dr. Rabarczyk? Correct. So this is really a six to twelve presentation. All right. So we have been working on the sequence for social studies since the last conversation that we had, and when we were in conversation about changing credits and such. 
and what the impact would be at every level. And once the decision was made to move forward, and we are now looking at three credits, we still looked at all the courses and still looked at what we thought needed to be uh, revised in any way, changed in any way, renew in any way, with the, um, with the information from the board asking for a civics course, civics, economics, government course, which we don't currently have at the ninth grade level. So we took a look at that. This is an iteration, well actually this has gone through many iterations to come to this point. So we've had lots of conversations and um, Mrs. Vitale is here and also I think Mrs. Garish is here. And we had a lot of conversation, right? So if we're looking at the sequence, and we didn't really have to go back to middle school and make any changes, so we said they should stay the way they are. They may change over time, but right now, it, the, the sequence that we currently have in middle school will remain the same, and that's what we're recommending. When we looked at modern U.S. and 10th world staying in 11th, there's electives in 12th. We understand students only have to take three courses, three social studies credits, um, but all those electives are fabulous in 12th grade, and some of them you can take in 11th grade. We didn't want to change any of that either. So how could we best create a course then as an option that would include, <laughs> would have the pillars of early American history, a foundation of that, but with the, the three themes really going through that course of government, economics, and, and citizenship. So with that idea in, in mind, we thought of an American Studies course. And in that course, you could have an academic level course, uh, you know, your standard course, but we did not want to lose the humanities structure. So we would still keep the humanities course, which is an honors level course, Humanities meaning that it's social studies in English, so it's fact-to-fact -back courses, and it's um, thematic and literature-based. We want to keep that. So there would still be that course offering for students, and we are moving in that direction right now with our eighth grades with course selection, so we need to be able to make decisions for them. So we would have those two options. We would have to write these courses because we do not have them, so that, that would take curriculum work to do it. In addition, the more conversation that we had about students and options, because we know the board, all of you wanted more options and how do we provide more flexibility for students and student choices. So in ninth grade, we currently do not offer an AP course. In, in social studies. We thought about, because we have the full year seventh grade geo course, that could be a preparation and possibly we could run the AP human geography course for 24-25. This is, I'm saying this because it gives students on the AP track and students who are um, really dependent on their GPA to get into Ivy League schools and such, they would be able to take AP from ninth grade on. And currently, right now, we do not have that course. So anyway, that was part of the conversation. So we would run these two courses. That was something new. In addition, because we thought about the, uh, the question about flexibility and can we provide more individuality for kids, you know, choices for students. That's why it says no social studies course in ninth grade. Because, theoretically, you only need three credits. If you were a student uh, who was perhaps at the technical school and your four credits in freshman year, you would want to take maybe science, English, math, and the health and PE ninth grade, the wellness course, and not take the social studies course until perhaps 10th grade you still could follow a sequence of 10th, 11th, and then 12th grade, you could take two semester courses. So you would still get three credits that way. Here's kind of a caveat to all of it. If in fact, 
because currently we have a requirement in 12th grade that you take the American government course, it's a semester course, unless you take an AP course. But the AP course is up to you which one to take. So most students were required to take that AP Gov course, but not everybody was. So if the goal is everyone participates in the ninth grade course or a variation on that theme that centers on government economics and civics, you could take it in ninth grade or if you chose not to take it in ninth grade, you would be required to go one track or the other. You could take the AP course, the AP US history course, or you could take the semester course that we currently run, so that wouldn't have to be rewritten, nothing would have to be rewritten in 12th grade. You could take that American government and politics semester course, but you would also have to take another semester course to meet the three credit requirement. All of that said, most students would still most likely take the same track that they currently, that we have now because the course offerings work. If we add the, this course in ninth grade, then guidance counselors, our school counselors and families, we would have to work together with the students to say, if this, then that. If you, are, if you are concerned about your core GPA because you're interested in Ivy League schools and you don't want to pull your GPA down, you need to stay on the AP track, right? So that's really one of the reasons why I'd like to add that ninth grade AP course for those particular students. They just need to understand that if that's the choice I make in ninth grade, then these are the repercussions of that choice. This is what I'm going to have to do in 12th grade if I make the choice in ninth grade. This is so that was our kind of creation on what we thought would work best if we had the requirement of the civics, economics, and government course added. Rather than make that a separate, disparate course, to integrate it with the early U.S. history content to make it not a boring course, but a more interesting course. So this is our response to those requests. Obviously, the other choice is leave everything alone. Right, and just keep on going with what we have, and anyone, if you just don't have to take four credits, and then your choices are your choices anyway. But this is our response to that, and um, yeah, I don't think I missed anything. Did I? So, if you have, so the ninth grade, this AP geography in ninth grade that you're speaking of, mm -hmm. that would be the second. They would take two social studies courses in ninth grade because they would have to take this American studies? No, Mrs. Cullen, if they chose the GEO course, right, they would also, they would have more than, right, the three required courses because they would also be required to take at least, well, if they took that, if they took that ninth grade course, and you assume they would take the 10th grade course and the 11th grade course, they would take the AP US Gov and Politics, or AP US Gov as their AP course. Yes, you're right, they would be required to take that in their senior year in order to meet the requirement. Of what? Of the new course that, we're, that we developed for economics, government, and civics. All right, so there's a couple of, we did communicate to the public, I think whatever date that was, you know, a few weeks ago, an email was sent out saying this change to policy 217 was not going to change anything about AP, wasn't going to impact AP at all. It also said that there was going to be no cost involved. But I just heard you say that you're going to write new curriculum. And whether it's a dime or a thousand dollars, there's a cost involved. So we have some things to clear up there that we told the public one thing and this is vastly different from what was communicated to them a few weeks ago. And this arrangement of, I'm, I'm still not understanding if they have to take, they have to take this American Studies, Government, Econ, and Citizenship at some point, correct? 
they have to take that course or they have to take the AP U.S. government course as a senior or, I know there's a lot of options here, it's about all these options, or they would take the semester courses in, in their senior year, but then they would also have to take another semester course to meet the three credit requirement because they didn't take a ninth grade course. So there's implications if you don't take a ninth grade course, and they would be it. So we had made, um, we had made the change from four to three credits and changed it so that it would be humanities, modern, and world were the three required courses. That change was done. Um, there have been conversations over the last year for preceding credits um, regarding creating a solid civics course. And I know you were saying that if we're creating this civics course, which was a completely separate conversation we've been having for over a year that had nothing to do with credits, if, we're create, if we want to create a civics course, why don't we make that, um, why don't we combine that with humanities and revamp that course, which is a completely separate conversation that had nothing to do with credits. We've been asking about that for a year. So um, that's why when she was looking at creating that course that we've been asking for, um, you know, she came up with the rec recommendation of actually combining that with humanities um, and, and making that, that, that that would be a good fit and that was her recommendation that she thought that that would be a good way to do the, the civics course that we've been talking about. Um, as far as changing the AP track, if you want to take the exact same pathway you're taking now, you can take humanities, you can take AP US history, you can take AP world, you can do the exact same thing you've always done. What this is doing is offering additional opportunities for kids so that they still have that same pathway, but if you want to take a different pathway, you can. As, as uh, Dr. Scheid pointed out, if you are applying to an Ivy League school, taking that Honors Humanities course in ninth grade lowers your core GPA and can make the difference between you getting into Harvard and not getting into Harvard. And so for you, since, um, since we're saying that ninth grade it's not developmentally appropriate to take an AP course, what these students could do instead is take their courses in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and then even double up in 12th grade so they can take all AP courses if they want, and then it doesn't negatively impact their core GPA. Or they can say, you know what, I don't really want to do that. I want to keep on the same track we've always had and do the humanities in ninth grade, the AP US, and the AP world, and nothing changes for those students, but it opens up more opportunities. And then Dr. Shai uh, came up with this great idea of, if we're really focused on core GPA, but we want to also be able to give them an option in ninth grade, geography is a course that, that I hear you saying is a course that would be developmentally appropriate for a ninth grader to take. And so it's an AP option they never had before. And again, this has nothing to do with a credit change. If you want to add a civics course, whether you have four credits or three, cor th whether you have four credits, or three credits required, it costs money to create a course. If you want to create a geography course because you think that it's helpful to have a geography course and you, it develops more pathways, we're talking about creating courses. It has nothing to do with that change. We can leave it the way that it is, but she's proposing adding additional courses that give even more options and more pathways to kids. So Maybe, that's I, a separate okay, issue. Well, but let me, hold on. The communication that was sent out and it's not something that Dr. Scheid is deciding to add. So you have cut back credits while adding in additional content, which yes, everybody wants additional civics. That doesn't erase the fact that you sent out a communication, which we still didn't get clarification on how that was developed. Board members weren't pr privy to it. You sent out a communication that told the public no money would be spent on this change. You also told the public that there was absolutely no change to AP. And I'm all for adding an AP course that's developmentally appropriate. If it's going to be something not like trying to take AP US history in, in ninth grade, which has proven that they have lower scores and the whole thing. Um, but you are changing AP. No, we're not. You are, no, not no AP is not changing. Mm -hmm. it's it's not not changing. changing. We just have one yeah. additional okay. option now. You've changed 
you've made a change, you're adding something different because you are changing what they would have to do in order to have that. Where? They can still you because the class the same you are, class. you would, because we're a student, and it's not just Ivy League, by the way. Um, none of my children have gone to Ivy League schools. There's a lot, there are a lot of schools that are very competitive. Right. Where that extra, let me finish, please. I but, be take, I, but I patiently waited. Specifically, they would have to take that AP in ninth grade in order to have that GPA bump. And being able to take the AP in 12th grade doesn't really help you because the grades that the grade point average that you report to colleges for admission, it's your 11th grade. They couldn't okay, care less about 12th grade. Currently, we can't grade. take a ninth grade AP course. I understand that. The fact remains, you are changing something about the course of AP selection that the student would have. Where? Still have Again, the same in ninth with, grade. With four, with four credits, like let's say the change didn't happen to go to three. Freshman year, there was no AP, AP choice to choose for social studies. All there was was honors humanities mm -hmm. for the academic early American history. So there's no AP there. Then 10th grade, they take AP US history. 11th grade, they would take AP world. 12th grade, they would take AP government and civics. Okay. You're so requiring that is, they, here's where, where is the you're, specific you part are where they're changing them the AP. If they want to be able to be on that path, you're essentially requiring them to have to take the AP in ninth grade, which no, is no, okay. they can still take Wait, hold on. I think I see where the confusion is. It's not um, Kathy shot. Hold on a second. Yeah. Just, I think I might understand where the confusion is. Where she, where Kathy Scheid listed advanced, she gave one example. That's not the AP pathway. She was giving a specific example of here's one version of what you can do. That is not the AP pathway. Students can still take humanities honors in ninth grade, AP U.S. History, and AP World, which are the three required courses, and then take whatever AP course or whatever they want in, four, in, in year four. She was just giving an example. That's not the AP pathway. And what is the ninth grade course? The ninth grade course that they'll now be taking, taking is some kind of combination of government, economics, citizenship, Something that we don't currently have that needs to be written, which is what you told the public you weren't doing. And then they're going to move to AP US history in 10th grade. So, but to be able to take AP US history in 10th grade, I would like to know, I mean, obviously the ninth grade course that we have currently prepares them for the AP US history course that they take in 10th grade, but now you're changing the course that they're going to take in ninth grade. So that could yes. impact the AP US history preparation. I mean, I guess my basic point is that tonight we had a bunch of people come to us and talk to us about adding middle school baseball. And we, we listened to them all and we responded, like Ron said, we responded to the community. For months we had numerous community members teachers, administrators, pleading with us to please take our time and do it right. Mr. Vogel spoke about taking our time, not rushing the development of math courses. And yes, STEM is important. The whole world seems to be focused on STEM right now. But these courses are important too. And it seems like this is a very hastily put together thing. We're trying to do it for September when we just had the math supervisor wisely speak about how you should take your time to develop courses. This is something that isn't urgent. The house isn't on fire. This isn't something that the students need right this minute. We have options available to us. We could still you know, offer students something in the interim. Everybody has acknowledged that block scheduling is something that is going to be happening because there was unanimous support for it. Block scheduling would resolve all of these flexibility and choice issues that you have mentioned, which weren't confirmed by any students um, or parents, but you've mentioned that it's a, something that you want, so fine, give the students choices, but there's things you could do in the interim 
that wouldn't involve all of this but disruption. But there isn't all there of this all disruption. Of it is, it is actually a lot of disruption. It isn't. Well, it is. You're asking. Wait a minute. We, you're asking we are teachers. Moved to you're say asking teachers to write a course. Came up with a okay, very but, efficient and creative way. And we rather than re oh. writing a civics course, you're she writing took a new course. It's a new course. It's writing a new course. Rather than leaving early American and then writing civics, which we've all said for over a year. Let's get civics in, let's get civics in. Mm -hmm. She took our existing course and is going to embed civics and economics into it. She's There's no more cost, but course. well, we were writing a civics course anyway. So we were always writing one course, we're but you told still the writing public, one course. Wait, you told the public this change was costing no money. You are rewriting something. You we were, were already writing a you, civics course. No, so it's we, we, actually, more money. we actually weren't. In the communication, you said well, you we were certainly acting like that's what we're going to do. We're writing a new year. course. You are writing a new course. We have no idea. I mean, we've had, we've heard from teachers about the difficulty of putting something together and implementing it in September. We're taking our time with math. We, you know, we seem to get the idea there that you need to be mindful, you know, thoughtful about how you put mm -hmm. things together. We haven't done any real research into, you know, the cited example of Radner and Yes, they only have three credits, but I don't think that's the end-all be-all for why Radner is ranked highly in the state. There could be other factors to that. And I would like to hear from teachers about how this course, I mean, people that have been teaching a push, they might have something to say about how changing that ninth grade course will affect a student's preparation for the 10th grade course. This is all information that we should take our time and think about carefully. And again, the house isn't on fire. This is being rushed through. It's being uh, rushed through. It, 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 it is. is. I mean, we have other courses that you're taking multiple years to write. And this course. Courses get written and rewritten and improved <laughs> all the time. All the but time. You're, asking you're, like, you're weighing heavy game. in on that. And that happens all the time. But we just teachers, heard examples. Every, every year when they start okay. new curriculum and they look at it again, they readjust, it happens the constantly. So stop selling the narrative I'm not, that something it's, that's it's being not. rushed through Jordan. and that it's being pushed through. When you clearly can see in the sequence that it's still sticking with modern and world is sticking exactly the same. Not even being touched. It's not touched. world history that I'm talking about. No, but, I'm but talking you're saying this is a lot, American. and, and we're, we're pausing, and you're saying these types of things, but when you look at the sequencing, we're embedding civics. We're keeping early American. Yes, the teachers can look into that. Mrs. Vitale looked into some of these things as well, and it's something that we are looking into and having discussions, and that's what will be great. Just like if you go to the second slide, looking at overlaying um, Hillsdale 1776 curriculum over the current. So looking at some of those pieces, which is things that we've discussed in but the why past. why are we looking at something and trying to also implement it when with mathematics you had no objection whatsoever about taking the time to write something? And we have heard from multiple teachers who are responsible for creating these new courses. And again, it is a new course. You can use words like embedding stuff in there, and we're just adding to it. You are writing a new course, and you should be honest about that. Well, because it is. It's it's taking a much faster pace than math. Can I ask you, can I ask a question for you? Uh, would you consider this the normal process of putting together, of changing a course that you would follow in the past? Or is this something where... We're doing it in a short period of time because the board asks you to do it. Well, it's a response to the addition of civics, economics, and but government. Isn't, isn't the timing up to the administration as opposed to the board? We tell you that you need to do this to go to three credits. We didn't tell you to actually rearrange things like this right away. I mean, I agree with Joan that rushing into something like this is a mistake because that's when we overlook things. And we have to consider the standards that are required by the state, right? That we have to, now we're going from four to three. Those standards have to be made sure that we put them into three years, right? And it because will take time to develop will take a course time. like so that. that is a cost, it is right? because we're going to have to. Any curriculum writing is a cost, I think. Yeah. Right. So, so we we're going from four to three. To the 
public. So four to three. So some of those things that were taught in senior year may not have may not be taken by kids now. So no. we have to make sure that it is. Those were choice so that will the, no, no 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 choice there. They have to do it in three years. Maybe the and first year or maybe the third year. I'm not talking to you. Um, I'm talking to her and asking questions for the public to understand. I think it's still any student can take four credits. Right? Well, I understand that's an option, but the state requires that you teach. So now we have to yes. Take three and years. to your point about the creation of the new course, it has to include key concepts. We're going to have to take a look at it because the ninth right. grade and really is preparing kids who were taking eight push in 10th grade too. So you have to take a look at the standards. And not just that, just the concepts and content that will continue to support the same students we were supporting before, but with lenses that may be different. And I'm not saying that you can't do that. I'm saying that that is a redesign of a course. Okay. Which is what we're proposing so to do now. Will that, cost, will that cost money? Any curriculum rating. Okay, so this, to putting the four years into three, we'll do this. So I agree with Ron's point that when we changed it from four to three, we didn't ask you to rewrite curriculum. We had that discussion. What we said was, we'll have humanities modern in U.S. Um, since then, there were also conversations. We've been talking about doing a civics course. So let's add the extra civics. So, so the conversation was, let's add the extra civics course so they have another choice as a completely separate thing. Leave that alone. But if kids want to take a civics course, um, let's add an extra civics course to add more choice. And um, Dr. Scheid was not told to do anything. Dr. Scheid said, you know what? I think it would be a really good idea if instead of adding a civics choice course, we really embed that into humanities because that, you know, that's really what we were looking to do with that course. And so this is her idea to do that. We did not it's tell her, her to do that. Well, and it's not a response to the four credits to three. It's in response to the fact that we asked to write, her to write an additional elective course. Can I ask for her another civics. question? Megan, yes, could I ask a question? Wait a minute. Excuse me. Hold on one second. Mm. Dr. Scheid's words were, this is in response to the requirement to take it from four to no, she three. Did. She I, I believe yeah, she said it multiple you? times. <coughs> and then when we were talking about adding civics, that conversation was always about adding something, enriching, enhancing what we were offering. It was never it was never about don't call me a jerk. It was never about cutting. So to say that we all were in agreement to add Wait, civics is true, it but it wasn't an agreement to cut it. And Dr. Shad, my question would be, if you were tasked with this to add civics content, like, is this, I think what Ron was trying to get at, is this the, is this the process, the path, that you, the timing, I mean, that you would take? I'm not sure about the timing, but the process in terms of if it uh, if the civics course is going to be required, I would rather have it embedded in something that makes sense and is helpful to kids than a standalone course. That is definitely how I feel. I don't think that it makes sense to try to create a, a course, civics, economics, and government, without context. And when we write curriculum, it made most sense to use the current content because it, that's the way the sequence goes now. And it makes sense if you take the ninth grade course and you go to the 10th grade course, they're logical, they're cohesive. I didn't want to lose that, but I'm not opposed to adding the three pillars of civics, economics, and government because if that's going to be required, I'd rather make it a really tough, hefty, important course for students, if that is the requirement. If it is just another elective, we'll write an elective. If it's a course requirement, yes, I think that makes the most sense to do it. I think it'll take time to do it. It's going to take a lot of thinking to do it. And then, um, you know, we've had that conversation too. But I'd rather see it not a standalone course. What's the main difference between the ninth grade, what we're calling civics, versus the 12th grade government class? Well, that's a good question. Because originally what we were thinking was have a level one civics course as an option, because we already have the 12th grade course, and that could be considered a level two. Okay. 
right? So we, there was a lot of thought into that. And because we already have curriculum at 12th grade, and if you want to make it developmentally appropriate for ninth grade, you can, right? Because we could take a look and see what we're already doing. Because really, we, we wanted that course in 12th grade because these students are leaving us and they can vote and they are citizens, right? And that's why it was always there in 12th grade. But we thought we could make it a level one course in ninth grade. And the more conversations we went back and forth and back and forth, what was in the best interest of kids and cohesive education was to create the new course and use the three pillars on the foundation of early American history. And that's how we came up to that recommendation. And can you actually share what you're pulling in for the curriculum? You're actually pulling in stuff that's already written because you're pulling in Hillsdale. Um, can you switch over to slide three and go over what you're doing with the Hillsdale and pulling that in through all of the social studies? Good evening. So I took a look at Hillsdale and um, what I looked at were the terms, topics, essential questions, which they're not called essential questions under Hillsdale's uh, headings. They're called uh, something else about questions. Um, but we that would essentially be what our essential questions are in Atlas. They're uh, akin to that. And the content and keys to the lesson. And when I looked at those lesson plans, um, it's a PDF that you can download for free. Um, it is different from, there's other things on the site. It's different from that. This is strictly their um, lesson plans. The content was exactly what we have already been teaching. And uh, so we took, for example, um, we, we really looked at the Roaring Twenties in Modern America, and our, our, our modern class, and we did a comparison side by side, and then we did an overlay. And so what our um, original Atlas information had was exactly what Hillsdale has, um, with the difference being that Hillsdale's content was explicitly stated. So they had the exact content that would be taught. It wasn't day to day, it wasn't like on day one you'll teach this, on day two you'll teach this. It was more the content that was very explicitly stated. So we thought that that was actually very nicely done. So we were able to compare our essential questions and our big ideas to what they what was equivalent to what Hillsdale has and match them up. And they did match perfectly because Hillsdale is 90%, maybe even 95% primary sources. There, what, there's not much else um, in that content. There's over 3,000 pages of it, and it's mostly primary sources. So I'll just add to it. And thank you for doing all that work. Mm -hmm. So the side-by-side -side comparison really was an addition of explicit content, right? So it is, it's US history. That's what this is. That's what um, Hillsdale is. And when we did the side by side, we did think that it enhanced the content that was being taught. It wasn't different from what we were being taught. And I think when you have curriculum writers who are advanced teachers, a lot of that they already know and they're gonna put that in their lesson plans. It's not explicitly right there in units. That's what the teach, um, supervisors were able to add. And some of the questions were, maybe a little bit more thought-provoking, a couple of them, and they added those as well. So that is what we have um, identified really as the process. Can I add something to that too? Sure. Actually, at, while we were looking at this, and it really was a team effort, it wasn't just me. I, we, All of the supervisors were helping me with this, um, and I thank them for that. But I, because I'm new to this, and everything that was in Atlas was from before I came, so looking at what Hillsdale provided as far as that content, that explicit content, I saw what the potential could be with some of our other units. So that was, um, that, that was a, a good thing, I think, for the social studies department um, as far as Atlas goes. And I do want to add that to the, um, the humanities course, that ninth grade course that we're talking about, adding that civics, government, and economics 
in there. It's like if you were teaching grammar, you wouldn't teach semicolons just separately from everything else. You would teach it within a student's writing, or you would teach it within a novel you're reading, and that's very similar to what was designed for that ninth grade course. So I do feel very confident in the way it was um, that we can work it to um, be very robust and to be a very worthwhile class where the students will learn those three key components of government, economics, and civics within the American history content. And then they will be, I wanna make sure 100% that they are prepared for 10th grade, regardless of the pathway that they take and whatever course we develop, and I will develop that with teachers um, if they're willing to do that with me, um, and that they will be prepared for 10th grade. So you don't, I, I think that that was one of the concerns. Yeah, that was, that was definitely a concern. And I agree, I don't mind the idea of embedding it, but I think you need to, we need to be honest in what we're presenting and how we are, you know, what we're telling the public. If we're saying we're, saying we're not rewriting, we're not changing anything, I mean, it's obviously being changed. And they need to know how it's being changed. And they need to know how their, you know, that their taxpayer dollars are being expended to do it, worthwhile or not. You need to be honest and say we are spending your money on this. And by the way, we're spending money on it after having well, spent that would money be on presented the day before. That would be it was actually not presented in the email. Well, Thank I you. think we've, we've, we've been talking money. for a year <laughs> about writing a civics course. I think almost everybody um, knows that writing any course sent an email. Money. We sent an email that told the public we were not spending any money on the social studies change. That's a fact. And we did it, and we're not changing. And you want to pay money for the social studies change. And that we did we not see that before it went out to the public. So, so that was disappointing part of it. Yeah. If you couldn't even share it I mean, with some members that before, we're not spending before we do that, that's an absurd. Thing. It's absolutely absurd. I have a question on that on the sequencing. Um, in the past, was it required that you take the ninth grade uh, social studies before you could take the 10th grade and then take the 10th grade before you take the 11th? So in this, is, is the sequencing that way as well? Or could you have like, 12th graders taking the the American studies class with ninth graders, and and could you are you required? Right. To, yeah, so so you're gonna, which is another complication, I suppose, you know, which is problematic to some degree. But you're not the, these whatever the three social studies requirements we have are. You're not required to take a prerequisite before you go into the next one. So you could jumble it up whichever way you wanted, as long as we cover that. Except the thinking, but except if you're on the AP track, I understand because you're gonna there's a sequencing for the test. But the way that this is right now, there's there's no grade level requirement or prerequisite to take one after the other. It does. You're right. I mean, it won't be a requirement because what the required course is actually the ninth grade course. But it just makes sense that you would take the ninth grade course to the tenth grade course and then take world history, unless you didn't want to take world history and you could go. In this model, you could take ninth, tenth not do 11th and go right to 12th and take two electives. So it isn't right. It is not required that in that model. That wouldn't meet the standards of the state. That you have to have world, world history. history. So that presents another issue. Standards. We don't, with we it, don't have a solution. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the solutions to that is what, what semester course could you take in 12th grade that include them? But I don't have that answer right now to be able to say that it would be. But you're right. I mean, you're all on the right track because there are state standards that you know. Can I ask one other question? Uh, what aspects of U.S. history are we going to drop? Have we made those decisions yet? Since we're squeezing two years into one or one and a half, uh, so it's not how do we shrink all that and still give the kids the value of the education? So I like to think of curriculum writing not as squeezing taking. In my estimation of, it, of all the conversations that we have had, especially over this past week or so, is a redesign. And if you're redesigning, you're not thinking about what do I have to, you have to prioritize. If you know that these, this is essential content that students need, ninth grade students need to know, but also ninth grade going to 10th grade who may be taking an AP course also need to know. So you have to rethink it. And there may be parts of that course that, you know, we spend more time on than we actually have to. Like, oh, there are all those kinds of questions that you, really grapple with when you write courses. 
So yeah, that would that, yes, that would do that you, would be. Do you our think you can adequately do that in the next few months so we could use it for next year, or is that something that's going to take extra hours that uh, I don't think the department would be interested in working on this? I don't know the department wouldn't work on it. I'm just I don't but know how long it's going hours. to take to do that. I'm, I'm being very honest that this is a new concept. <laughs> this is new. It is. Uh, we have a, we have content from our 12th grade that we could take a look at and see how that would that would work within that course. But this is going to take conversations with teachers to see what teachers need to be involved. They're the ones who teach the course, right? I mean, teachers led with supervisors. So we need to have those kinds of conversations to make sure that, you know, to Mrs. Collins' point and to everyone's point that it's done well because no matter what everybody or anybody thinks, this is really ultimately about what's the experience for the students. And that is really what we honor. And that's a redesign, so we're going to have to think about that. You're also so pulling in the pieces from Hillsdale and putting a puzzle together of the Hillsdale stuff, which is already put together. The Hillsdale, career, the Hillsdale content will support it, right? Because that's, that's what we're doing. We already have curriculum written for all the other courses, right? And Hillsdale is now something that we can take a look at and add to support the course. That's that's what we're doing. One other quick question. Under what scenario would a 12th grader still take that American government class? Like, they would not take a 9th grade? I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend that. I would say if you weren't taking the 9th grade course, right, and you were taking 10th, 11th, take two semester courses in your senior year so you don't have to take the ninth grade course and one of them has to be the US government semester course rather than have to take a ninth grade I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that to a to a senior. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shai and Mrs. Kelly and everyone who worked so hard. Thank you so much. Okay, um, moving on then to the special education plan with Mrs. Summers. So every three years, PDE um, expects us to submit a special education plan. Um, and under that plan, um, all the components are identified from PDE. And what it really is, is a compilation of data um, that we collect through our yearly monitoring process, our IEP process, um, just to ensure that our programming is appropriate, compliant, and effective for our students. So what I'm going to do is just go through the components of the special education plan briefly so you can see what is included um, in this process. So the development of the plan, you'll see all the different plan components. So again, a lot of this information is just pulled from you know, what we currently are doing day to day. Um, with this process, we also had a steering committee. So we had the um, <clears throat> plan available to the steering committee included general education teachers, special education teachers, board members, administration. Um, and then it was also posted on our website back um, as well for 30 days to re get any feedback from anyone that was, um, you know, that looked through the plan. Just so you could see that, you know, who all was involved in putting it together. So the first part of the plan really looks at areas of improvement and planning, which we consider indicators. So what happens is that a lot of this information, um, again, we gather throughout the year through PIMS, and it's run, and then what PDE looks at is our numbers, and if anything is flagged, if there's any um, concerns. So um, we were, you know, it was, we did a nice job in this area, nothing was flagged, all of our numbers were um, appropriate for um, all of these areas in the indicator section. The next component of the special education plan is the least restrictive environment. Um, so this is where we take a look at the percentage of time that students are being served in the general education environment who receive special education supports. So um, as you can see, I, what I wanted to do is take a look at the amount of um, between 40% and 100% of the day. So if we look at the amount of students that are being served in the general education um, within the general education uh, classrooms with special education supports. So we have about 89% of our students that are being served um, you know, in that setting, which is a, a wonderful percentage. At the same time, we also want to make sure that we're continuing to meet the needs of our students as well. 
understanding that the general education environment is super important for our kids, but also understanding that we have some students that need a smaller group setting as well. And that is something that we continue to work on with in Penridge, you know, when we look at those continuum of supports. So this is something we continue to monitor, something we continue to talk to with our special education teachers, our supervisors, to see how we can continue to have kids make progress, have access to the general education curriculum, but also get the supports that they need within their IEP. Just another note with least restrictive environment as well um, is that we do continue to, like I said, have programs where students are coming back from out of district and we continue to monitor those programs as well. We have some kiddos that, um, you know, they need the out of district placement, but we continue to have those relationships with those families, you know, for the point that at some point, you know, we can bring them back to our programs when, you know, we know they can be successful. So that is something we continue to look at as well. When we're looking at least restrictive environment, we continue to have those conversations um, with families and also with the different out of district placements that we, that we work with. The next component of the special education plan looks at positive behavior supports. So in this area, what we do is we list all the different, um, really all the different supports that we're providing within our schools when it comes to supporting behavior. And as you can see, we have school-wide positive behavior support plans that our support programs at all our elementary and middle school programs are um, schools. We have the house system at the high school, which has been really um, a great way to, to look at behavior and, and to support students at that level. Um, we have student-specific behavior plans, school counselor support, lakeside counseling, board-certified behavior analysts. So really, this is just a way for us to show PDE all the different supports and resources that we're using for students, um, both within the general education environment, outside the general education environment as well. Um, and then there's also the student assistant program, which you would hear as a SAP, which is another program that we offer students. Um, and then professional development, which is a big piece of that we provide every year to our teachers um, as far as you know, different positive supports that we can provide as well as our TAs and PCAs. So different ways that we can support them um, you know, with our students within the classroom. So the next component of the plan, which is actually probably the biggest component of the plan, is the education program. So what we have to do every few years is we have to list every single um, teacher, program, caseload, age range, and classroom location. So that's more of a, a piece we're looking at the, um, the assurance checks. So this is what we do is when we look at the different classrooms. We identify the special education classrooms. Are they uh, maintained as close uh, um, as appropriate to the ebb and flow of the usual school activities? Are they located where noise will not interfere with instruction? Is it just, you know, a space that is used for instruction and is it an adequate amount of space? So we actually go through every single classroom, we get the, um, the measurements of the classroom, and that's all information that we have to provide to PDE as well, um, so, so that they can see that we're in compliance with that area. So that is something that we will continue to do every, every three years as we um, submit the plan. The next component of the plan just talks about special education support services. So this is where we just list all of the different supports that we have for students um, who have IEP needs. So again, we continue to, to grow this area, which is wonderful because we want to make sure that we're providing supports for kids that are individualized. Um, so everything from our supervisors, our psychologists, our OTs, our speech therapists, physical therapists. And you can see that we have a lot of those um, positions that are within district, but then we also contract with PTS and the IU, and we form a really great partnership with them as well to be able to provide those services for our students. So again, something that we um, continue to track within our special education plan. And then the last component of the special ed plan just looks at personnel development. So PDE requires us to make sure that we are providing professional development in these seven categories um, when we are putting together our, our plan for professional development. Autism, positive behavior supports, paraprofessionals, transition, science of literacy, parent training, and IEP development. So we hit on all of these areas every single year. Um, and it's wonderful because what we try to do is really spend time talking with our teachers as far as what, what do you need? Where are you struggling? Where are areas that we can help support you? Um, we do a lot of surveys out to our paraprofessionals, talking with them about areas that you know, they feel that they could you know, use some additional support. So we really use a lot of that data to identify you know, how we're going to best support our teachers moving forward. Um, so this is something that we then um, 
put into our special education plan and over the, the next couple of years we continue to add that information so that we can see kind of where we are with training and where we want to go with our training so that we have kind of one central location um, which will be great for us to be able to continue to take a look at. So then obviously with every plan you want to have next steps. So what's great about the special education plan and areas that we continue to look at is that a lot of it aligns with our goals um, within the district. Um, our People Services Advisory Council that we're doing this year, this really relates a lot to the parent training and awareness that we've been taking a look at as a group and excited to talk to you a little bit more later this year, the things that we're going to um, provide for you through that council. Positive behavior supports, least restrictive environment, these are all district goals that we continue to work on and take a look at as a special education department. Um, we continue professional development for staff and then the other big piece is a continuum of support for students. So when we talk about continuum of supports, like I said, really making sure that we have the, abil the ability to provide supports for our kids in the environment that's most appropriate for them. Um, making sure, you know, obviously identifying that no two students are the same and that we have to continue to have really, you know, really good conversations about how we can best meet the needs of our kids and have different options for them so that we can, you know, that they continue to make their progress. Any questions regarding the plan? Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, then moving on to the request to increase our fees. Dr. Barche. So in working with Sarah Moose, our uh, coordinator of art for the K-12 for the district, had brought to our attention that their review of budget that they were conducting this year and then looking at the fees that are associated with certain programs that they were in need of an increase. Obviously, the the you know the increase in supplies, um, the cost of supplies, um, especially over the past few years. But it, it is to be noted that they have not raised these prices in over 10 years. So this is the first time they're doing this. Um, but they do feel that there is a definite necessity in, in getting the fees to where they need to be to offset any of the you know the costs so they can do it the way they need to deliver the cost the way they need to. Is there any assistance for this? We were talking about this earlier, but on the one of the the uh, handouts that you had, or the uh, indicated that 30% of the students in Penridge are economically disadvantaged. So if 30% if of our student population is economically disadvantaged, is is this a barrier to any of them taking a particular class? When we talk about disparate treatment and trying to figure out if there's any inequities in people not being able to to deal or, or choose uh, a class that they'd like to take because of the, um, the inability to pay that. What, what do we have yeah, within that? The they will work through the guidance office in regards to getting um, any financial supports they might need. So how is that initiated so that it's not like a some sort of uh, mark on them that they can't afford? You know, they, they're handing out the lunch tickets. You know, they don't do that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to look to Dr. Side to answer the question for the <laughs> high school level. The, the elementary level, obviously. You know, we, we get the, the school counselors who know their families right. and know where they need to be in support. Um, any families that are homeless, though, and in economic need, we do have funds through our title programs that will be available. And we, as well as our Title IV funds, we do have for um, the well the well rounded educational aspect that we can utilize those funds. But in regards to identifying, I was just going to say the same thing because we do have funds for that. Uh, typically, that is through guidance and a teacher. Students talk to teachers. Teachers know that. Teachers talk to guidance. <coughs> they work that kind of stuff out. We would, if we know, and to your point, we don't always know, but most times we do. That is. Is, is it made known? To, you know, I've seen some organizations that say, "Hey, we don't want lack of funds to be a barrier to you not taking this class. If lack of funds is an issue for you, please see so and so." You know, so it's all done privately. But is there a way to communicate that? Um, so that it's not just percolating up because somebody said they had a need, but they have an understanding across the district that if there is a, a concern about not being able to pay for a class that somebody really wants to take, that there are resources available. Is that? I hear you. Yeah, okay. So, yes, I'll have to, we'll have to think about what is the most discreet way to do right. that. Just, yeah. to let them, just to let them know that it's available without singling somebody out. Right. right. Thank you. I wonder if... Um, Dr. Scheid, if they already, when the teachers uh, send it home, you know, like if the art supplies are going to cost us not money, sometimes there's always like that box, like for field trips or anything like that, that says like if you cannot afford that, it's checked, and then sometimes it gets turned in. I wonder if they 
already have something that's, you know, something that I guess to check on. If they give it to everybody, then it would be discreet. They'd be collecting it from everybody. I don't know. I don't believe that checkbox is there, but I can double check it. We'll figure out a way to, to do it in the most discreet manner possible to ensure every student who wants to participate can. Any concern with the, moving the increasing the prices up? Then we can move it forward for the, the regular board. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Okay, and that is it for uh, curriculum. We'll move right into policy, and that brings us to public comment. Um, I have uh, Adam Benzik signed up, but I see that he left. Um, and next, I have uh, Ross McLennan. Uh, Ross McLennan, Hilltown. So, policy 119, controversial issues. I was kind of surprised to read what I read today. I object to this policy change on the grounds that it further restricts our student and teacher's rights and gives less metrics for the parents and community to use to understand the progress of our schools. We are already sliding backwards. This will only exacerbate the situation, and I am against it. You know the presentation on Pathways, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed their oh, they're gone. Um, and the science standards, who's going to pay for the eggs if they do the egg drop, by the way? I wanted to ask. Eggs are really expensive. And I'll tell you, I did that at Lehigh, the egg drop. And um, Lehigh students could not, not break that egg. So we went through a lot of eggs. Um, but I, also, I love the idea of um, using somebody to uh, the school, especially with uh, recent graduates. So we have four that went through the school. Um, so working on a seventh degree, we have a doctorate at five different colleges. So it's a great school if you get a good education. <coughs> I am worried about the social studies thing, though. It's a little scary. You know, I'd call it a dumpster fire there. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, and that brings us to policy 119, controversial issues. So this policy was um, brought to us, and I know that um, Ms. Vance Clements, you had had some comments regarding this policy. So board members had expressed interest in having an opt-in policy. Um, and so this would be the policy where parents would, um, where the requirement would shift from an opt-out to an opt-in. So um, uh, our solicitor, Mike Miller, um, edited this policy to <coughs> convert it into a, an opt-in policy so the board is considered tonight for the, this committee. This would basically, I mean, basically the change is that, um, you know, parents would be would be required to opt into any surveys, surveys um, for students. So, so does that include uh, statistics class where kids sent out a, a survey to um, 50 kids? Would that be fall under this policy? Yes. Yes. Student to student? Student, so student you know, initiated to students. See, I, I, I understand the concept of doing this for some of the big surveys that they do, and you could opt in for that, but I don't want to restrict students from communicating with other students. I think that's a mistake. So I don't like the way it is right now. I, I did want to clarify is the policy meant to include things like PAYS, the PAYS survey? So that's it covers right. that, right? Because a lot that's of it says right. student. Initiated or student yeah, surveys, and I couldn't tell if that school included that. That school or state, I mean, I understand that opt in on that, but I don't understand why we would restrict the students from that. I think that's that's overreach, but I agree with the pace. Like, if you want to opt in for that, I'm okay with that. But it's sure it's going to cut down a lot of feedback.
from kids that we should be asking? Well, for statistics, uh, since there are a lot of surveys that are done through that, that's something that can be done in the beginning of the class, and papers can be sent home, and then be handed out, and then you just have it covered, and you're covered that way. Just so that you're completely being transparent, you know exactly what some of those survey questions are. There's been too many times where uh, surveys have been given, uh, and there's some things on there that maybe are not always appropriate, and it's just another step, and it's not trying to restrict it, but... Um, so if you so get into a do system, that once in the beginning of the year, or well, do you do every survey like maybe 50 times a year when they do a survey, or just once? I feel like if it's for statistics and it's going to be dealing with these kind of questions, and they could come up with some kind of template, that would be something that could be signed off on. Other things, when every you're, time, every, every not every, you're saying statistics. I'm just saying there's, if you're there's talking about statistics and it goes under one umbrella, and they're going to be all about these certain topics, and these are going to be the things that you're covering. I think that would be suffice enough to put out in the beginning, but if it's going to be like uh, an assignment and students get to choose different surveys that they're going to be giving and they, each student might have a different topic within that assignment or within that class or within, then it should be for each one of those because they're all different. Do you think parents really need to get 50 different things from a statistics class every year? I mean, I don't believe a lot going 50, on. 50 well, I, I would, okay, maybe not 50. Yeah, that's but. I think that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, uh, we can't control everything our kids do, and we don't want to do that. We want to let them be kids. I understand the big surveys, and they should opt in on that. If people don't like that, that's fine. But you can't get you know, this would be a ridiculous amount of work for the for the for the parents. Well, I, I think the it. parents are. I think parents would be willing to do it. I mean, there was a survey not long ago that was student generated and. Many parents found it inappropriate and didn't want to hand it to their students, so I don't know how else you would do it. It's, I mean, parents should be able to see it and decide that they want their students to take it. So we have one example of something that went haywire. We're now going to clamp down on everything. Is that the concept that we're espousing? No, there's multiple, but hey, you could also possibly, this could be another thing that could happen, if there is, if there's um, a form that would be sent home to parents and says, hey, if you don't want 50 statistics surveys and you want to opt your child in for every single survey, you can check here. You could get around that so that those parents that don't want to be bogged down with that could be like, fine. Or other parents that do want to see all the surveys and things that we're circulating, then you could do that as well. That could be an option. I, I had a question. Is, is this an existing policy that we have already? And it's yes. just being yeah, modified, right? Yes. So and it, why is it called controversial issues? Yeah. <laughs> Seems like an odd title. And then title? also, the um, <coughs> is there a footnote or something? That's foot, is, there's a one and a two. There's the board in paragraph two and paragraph four. Is that a footnote or is that, what's that reference to? Those They refer to the legal at the top of the policy. You see how like mm -hmm. okay. one is section 22, PA code 4.4, gotcha. and two is policy 235. But maybe as public comment uh, indicated, maybe that needs a different title because it, it doesn't seem Absolutely. to you know, encompass controversial issues, right? Yeah, this was this is just what the title was. This was a policy that, that spoke to this issue. So all the surveys did was change the language to make it opt-in, which is what the green is, and eliminated the red language. So this, aside from that, this was the existing policy. We, we had something similar with the title on another policy yeah. Yeah. Uh, previously, right, where we changed the title to. I don't, I don't know what I would call it, but it just seems. Well, it is important to, to clarify publicly that this conversation has to do with the use of surveys, right? right. Even though the title well, says right. controversial right. issues, it has to do with the student surveys or questionnaires. Uh, we are reaching out to PSBA to see what kind of policy there is specific to surveys, to see whether there is models um, from a language standpoint. A couple things that I want to express in, in terms of concerns um, and just things that I want to point out. There will be significant curriculum impact. So we just need to know that. Um, we, I, we obviously have only been interacting with this for, for a few days. And as we think about where this would impact classrooms, I'm not sure we could make a master list right now, but it won't be few, right? I, I think as even as a math teacher, beyond the, hey, students, let's gather data on something, so they ask each other's questions, which we've already talked about in terms of one of those pieces. Even I would rethink, if I'm a teacher, I think we need to be very clear about what we're defining as, because I think about my start of the year activity, right? The very first thing almost every teacher does is try to connect to kids by asking them questions. And so the question that so then if I'm a teacher, I need to then understand whether that's a survey and a questionnaire or not.
-hmm. as I'm asking you, you know, what what did you, how did you do in math last year? What's your favorite activity outside of school? I think things that are very common for the beginning of the year. Uh, we heard tonight in terms of pathways that the number of times Mr. Dyer said interest survey or Naviance or things that are survey based that our students are, are routinely interacting with. I think about our career pathway program, much of that at the elementary and middle school level is interacting with surveys to get a sense for what you like and don't like and what's your skill and what are your personality traits and then how does that equate to college or career, but it is a survey. Right? Naviance is full of surveys in terms we have to look at our guidance curriculum to see which ones we use, but it won't be a few number. Um, perhaps, I, I, I also as a mathematician have a serious concern about return rate. There, there's lots of research that's done that if you say you call X number of people, the number of people who will never call you back, and that's if they know you. Uh, the number of people who you send an email to and say please respond and will not respond, which means whatever that percentage is, and you can put your own number on it, that that means that percentage of kid, we're not really getting the input, we're just having a parent not respond um, to one email, let alone multiple <coughs> emails from teachers. Um, we, if this policy goes in place, we'll need to really make sure we're very clear about the definition of survey so that teachers have as clear a direction as, as humanly possible. Um, I think about our journalism class, I know there's a curricular unit on editorials. Um, one of the ways they learn about editorials is they take a topic that has two sides and ask kids, how do you feel about this topic that has two sides? Um, the, that's done through a survey or a questionnaire. Uh, it would clearly fit this policy. And it's only one that I think of because it's something that we see. A couple things to think about, is there a way to separate curricular items from non-curricular items? Because as I've heard these conversations, they've primarily been around the big district things like climate surveys or pay survey, although there have been some individual concerns about some things done at the level. Um, and if they weren't curricular based, perhaps a, a, a policy that applies to that type of thing, does it uh, make any sense to talk about what's anonymous and not anonymous? Um, the vast majority, I'm not sure it's all, the vast majority of the student surveys are talking about no one knows by the response who responded, so they don't know what I said. The teacher can't see that information, the student can't see that information. They are completely anonymous. We don't gather IEPs, we don't gather email addresses. And so yes, if I'm in a journalism class, I might get 15 surveys to my emails, and if I fill out 15 of them, you wouldn't know which one was me unless there was an identifying feature in my answer. Um, we don't put any of that kind of information in it. Perhaps that makes a difference or not, but those are the types of things to think about in terms of what is the problem we're addressing and is there a way to address that that wouldn't have the level of curricular impact that I'm fearful that this policy will have as we interact with teachers about what do you consider a survey or not. I did notice earlier that the <coughs> career pathways, when I saw that they were going to use Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. um, the personality survey did get me thinking about this upcoming policy discussion. I was kind of hoping that we would even have a discussion about the access that we give to outside third party organizations to our to our kids in the first place. Uh, I know people say the pays is, is worthwhile, but over the years as I thought about it, I'm not sure that I, I don't, I don't know why public schools have to provide our students to researchers for those purposes. They could find their subjects, um, they could, you know, solicit them through pediatricians offices or, or some other some other way. I mean if we're if nobody else wants to get rid of or to end our involvement with pays, that's fine. I mean I definitely support parents opting in as opposed to opting out um, with it though. And for those cases where people don't respond to you I'm not sure how you would handle that other than to maybe have something in the handbook that says, you know, if you don't respond, like something that maybe Mike could come up with something that would kind of hold you harmless from somebody coming back later. Another thought I had while we were sitting here was maybe like we have for the library policy, could it be different ages? Like what's, you know, in high school, because you do have the journalism class. I mean, if that's... And it would kind of be cumbersome for people to, because there's so many things that you can consider a survey. We would have to think carefully about how you're going to limit it. I also draw a distinction between
student initiated student to student surveys and you know the teachers um, surveys that are given to the students so I would think that this probably needs to be reworked <laughs> a little bit more um, but I still would like to consider not having our students be subjects for third parties, if that's possible, to end our relationship. Stop giving them our school time and our students access to them. Let them go find their research subjects somewhere else. I feel like two out of one. Um, some more of like the evidence that you were talking about, Dr. Bolton, that how huge of an impact it would be, like some specific examples would be good to see. Just because uh, the concern comes from the questions that are asked within a survey. And as much as you would think that a statistic survey is innocent, there's been times where there's been some things in there where some families have had concerns. So I think that is the ultimate uh, goal to make sure that it is truly about, you know, whether it's statistics or curriculum based. Because even just recently with that one uh, survey that there was concern over, it was a uh, part of a teacher assignment. So it wasn't a student to student. So um, again, if we're going to rework it or reword it, uh, it would still have to be in a, a place. I don't know how you uh, make sure then that all the surveys are still, I guess, all appropriate without not having all of them be opt-in. I don't know how you stay away from that. I don't know. I remember specifically at the middle school level, I don't know why that sticks out, but having to opt your child in for allowing photographs to be taken and used. So I can't imagine how you all manage that, but it seems like this would be along that line, those same lines with the service. It's in power school now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's once it's done. But yeah. how do you manage tracking, no. you know, if the student is in a picture or not? That's like, that's how true. do they know it's that student is not opted in. I mean, I don't know. They do have a system. We, <laughs> There's a system. Do. Yeah. We've gotten pretty good at it. Okay. Right? There, are, there are systems in place. It's obviously harder <laughs> when you get to a large organ. Like the high school's harder than it is at the elementary schools. But when I go to the elementary schools, and Mr. Thomas goes to the elementary schools, and we take pictures, and I say to the teacher, they can name the two kids. I ask the principal, they can point out the three kids. Like they, they just know. They, it's just, okay. And it is similar year in, year out, but it is the same, okay. often the same families and the same faces, and so that makes it a little easier. But. Dr. Bolton, do you mm -hmm. have a suggestion? You saw the survey recently that had upset parents. I, I think maybe you didn't, but um, I hear what you're saying it with you know, all these different courses. Do you have a suggestion? I mean, in my mind, unless we can come up with a way that that doesn't happen, other than you have to opt in for everything, what is, do you think, the solution? Well, if you're asking me my opinion, yeah. uh, I would separate student to student, I would separate anonymous, and I would differentiate curriculum versus non-curriculum. And I think it's, I, we'd have to think about what non-curriculum is in terms of, because there are even some classroom things that some people might call non-curriculum, others might call curriculum. I think about like an uh, like a inventory, uh, a student interest inventory. Is that curricular or not? I think you could make an argument both ways, even though I'd make the argument that it is if we're trying to do a career pathway type of activity. Um, and I think I would differentiate in terms of the curriculum, in terms of when surveys are used and what those surveys look like. There may be some instances where they are common, and so they could even examples could be put up. Others, probably not. Some of the topics are, I mean, I know my wife teaches statistics. I know that she has kids generate data around things they're interested in. You know, do you have an iPhone or not? Do you work more than 20 hours or not? Like, things like that. Um, and so those are student-generated. And so if it could be, you know, does anonymous matter? Does the student obviously have an option then to not do it, right? Especially at the high school level. Because almost all of these are, are secondary in nature. I'm not sure I've seen an example at the elementary level. Um, most of the student-to-student -student things are at the secondary level in, in terms of what that looks like. And so I would want to work with that. I also would need to work with the supervisors and some teacher leaders because I really don't know. I, I mean, I appreciate the question, Ms. Blumberg, that we will start generating a list because I, I wrote off eight things that I went, okay, here are things I'd be concerned about, but I'm sure I don't know them all. That's, I need to start talking to people about what, where is it really used on a regular basis? And then when is it used and you go, oh my gosh, I never thought of that, but yes, that's that's a survey, you know, in terms of what that looks right. like. Because Jordan, uh, do you know 
the recent <coughs> survey that kind of started this or, or got it back on the front burner, was that, that was a student survey, but did a teacher assign it? What was, what were the particulars that? Like I think the assignment was to come up with a survey, and it, it, so it, within that, I, I think there was parameters of what they could choose between, but it was like an assignment to, for the students to create a survey, and then there were different topics. So some ones are like around climate and different things like that. So it was assigned, but not a specific, like your survey has to be on this. It was on, like the student got to choose. But then this, the, the issue, I guess, was the questions, the, the the questions the on some of the surveys that other students were then were taking each other's surveys and some of it was deemed inappropriate. So yeah, that's tricky because I don't even know what that be curricular then because it was a teacher assignment. <laughs> Can we? not even have it go, you know, to me it doesn't seem to make any sense. This is so, it needs to so much work done to it to even bother putting it through for first read. I, I don't think it would be useful because it will be changed substantially, I would guess. I think what we need to do is get um, direction and feedback on what changes people want to see or what information people want or, you know, so that yeah, I would want we know how what to bring you know so that but we can give Jen some direction on what to bring back. No, yeah, give her direction, but I'm saying what's on this piece of paper isn't even a first read. But I don't see the point in voting on it because between first read and second read, you're not supposed to substantially change something, and this will definitely be substantially changed. So my suggestion would be that you don't even vote for first read on um, Tuesday night because it's in a state where it will be changed substantially. My uh, question, like with um, the library policy, we have like the policy and then there's um, the paper that then has like how you go through the review process. Mm -hmm. um, if we would move something like this to first read, could, after we get some of those details, is that something that you could also, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just asking the question that if, we could have a, a second paper that then kind of shows those specifics like it does with the library books. Obviously, if you're going to differentiate between this, this is what we mean and this is what we don't mean, that often turns into the administrative regulations that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If it's just a policy that like you read and go, oh, that makes sense, we don't have an AR for that because right. you read the policy and it makes sense. But when it is and we need to give direction or like in the case of the library, those directions were differentiated by level and so we needed to kind of talk about here's what it looks like and there was a community facing review process for that one. So yes, depending on where the policy landed, it may be very, very appropriate for us to clarify either through curricular or through an administrative regulation. Could we possibly, um, to Joan's point, opt out of third party surveys and then work on this piece of what we're gonna do internally because we obviously have surveys that are good and necessary and then surveys that not every parent will want their child taken, but the third party stuff I think is less difficult to sort out. The, um, and since this is an odd year, is this a pays year? Isn't it every, isn't it the odd years to the even grades? Odd years, six, eight, it's to in ten? The fall. This one. So, so it would be the fall, fall of, it would be the fall of an odd year. So okay. it's not this school year. I can't oh, think of any third party survey that is imminent. And I'm looking at Dr. Robarczyk and Dr. Shai to see whether they can think of any third party. Wait, we'll have to be conscious of it because I hear you. And, and so I'm not sure how you formalize that within policy, whether this is the right place to do it or whether PSB has another suggestion. And so we can move forward with that. Although I do see that a little differently than what we're talking about here in terms of specifically, you know, ours, our things. Um, so let, let us do some thinking around third party. Let us do some thinking around feedback and, and gather a, a list of examples. I like Ms. Bain Slamman's idea in terms of if you have some thoughts in terms of either wording or what you mean and what you don't mean, you know, um, if you could send that to her and Ms. Summers and myself. That way we can interact and kind of gather it and try to get something out to you to say, hey, are we going in the right direction? So that when we hit February, we feel like we've at least moved in the right direction. We don't have to talk it from the very beginning again. Yep. Does that make some sense to yep. people? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Just one thing I wanted to add is it, it's why it needs to be changed. In the <laughs> it includes informal student polls in this procedural. 
informal, it could be verbal, it could be anything. This is a broad, way too broad of a net. Because if I ask you what you what everybody's doing after school today, that would be a pool, a hole. But this would not be allowed under this the way it says here. It doesn't say it says informal. So just let's take another shot at this and do it right. Okay, then we will uh, gather all the feedback and uh, share something else out to see where everybody is on this moving forward. And uh, that brings us to the next policy, which is the home education programs. Um, as you know, um, this was uh, something where we have a, the law that's being changed and it needed to come back in time for the law to be changed and now we're in uh, the period of time when enrollment is taking place and so that's why it's back is because um, students are enrolling for things for next year and so uh, this those those legal changes that were um, it, the law change the, the changes in the law will be going into effect for the students enrolling for next year in this program so that's why it's back on the agenda um, this is the uh, policy that Mike had written um, to address the changes in the law. Um, the There was interest from board members to see what it would look like to um, also offer um, services for kids with special needs who are homeschooled um, in a way that would not open the district up to liability and and though it's not a requirement to do that it was something that um, board members had expressed interest in being able to do um, and so we were able to get information from Tom Warner which would be um, added in if you look at the green where it says when the school district declines basically that sentence would be pulled out and replaced um, with this language which is in everyone's email um, to the extent that a student who is receiving home education programming has also been identified for special education services and the parents of that student wish for the student to attend school for particular specialized services to which they would have been entitled had they attended the schools of the district full time, such services shall be memorialized in an equitable participation service plan. The development of such a plan shall be coordinated through the district's Office of Pupil Services. Essentially what he's saying, um, if you read his uh, whole email that he sent, is that's, that is what we are required to do by law for kids who attend private schools. So any students who attend a private school who qualify for special ed, um, <coughs> we're required to provide those services so those students would come to Penridge and get those services. But as part of that requirement, since we're not, requ we're not providing all of the education, it does not entitle them to faith. So the um, same kind of legal requirements that you would have where a parent um, you know, could sue, basically by using that same exact language for homeschool kids that you'd be using for private schools, puts you in a position where you can offer those specialized services without having to worry about um, a parent suing you because um, you know, 75% of that day, or or more, or whatever, you're you're learning elsewhere, and um, obviously that could impact whether the, you know whether or not um, all the services that would need to be in place would be provided. So, basically, long story short, it, it essentially allows you to provide those services within there and not have the legal liability. So. Um, so that's that piece. And then if you look above that, the whole paragraph above that last sentence that I just mentioned um, that would become obsolete, that paragraph that's there, um, where it starts with the supervisor and ends with programs and services, that language um, Mike Miller put in there, um, he said that is, that is actually what it says in the law. So that part is required. That part right there is actually in the law itself. Um, it's not something that is optional. So that that part, um, you know, that's why that's in there. So, any other questions? When is this uh, legally required to go into effect? It's for the school year, next school year? Correct. So is there any, can we just put in to, to be effective 
That is in there, yes. It does say to be effective for next school year. That language is in the policy. Where is that? Page four. Page four, joint program, the new green language, starting with the 23 24 yeah. school year. Okay. Ms. Summers, obviously, this is a, a, a new world, right, with, with a law change. Primarily, the, the impacts that have been discussed the most deal with special education, right? Because it just is that whole when you open a door, and we've had some of these conversations around legal issues. And so can you speak a little bit to what you've heard from Mr. Warner? I know he put some things in writing to people that the board has read, but I know you've had some conversations with him in terms of what you're thinking and, and, and what you would say to the board. So I think we need to look back at, you know, when Act 55, it takes a look at um, identifying that when students, come, you know, we're looking at home education programs and for students to come to school for 25% of their day, Within the Act 55 language, we talk about an academic course, and it's identified that way. Um, the language that we have in here talks, you know, it's, it's a lot more generalized. Um, you know, what we have to offer, just so we would offer any general education student, special education student would be the, um, the, com the, the comparison of what a general education student would receive. So if they're going to come in for a reading class, then a special education student, we would have to obviously provide them with the ability to come in for that type of class as well within the special education realm. Um, you know, at this time we are not required, it's not required for us to offer, we talk about language, um, different programs and services, you know, looking at related services, social skills, things like that. That is not something that at this time that we, um, that we need to provide. Um, so I think that, you know, we really need to take a look at how we're identifying you know, what we're going to be offering students within the general education and the special education realm. Um, I do think that, you know, when we take a look at offering students related services, what that looks like, um, having students come in for, a special so say special education students, uh, a homeschool student wants to come in for certain classes, we have to identify how we identify what those classes are going to look like. You know, we have special education documents that we have to take a look at. Um, we also need to take a look at how um, you know, we're going to provide those for services, especially for students that are uh, related services and how to even program for that. So I, I believe that there's, um, you know, while we have to make sure that we are offering what we'd offer to a general education student, to a special education student, there are, you know, concerns that I have. I just think there are areas that we really need to take a look at. Um, another piece also being um, child find. So if we have a student that is going to come in um, and is interacting with, the, with this, a teacher, and we're identifying that there could be possible needs. Um, we only have that student for a small amount of time. How do we identify whether or not we move forward with an evaluation? What legal component, you know, are we um, opening ourselves up to uh, to that as well? So I just think well, the child find issue is really irrelevant to whether or not we allow them to come here for those services. In fact, it actually would help you because then you would be waived. The, 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 the fate would be waived in a scenario where they're coming here for those specialized services. And when you talk about the, you're, you're creating an IEP. It's what you're doing for every other kid when you say that it would be planning and you're required to do that for private school kids. It's literally the same thing. You're just doing exactly the same thing. I mean, um, the way Tom Warner explained it, it's, it's pretty simple. You're just applying the same concept of what you have to do to a private school kid for a homeschool kid and you're actually more protected because um, in a situation where they're then identified and it's in the IEP, that faith is waived so you're not you're not legally liable, and, and that has to do with the fact that you're not providing 100% of the day and all of the things that you would want to do outside of that. So in, in a lot of ways, this is actually, um, we, have, we have more of a liability if that student was here 100% of the day than if that student was just coming in here for a speech service or an OT or, um, or other related service. But um, Could I you know, ask a, a question? Could I ask a question? Um, is this... Do we have to do this? Is this something that because of the law we're changing this, or is this because of somebody's uh, so Act, desire to change it? Act 55 requires the other changes. Whether or not we do the special ed piece is, um, when she says about the child find thing, 
Um, that's related to the fact that we're required by law to allow these kids to come in for up to 25% of the day. That child find issue is actually completely separate I'm from just, this issue. Just talking about this policy, okay, is what is in here that we have to do by law? And what is the cost of what we're and asking the school to do that we do not have to do by law? What's in the policy is required by law. The part, that's, the part that's extra is the piece that I just read you um, that we would be adding in in place of that one sentence. Okay. Um, that's, that's the piece that's not required by law that board members had expressed interest in doing so that we, do, we don't discriminate against kids with special needs and do offer them the same opportunities that we'd offer other who, kids for who the who, of the day. Who is who is asking about this? Which board members? I don't, I don't remember if I did well, or not. Any board members who ask, you know, the the, the, the role of the the role of the, of any chair of any committee is to facilitate okay. onto the agenda requests from any and board this members. This is the supervisor of home education. Which part of the green one? What are you talking about? I may have missed that. Which one are we adding that does not have to be added? Which what board? I'm saying that which section? Was the, the part that I just read to you, which is not in here, it's in your email from Tom Warner, oh, okay. that is the part that um, isn't legally required. So that's what I was thinking okay, earlier so today, this afternoon. Oh, sorry, Ron. No, no, so, so everything here is required. So well, we really, we need to pass this because it's, there's no question about it. Really. Just on, on that point, though, can, can we, if we're going to, knowing that we need to pass this, but it's not really effective until the, the which is September. September only we need to qualify the two other areas where we've we've added language so say the students with disabilities beginning with that supervisor section we should say you know starting with the 2023-24 school year and the same thing with under a loan of educational materials we should say at that last sentence before that starting with the 2023-24 school year so, so even though we passed it so actually that piece that's at the top there is already legally required but then you modified it. You put something. Well, right. In it, it used to be in our policy, and then um, it was removed from our policy. And Mike's saying he doesn't really know why we removed the language that's in the law because we're required to do it. It's literally legal language, so he put it back in. But that language at the top has always been a legal requirement. So the, it's the, the language, language at the bottom that doesn't go into effect until. Okay, the, the students with disabilities. That language, that whole green section, is is currently the law. It's not. Something. Right, verbatim, the supervisor of a home education program. That whole section down to number two is in the law. It's it's actually the correct. So that it has to be okay. correct. Okay. Well, it, I think but the, the next sentence is, is not the main. Right, and that's the sentence I was saying. Okay, okay so, so it is, is in the law. It's not just an email. Okay. It is in the law. Right. When the, the school district declines to provide services, is that the one that's new? I was saying that in place of that sentence, because Mike had put that in there, um, and we were following up with Tom Warner to get. Um, the special ed piece, it would re the, the piece that I just shared with you from Tom Warner would replace that last sentence. I appreciate getting, I mean, I, I would have liked the, you know, he wrote the email, Tom Warner wrote the email to us, which is pretty lengthy, um, and a lot of legalese. I think in these situations it would be beneficial to have the attorney actually present to where we can have a conversation as opposed to trying to read Jonathan aside, I mean, for, for people who aren't attorneys, um, at least myself, I like to have a conversation because I can understand better. So I would have appreciated having that information earlier and perhaps being able to have an actual conversation with Tom, um, whether it would have been him here present at the meeting or, you know, in an exec session. I know he came to once before, but at any rate, my point is that that was that was a lot to process in his email, and I would have more questions for him, and would appreciate having a discussion with him directly before. Yeah, he could even be available by phone or something. Oh, right, right, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you, I mean, you're always welcome to respond to his email and ask him. No, no, no you're, you're missing my point. I, the whole point is that conversations by email are not the same as having a conversation in person and I think it's beneficial for the attorney to be present so that I mean I can write an email and then he writes an email back and it's not a dialogue with all of us so but, but I thought our board protocol was not for us individually to be reaching out to our yeah, council 
So the only thing we're adding is we have to notify the board. Is that is that? So the, la the language that's being added for next is is the law for next year, which requires that you provide up to twenty five percent of the school day of education to homeschool kids, as well as um, technical school. Um, so that's the language that was added. That's what goes into effect. And enrollment is open for the technical school. Enrollment is opening for Penn Ridge. And so those pieces we need have. to be in place for that enrollment for next year. So that's that's really where we're at. I, 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 let, let me try to clarify for you, Mr. Bruce. The page four, okay. which is green. Yes. That's right, that, that part on page go. four no is the minimum requirements by law okay. that take place for the 23-24 right. school year. I understand. If you look at that language, you'll notice that there is no uh, denoting of regular ed versus special ed. Right, that law applies to all Every. students sure. because it is defined as academic courses. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about academic courses, if a student wants to come in to take ceramics, they can, up to 25% of the day. And so what that means at the secondary level is it's basically two classes at a time, right? Because that's roughly 25% of the day. The elementary level is a little harder and we have to define that because not everything's the same length and the bell doesn't ring. What the board has to decide is, do you want to do more than that for specifically special ed students? If you do more than that, because there are some services that are not academic in nature, like we don't have a course that's called physical therapy. Students receive physical therapy as part of their IP. Some of them do, right? right. Because that, that's appropriate to their disability. That is not an academic course, so the law does not require you to provide that to so homeschool students because it's not an academic course. Now, that doesn't mean the board can't choose to provide that, right? You can always go beyond. And so Mr. Werner was trying to write to say, here's what you're required, and that's what this is. And his email also says that, right? This is Mr. Miller's writing of the law, but Mr. Werner said the same thing. He then said, if you choose to go further, Here's language I would recommend because it brings in the legal protection as best they can identify right now. The problem with this is it's brand new and we don't really know the legal protections and what the challenges are going to be once this opens up. It, primarily they will be in the special ed realm and so that's why that conversation is whether you want to. The two pieces that are not required by law that seem to be in here are the one sentence that was at the end of the supervisor from education that Ms. Fannis Clemens mentioned that Tom's language would replace if the board goes beyond what's required. There's also on page one something that was that was added in green where I'm writing administrative regulations but the board is approving them. We don't have that for any other ARs and so that's obviously not a legal requirement. I'm actually not sure why that's there, mm -hmm. but that is another piece that I would want to have a conversation about to understand why that's there in this policy, but not others around ARs um, from that standpoint. Okay. Was, all of our ARs. was that? All your ARs get approved by the board. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. ARs are not part of the official policy. So, Ms. So was there anything else from a policy standpoint that you wanted to clarify? Anything else from a special? Did I? No, that was. Because yeah. I was talking special ed law, and I was getting scared when I do that. I did you were, okay. You were good. You were good. Yes. Practice. For the parts that would be above and beyond, and I don't think anybody would be. I mean, I would hope nobody would object to wanting to provide services to students that need them. At the same time, you still have to be responsible and mindful of the, there's a cost associated with that. The one thing I was able to understand out of Tom's email was that you really need to be careful about how you write those agreements. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where I want to have a conversation, a, you know, a conversation with board members, with the attorney somehow, not via, not, not via email, um, but have a conversation where we can get that ironed out so that we know what we are getting, you know, getting ourselves into that will be able to provide it. Because if you if you don't do it properly, I mean, that could have impacts on all, all students, the special ed students here, the special ed students that are at home. You just need to be careful about how you do it, and that was clear from his email. And, and is it fair clear, to say this summer we're already that doing that. the process that they're talking about does exist for other students yes. currently? So, we, yeah. we currently so it's right. a model we know, yeah. so we, we can, we are comfortable with it and can present okay. it. Yeah. I, I do want to, from an enrollment standpoint, I just want the board to be clear 
that enrollment is going on right now, but scheduling is not going on right now, which means in terms of adding, because the concern would be a homeschool student signs up for chemistry one, mm -hmm. and there's no chemistry one space, because you don't have to create a class, right? We don't have to do for our students. That doesn't happen until late May or June, even sometimes after school is out, in terms of the actual scheduling of, so we don't need to know totals, right? Because this isn't going to impact us by 50 kids in terms of one section and things like that. Um, tech school, we've always allowed homeschool students, so that, that, that process doesn't need to change regardless it, of, it does, of the leaders, It does so. change, though, because um, <coughs> currently they can only come if there's an empty seat where the law actually says that they have equal access. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if they can only get an empty seat and we have full enrollment, then it's impossible for them to get a seat in those programs that are over full. Um, and so the law actually, the language in the law actually gives them equal access to be able to go to tech school. So they would have the same opportunity as anyone else to go through that same process of deciding to go. So, um, you know, I, I think his email was clear. If we want to have a, a follow-up conversation or you want to reach out to him, I, I'm, I'm not concerned about you having conversations no, it's with not, him. it's not about the, and so that's to me, thing. I think it's most worthwhile when more people can hear directly from the attorney, the person that has the expertise, and we do it with more than just me doing it individually and then Jonathan doing it individually. You see, you, when you have a conversation that everybody can hear the answer at the same time, a conversation is very different from an email exchange. Right, I understand. Because there's things that you think of that, but as far as like, I mean, for me, the the other considerations like the chem lab, those kinds of things, those, in my mind, were, it's a given. Like mm -hmm. that part is the required part by law. But yeah, obviously there are going to be some financial and other scheduling considerations that we might have to think about. So I I feel like his his email was as like so detailed that I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't even come up with any other questions. I, I, so I'm, I'm finally moving on. Yeah, this. I don't need to go into a, a group session with him. If you want to reach out individually, I'm fine with that too. I, know the attorney I, I just look at it, they're taxpayers as well, and even it's a financial thing if they need that related service. Um, and it's something that we already do. I felt like the email was written to my understanding, so I was comfortable with that. Uh, do, Ricky, do you want to? I feel like we should offer the same services to everybody homeschooled or, I mean, especially knowing that we have to do it for private school, um, which I did not know until I saw his email, but, um, yeah, I'm comfortable doing it. Jason, Bob? I'm comfortable. I'm fine with it. Okay, so it looks like, no. Wait, so, so are, are you comfortable with it? Meeting? Is the administration comfortable with it, or there's two things that you are wanted to discuss? Is it? Is the? I would like your opinion on this. I can receive clarification on my items as we move towards the, the oh, January. That's the consensus good. of the board. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Were we not asked? Then we'll move up the first three. Oh, 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 um, and then that brings us back to public comment. I did actually. Have one wait, other. excuse me. Um, yeah. I did. You know, I had sent emails back on December twentieth about policy 003 and policy 903. 903 is our public comment policy, which I had mentioned um, the ruling for Pensbury School District, well, resident of Pensbury School District required Pensbury to have to change that, and actually all school districts are going to have to change policy 903. Pensbury has a template that's been approved by a judge, so um, that would maybe logically be a place to start. And I think Dr. Bolton said that he provided Mike with the template of 903 from Pensbury, but I think that's something that we definitely need to address quickly because I know that the people that won the lawsuit are looking to see which school districts have and have not changed their policy 903. I also had asked about policy 003, which is the policy that governs our policy passing procedures and, um, or I'm sorry, not just the policy passing procedures, but board procedures overall. And normally in most organizations, it's a two thirds majority that's required to change your policies or to suspend your policies. And I think that it would be wise for a school board to do that as well. We should, if we want to 
suspend our policies. That should be done only in extraordinary circumstances. And I think it would be appropriate to follow what most people follow, which is a two-thirds vote to do it. And, you know, I kind of think of it the same way that we, when we are talking about, uh, it's not going to come to me, but the, um, that document that was pertaining to remote instruction. We had said to the administration, remote, remote instruction is something that's only going to be used in the most extraordinary circumstances, and I think we should hold ourselves to the same standard. We should not suspend our policy just on a whim with a 5-4 vote uh, because we went through several times where it was done and it left a lot of confusion for the community and the board members. Um, so I think I would like to have a discussion about changing 003, not tonight, <laughs> obviously, but I would like a commitment that the board will have a discussion about changing policy 003 to a two-thirds vote, not tonight. So um, I recall there being a discussion when the Pensbury decision went out, um, that was at least a year ago, and I remember Mike suggesting changing the policy, and um, I, I guess my impression was that board leadership at the time was not interested in changing that policy because he was trying to ask for that policy to change, and it didn't happen, but I'm, I'm happy to bring it up and find I out from Mike about no, that policy to I change it. I don't recall not being interested in it. I think what was said was that you need to see how it plays out, and the final decision was not. A well, year. it was. It was. A, excuse me. The communication, yeah, and it is late, and I'm just simply saying that the most recent communications that I received from the people who won the lawsuit said, "Hey, by the way, this is set now, and we are going to be looking at and approaching school districts to find out why." they haven't changed their policy 903 to be in line with the judgment that was handed down. So well, what are the changes? Okay, so I, actually, I don't know. Dr. Bolton has the template, but this isn't for discussion tonight. Yeah, I'm just so saying that we should have a committee to It has to do, to to do with it. the fact that our public comment period says that you can't, um, that you can't comment on individuals, but they are allowed to comment on individuals, oh, okay. and so that's supposed to be changed. And this was brought up back when Comments we were add being that made to the next policy meeting. When comments were being made about an individual heard. and then those comments were being blocked and then there was a threat for a lawsuit, so then those comments ended up being read at a subsequent meeting. So that's oh. again that was not a year. Regardless, ago. I'm that happy to put that year ago. I'm happy Let's to put it on. Let's put it on the next meeting. And I am telling you, I'm happy to have that brought to the next Okay, great. Okay. 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 That's all this is. As we okay. okay. as both of them. Can I speak? And I'm trying to speak, but you won't let me. So if you oh. let me speak, I'd be happy to tell you about zero zero three. You're the expert at that. So uh, as far as zero zero three, um, I'll just say if a majority of the, the for this particular policy, I'll just say personally if the chair and the board and board leadership, their job is to facilitate the will of the board. If that was happening, I would have been happy to make the change that you're suggesting, but the fact that precedent has been set that apparently we can ignore the majority of the board and do whatever we want and cause chaos, we, we, we can't change 003 because if we do that, it gives the board no mechanism to be able to fully operate when they have someone Megan, refusing to there was the again board. misrepresenting so what happened. Megan, if no, others, you talked agree. that you, you are misrepresenting what happened. I asked the attorney, who sets the agenda? The president sets the agenda. The attorney said, and I have it in writing, that the president sets the agenda. If a majority of the board wants to change that agenda, the majority may do so at the meeting. That means that the president is not required before a meeting to put something on an agenda that she feels wasn't ready to be on an agenda. You're, you're wrong. You that, no, so I'm powerful. not wrong. You know what? Mike you're, Miller has been to law school. Mike moved. Miller is and, our attorney. You're, you're I have it in writing. What he said. No. But what he said, no, I have it in writing. We have more said, supposed to facilitate the will of a board if it makes no, it out of committee by the majority no, of the board. No, that is not what he said. I have Regardless, it in writing are there, that we could set the agenda. All I'm hey, asking I'm looking for is that the conversation can you, we had. Can, can everyone let me know if you, can we get out? Do you no, want 003 no. on the agenda to consider that change? Can we not talk? Can we make this next? 
Yeah, I'm just asking, do you want this on the agenda next month, or do you not want to look at this? No. We only have to do that three days ahead of time. So let's oh, 72 now. hours. 72 hours. We've we received the edict. That. Okay, if five board members reach out to me and let me know that you want 003 on the agenda for the next policy committee meeting, I will put it on there. Okay, okay. otherwise we'll do it in new business. Okay. Is there, is there a public comment? Uh, there was one person listed for public comment, but that person has left. So we will adjourn. She's once again misrepresenting. Mm -hmm.